Welcome, everyone. I just want to encourage everybody to take their seats. Not on. Tech, tech, testing. No? Yeah, is that loud enough? Welcome, everyone. I encourage you all to take your seats. Okay, wow, that's a lot louder, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you here this morning. And I want to extend a warm welcome for this event, Financial Futures, Higher Education, and Reparative Public Goods. So my name is Hannah Appel, and I teach in the Anthropology and Global Studies departments here at UCLA. I'm also the Associate Faculty Director of the Institute on Inequality and Democracy, which is hosting this event. And significantly for our purposes today, I am a student debtor. My household holds over $70,000 in student debt. So I want to start by thanking the Institute team, Founding Director Ananya Roy sitting here, Deputy Director Marisa Lemerand in the back texting and busy as always, <laughs> and Research and Community Program Administrator Christy Barrera for all of your remarkable energy and expertise in making this event possible. And also a really special thanks to the Institute's Student Advisory Board who are doing a tremendous amount of work to make today possible as well. So thank you so much to the students. The Institute on Inequality and Democracy at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva people as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands, a map of which you see in this mural. I encourage all of you, come on in, come on in, those of you at the back. Hey, Sa, come on in. As a land grant institution, which is a historical fact that will become important today, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, relatives, and relations, past, present, and emerging. I want to thank the UCLA American Indian Studies Center and Ms. Shauna Goman in particular for the recent event on UC land grants, public memory, and Tovangar, from which I draw this image, and from which I also draw the lesson that all discussion of public financing, for instance, of higher education, is also a discussion about so-called public land. And the intergenerational wealth transfer that land represents from indigenous people to settlers. So today, the land acknowledgement is not simply something we say and move on from. Rather, the historical facts that land acknowledgements confront us with, including the fact that the University of California system is a land grant institution, demand that as we reimagine public finance, we do so in a way that centers questions of redress, reparation, abolition, and that also acknowledges the long archive of dispossession, exclusion, and exception that has characterized nominally universal public finance programs, right, the New Deal comes to mind, in the history of the United States and certainly beyond. So today, we begin a broader project on reparative public finance with the question of how we finance higher education. And I want to use my opening remarks to weave together some of the day's themes from redress and reparation to the ways that austerity takes shape in geographies of empire and white supremacy to the fact, as Robin Kelly puts it, and I quote him here, that social movements generate new knowledge, new theories, new questions. Revolutionary dreams erupt out of political engagement. Collective social movements are incubators of new knowledge. And with those revolutionary dreams and dreamers quite literally in the room, I will start with crisis, but with them, I will move very quickly past it. So a little bit on crisis, but I promise we're not going to stay there. In 1999, so merely 20 years ago, student debt in the United States was too insignificant to measure. Today, merely 20 years later, it stands at $1.6 trillion, second only to mortgage debt as a household debt category and disproportionately held by communities of color and women of color in particular. Higher education tells neoliberalism's stories 
and public universities have long been protagonists in those stories. In 1967, in the wake of the campus activism of the 1960s, right, the Chicano Chicana movement, the free speech movement, civil rights, black power, women's movement, anti-war organizing on campuses, then governor of California, Ronald Reagan, told a crowd, quote, taxpayers shouldn't be subsidizing intellectual curiosity. In the face of the university, which was then tuition free as a site of dissent, Reagan argued that education was a privilege, not a right. This graph illustrate what, illustrates what happens when education is a debt financed privilege rather than a tax financed right. Today, tuition, which for most students is in fact debt, accounts for a greater share of UC's core budget than state subsidy. We work in, we go to school in, we are sitting in a university system formerly known as public. While this single red line rising ominously into the trillions of dollars is a stark plot line of neoliberalism, it also tells the stories of racial capitalism and predatory inclusion. In this country, where black, Latinx, and native households have just a fraction of the wealth of white households, an education system based on debt has radically unequal effects. Black, Latinx, and native households are more likely to borrow for college and in higher amounts than their white counterparts. And after college, when those debts come due, discrimination in the labor market, gender and racial wage gaps, and differential access to intergenerational family wealth mean that these communities also struggle disproportionately to pay. These facts of racial capitalism hold true beyond student debt across our current system that forces households to debt finance everything from education to medical care to housing to entanglements in the criminal punishment system. And Noah Zatz, I saw you, you're wearing a, a shirt that says freedom should be free. You're in here somewhere. But as I said, we are not here to talk about student debt crisis. Instead, I will argue, and I think many people in this room know, we are here in a moment of possibility. In response to years of social movement organizing, and many of you are sitting in this room, and in response to years of interventions by engaged scholars, and many of you are sitting in this room, new visions of reparative public finance are now possible. We are here to recognize and celebrate massive victories. And as I heard Professor Ruth Wilson Gilmore counsel recently, we are here to organize for the day after those victories. The struggles for public higher education and for reparative public goods more broadly that we will hear about today from South Africa to Puerto Rico to Turtle Island to the broader United States and beyond are fundamentally transnational, struggles forged in geographies of empire. And so I wanna briefly trace some of these transnational linkages. At the very end of 2019, so mere months ago, students at India's JNU marched to the parliament in New Delhi as part of their broad protest against the hike in student fees. Contrasting the enormous tax breaks and unpaid loans of corporations with students who are being forced to take money from their families, go into debt to banks, or quit their education, something that should sound familiar. And the hashtag, or one of the hashtags for these events, as you can see on this poster up there, is Fees Must Fall. Fees Must Fall is a South Africa-based protest movement, and we welcome Professor Leah Naidu joining us from South Africa today. A South Africa-based protest movement that started in 2015, the goals of the movement were to stop increases in student fees, as well as to increase government funding of universities. And after several years, the protest resulted in the guarantee by national government of free higher education. <clears throat> Students from across Pakistan are mobilizing against fee hikes, criminalization of activists, and budget cuts. The Awami Workers' Party, in a statement, urged that the state, sorry, argued that the state has criminally neglected public education, which is relegated to the private sector, making education unaffordable to the majority. Again, something that should sound familiar. And of course, there are long precedents for these fights at home as well. 
In this photo, you see UC Berkeley students, Brian Osario and Angelica Rodriguez, holding signs against a tuition hike as another student addresses the UC Board of Regents in 2018. And as you can see from Osario's sign, his sign points out by noting that then governor of Jerry Brown, sorry, then governor Jerry Brown's tuition at UC Berkeley was free, that free college is not a crazy radical idea, but was a reality only a few decades ago. How we finance the public university is not only about students, but of course also about workers. Right now, University of California Santa Cruz graduate workers withheld their fall quarter grades to demand a cost of living adjustment. And graduate, stu graduate student workers statewide, including here at UCLA, have joined the movement announcing their own campus specific demands, including that any funding for a cost of living adjustment will not come from increases in undergraduate tuition, thus connecting student debt to worker pay. Or consider the struggles of contingent faculty. 70% of all professors in the United States are contingent, paid by the course with little or no benefits, little or no job security. Indebted students are increasingly taught by immiserated teachers, a phrase I borrow from Adam Getachew. And the AFT, the SEIU, and other unions are involved in that struggle for just labor conditions. These campus-based movements coexist with effective national organizing. In September 2011, the Occupy Student Debt Campaign recognized one T day, the day outstanding student loan balances in the US reached $1 trillion. Again, that was 2011, so eight years ago. Growing out of the Occupy movement, the Debt Collective, a group that I organize with and who is representing in that back corner, I see you beaming, Nathan, yay! <laughs> launched the first student debt strike in US history. This form of collective financial disobedience, a debtor's union, expanded from the initial 15 student debt strikers, many of whom are here with us today, to tens of thousands of participants. And this pilot debtor's union, which we'll hear more about today, has won over $1.5 billion in student debt cancellation over $1.5 billion. They have also led directly to the sweeping federal legislation now on the table in this presidential cycle. Social movements are increasingly making the demand for free education in frameworks of reparation, redress, and universal public goods. Here you see the Movement for Black Lives policy platform and the first plank in their reparations argument demands reparations for systemic denial of access to high quality educational opportunities in the form of free and full access for all black people, including undocumented and currently in former, current and formerly incarcerated people to lifetime education. And here, if people haven't seen this document yet, the Red Deal, and we welcome Nicolas Cruz from the Red Nation. The Red Deal, written by the Red Nation, demands free education for everyone in the context of free and sustainable housing for everyone, free health care for everyone. As the work of Critical Resistance reminds us, and we welcome Professor Dylan Rodriguez, a founding member of Critical Resistance, Abolition is both a vision for a world without, right? A strategy and a vision for a world without prisons and policing, and a vision for a world with the presence of housing, education, healthcare. So these photos are from the Critical Resistance Building in Oakland. I just took them this past December. So with this increasingly collective struggle, where are we now? We are, as I said, celebrating victories and planning for the day after. In this photo, taken in Washington, D.C., just this past summer, representatives Ilhan Omar, Pramila Jayapal, Bernie Sanders, not in this picture, support here from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, proposed sweeping legislation entitled College for All. I'm gonna end my remarks by introducing that legislation for those not familiar with it. But first I wanna point out who else introduced this piece of public policy this past summer in Washington, DC. The woman all the way to the left in this photo is Pamela Hunt, who is sitting in the back. Welcome, Pamela. <laughs> 
She is a member of the Debt Collective and one of our nation's first student debt strikers, who also joins us today from Connecticut. It's wonderful to have you here. The man standing in the back is Thomas Goki, also a fan founding member of the Debt Collective, also a debt striker, who is joining us on live stream, undoubtedly. Thomas, welcome. <laughs> Let's see. Representatives Omar, Jayapal, Ocasio-Cortez, and Bernie Sanders invited social movement activists to introduce this legislation precisely because it was social movements who had been making these demands forcefully and collectively, and in this case, using the new tactic of the debtors' union for years. So, very quickly, just in case there are some people who don't know about it in the room, College for All is federal legislation that would Eliminate all $1.6 trillion in outstanding student debt for 45 million borrowers. Eliminate tuition and fees at all public two and four year colleges and universities, community colleges, trade schools and apprenticeship programs. Provide funding streams to historically black colleges and universities and tribal colleges. Make federal funding contingent on university working conditions. In other words, if universities are to receive this funding, it is contingent on the following conditions. That 75% of instruction must be provided by tenured or tenure track faculty. In other words, a complete reversal of the statistics that we see today. And universities would have to drastically reduce their reliance on subcontracted non-union labor. All of this would be funded by a transaction tax on Wall Street, or I should say that the two-thirds of the package that would come from the federal government would be funded by a transaction tax on Wall Street. So I want to put this legislation, College for All, into perspective. When Occupy Student Debt organized 1T Day eight years ago, right, I showed you that slide, the media responded with derision. Reuters' Chadwick Matlin wrote, they want all student debt in the country forgiven. And if the government would be so kind, they'd appreciate it if it would pay for high higher education from here on out as well. He went on to ask what has happened to this proposal and respond to his own question, hardly anybody has cared. That was 2011. And yet here we are today with multiple presidential candidates proposing their own version of debt cancellation and free, again, public college. How we got here, and importantly, where we go from here, how we move toward truly reparative public finance in the university and far beyond it, is I hope much of what brings us together in this room today. So if I think all of you got a schedule, it's a two-sided thing that should kind of walk you through the day, just to take a quick look at it, you'll see that we'll start by hearing from some of the Debt Collective strikers, and I'll call you up in a moment, and we'll then move to our first keynote of the day with Professor, Professor Stephanie Kelton, perhaps asking a question that many of you thought of as I spoke, but can we afford it? Overcoming the deficit myth. Professor Ananya, Professor Ananya Roy will moderate Q&A after that keynote. And we'll then have two panels with lunch in between. And I just want you to note that the moderators of those panels will actually facilitate a conversation among panelists so that we have an opportunity to hear more from the panelists themselves. And after that, we'll have our closing keynote with Professor Barbara Ransby entitled Race, Capitalism, and the Neoliberal University, Reimagining Justice Out of Crisis with Robin Kelly moderating audience Q&A. And then to close the day, we will invite all of you outside into the Luskin Commons for an exciting closing collective action and group photo. And I want just to let everybody know as you come up to the stage, because we are live streaming, we ask that everybody when they speak, speak into a mic. So either this mic or one of the mics on the table. So without further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the assembled crowd to Katrina Beverly, Sanders, Fabere, Nathan Horns, Pamela Hunt, Don Lewick, and Mackenzie Vasquez, six members of the United States' first debtors' union, who have together with thousands of other... Oh. So they have together with thousands of other student debtors won over $1.5 billion in student debt cancellation and they have brought us to this historic moment where ideas that once seemed impossible are now both possible and necessary. Welcome. 
Hello, I'm Pam Hunt and I'm from Connecticut. We are debt strikers and member of the Debt Collective. We want to thank the organizers, especially Hannah Appel and her team here at IID for putting this event together. We know that there are many people in this room from different struggles around the country and the world. We stand in solidarity with you. It's thrilling to be invited to be here on this stage to speak at UCLA. Wow, the University of California, here we are. I have to admit, it's a little strange because you see everyone on this stage right now ended, attended a predatory for-profit college. We took out loans to earn degrees that were worthless and we were scammed and defrauded in the process. But we fought back and won by launching a student debt strike. But the first point I want to make is that the one reason we attended for-profit colleges is that there was no room for us in places like this. Like millions of others, we were shut out because public colleges were no longer public. So people like us were forced to enroll where we could. We mortgaged our futures for the chance to get an education that should have been a right. Five years ago, I began fighting for debt cancellation when I found out that I had been taken advantage of by my school. I learned that the Department of Education had allowed it to happen. It wasn't right, I was hurt, and I was angry. However, as time went on and I began to realize that it wasn't really about the for-profit colleges and the political hoopla attached to it, my struggle was about the education arena as a whole and the price tag associated with it. It is drilled into our heads that in order to be successful in life, we need to have a college education. Actually, it seems to be just the opposite for a lot of folks. College can make your life a living nightmare, both financially and emotionally. Attend college and your life may never be the same again. No one should ever have to be in that situation. This is a fight that continues and as a collective, we are making wonderful strides in accomplishing our goal. Debt cancellation, financial freedom, being able to forge our own American dream, one that doesn't occlude a lifetime of debt, depression, and discouragement. We are here at UCLA today to say that we want, no, we demand to be the last generation to have to have student loans. We're here to say that formerly public universities should be made public again. We're here to fight with all of you to make that happen. Our contribution to the construction of a better future is a national student debt strike. I know that student debt strike works. How do I know? I owed more than $200,000 in student loans. Two weeks ago, after five years of fighting, I received a letter from the Department of Education stating that 100% of my loans would be canceled. Everyone with debt should receive such a letter. We invite all of you, whether you have debt or not, to help us launch our strike at the closing ceremony today. Thank you. Now some of my fellow debt strikers will say a few words. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. Uh, hello, I'm Sanders Fabre from San Diego. A few years ago, 
My wife and I moved in with my grandparents, who are now 93 and 101. We've been glad to be there as their caregivers, allowing them to continue living in the house they've owned for 55 years, but that wasn't the only reason we chose to move in with them. It was because we simply didn't have a whole lot of options left. Our jobs had been outsourced, and we simply couldn't afford another risky move. Trying to pay down our student debt for years meant we didn't have any savings to fall back on. The school which my wife and I graduated from in 2006 had left us without the necessary skills to be successful in our fields. It also left us with 96000 in combined student debt. For 13 years, we would pay down that 100000 towards our student loans. We, would have a, we still have a principal balance of around 80000 due to interest. It was a constant struggle to pay roughly 1000 a month, and we were never told about income-based payment options. We were unable to save, start a family, own a home. This debt has slowly been killing our futures. And we always worked hard. We kept paying these loans because we were scared of hurting our credit or losing opportunities. We never questioned if we should pay them. In your 20s, you feel invincible. You blame any inability to get ahead on outside factors like the tough gig economy or a competitive, saturated job market. You keep telling yourself that things will turn around. You'll get that great job, which will allow you to finally kill off the debt. In your 30s, you start to get worried. You start to look for answers and solutions. I just turned 40 this year, and now I'm scared when I look to the future. Now I understand the injustice, the deception, and the corruption at all levels of the student loan industry, as well as our higher education system. I understand that this fight against student debt is a fight for our very lives. Fortunately, people are now waking up to the negative impact of student debt. They're realizing how it is slowly killing the futures of tens of millions of people. People that were basically browbeaten by the former generation into thinking that college was the only way to a better life. We were all too willing to get into debt because it was normalized by those we most trusted. We need to question the very existence of this debt. Why does it exist? And who does it really serve? Our grandparents never had this debt. Think about that. Two generations ago, and it did not exist. Since then, we have allowed the government and corporations to step in and profit from anyone who wants a college education. We must demand an education system that does not include the risk of financial ruin. We need to cancel the debt. Canceling the debt is the only way we can truly press the reset button if we are to come to terms with the failure of a current unsustainable system and make amends for it. That is what a just society would choose to do. I know some people get upset by the idea of cancellation because they already paid off their debt. They should be upset. They should be very upset that a system ever gave them the debt to begin with. Their parents did not have the debt. They shouldn't have had it either. I feel sorry for anyone who ever had to get into debt for an education. Until now, I've been paying my debt, but I refuse to do it any longer. I refuse to support a corrupt system that preys upon students and robs them of their future. In this country, we're expected to save responsibly for our entire adult lives if we are to retire and have any dignity in our old age. But we have created and pushed an education system which burdens us with lifelong debt, preventing us from reaching those expectations. My 101-year-old grandfather took a turn for the worse this past month and became bedbound, requiring extra nursing care, which cost him 6000 a month. Luckily, he had investments, a pension, and no student debt out of college to weigh him down. Unlike some of my comrades here, my debt has yet to be canceled. What happens when my wife and I get to my grandparents' age and we encounter life changes or a health crisis? What about when that happens to millions of people like us who also have no savings? Will we have our social security checks garnished? We were unable to start a family, so who will be there to take care of us? I can't afford to pay 6000 a month. What will happen if we cannot escape this shadow of debt? Homelessness, early death, 
This is why I have been in this fight against student debt for the last five years. I ask you to imagine living in a society where no one has to work three jobs because of this debt, where no one becomes homeless because of this debt. What would it be like to live in a world where people don't have to risk the health of their children and loved ones because of this debt, where they don't suffer from depression and take their lives over this debt? Let's all work together to create a future where education is a right and we can all live our lives with more dignity. Thank you. Hey guys. All right, um, so I'm gonna try to talk like a normal person, uh, but public speaking is worse than my fear of clowns, so we're gonna do that. Um, so forgive me if I'm like literally just reading. Um, okay, so hello, I'm Nathan Horns, um, and I'm from Missouri. I came to California in 2008 uh, because I wanted to be a singer-songwriter, pop star, and that never happened. <laughs> so then my mom was all like, hey, boy, guess what? You're going to college. And I was like, all right, girl, whatever. So <laughs> I end up going to Everest College, and I spent four years there. And by the end of my four years, I had realized that I'd been lied to, that a lot of people that I went to school with had been lied to. And so... I started organizing with my fellow students, and then came Debt Collective. They discovered me, they discovered the work that I was doing with other students, and they were like, hey, let's work together, let's help each other, let's help you help other people. And that's literally like one of the best things uh, for me in my life is to be able to help people. It's what I've always wanted to do, and so I was like, yeah, let's do that. Let's help other people, but like also help me. <laughs> <laughs> So long story short, uh, after a couple of years of organizing on my birthday in February of 2017, I received an email that all $70,000 of my student loans had been discharged. So yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, it had been two plus years, and after we had announced the first student debt strike in U.S. history, I finally got what I wanted. Um, I was relieved that the mountain of debt that I had uh, was gone and that it's this amount of debt that I could never pay back because what job did I get from that, right? So why am I here today? You're like, your debt's canceled, boy, what are you doing? And I'm here standing with all of you. I'm standing with them. I'm here in solidarity because I love you guys. I don't know you, but I still care about you and I want the best for you guys, right? So... I feel like education, it's, that's our right. Like, as human beings, as Americans, like, it's our right to be educated, okay? And then, so, we should be able to lead healthy, healthy lives. We should be able to, to have families and, and to go travel the world and, and do all the things that we want to do. We should be able to do the same things that our parents were doing when they were younger, right? So... How do we make that happen? We did that student debt strike. Okay. Um, the biggest change that would come from a national student debt cancellation would be that the $1.6 trillion wouldn't be hanging over the heads of over 45 million people's lives. If someone is resistant to college for all and is questioning why their government should discharge all of these debts, I would say to them, look on TV. You got Felicity Huffman from Desperate Housewives and Lori Lawlin from frickin' Full House being all like, let me buy my kids way into college and, you know, let's, let's lie and sneak around and do things and expect something, you know. But that's not how the real world works. So they get this slap on the wrist, but then there's students like you, students like me, students like them that you know we don't have rich parents to you know get us these bought college scholarships or whatever the case may be right and then so we get knocked out of the running and that is completely wrong it's time to give all students of any age background social status the opportunity to thrive and to get the education that they deserve in 2016, the conversation around student debt cancellation was small. In 2020, it's what every presidential candidate is talking about. 
The Debt Collective has helped to bring the stories of debtors to light. Our strike even got a mention on CBS drama, The Good Wife. Anybody watch that show? It was good. It got canceled, whatever. 2020 is the year to use our power to educate our political leaders, but it's also the year to educate ourselves. Alone, the bank owns us, but together, we own the bank. Thank you, thank you guys. Hello, I'm Katrina Beverly from California. The reason I am on the stage is I'm standing in solidarity for the debt strike as I was defrauded by a for-profit college like everyone else here from the Debt Collective. Thankfully, I had my $26,000 loan discharged. However, there are so many people also receiving public education and, deep, and are deep in student debt. I'm willing to bet some of you sitting in the audience currently are experiencing this issue, but are too ashamed to admit it. However, so many people are in the same boat with the 1.6 trillion owed for student loans. We, the people, should be fighting against us as these loans are predatory. We have started by publicizing the defense to repayment form, which has helped relieve students from $1 billion of student loan debt. Bring you student loan forgiveness and college for all into national conversation among politicians, as well as bringing it into normal conversations in households. People are realizing they are not alone. People should have, shouldn't have to put off starting a life or having garnishments off of their pay after college just because of student loans. Thank you. I'm Mackenzie Vasquez. I'm from Santa Cruz. I want to talk a little bit about what I learned from organizing. Uh, first, let me say that the student debt crisis um, has affected two generations. First, l let me say that the st oh, just kidding, sorry. <laughs> um, it is disproportionately felt by people like me, black and brown people, by women and by poor people. Um, as you've already heard, thousands of debt strikers have won debt relief through the work of the na nation's first debtors union. I'm one of those people. Uh, my loan was canceled back in early 2016. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did we get here? Uh, to this point where debt cancellation has now happened for some and mass student debt ca cancellation is now on the table at a national level. We got here through organizing. Um, 15 people declared a debt strike in 2015. That campaign helped to get the ball rolling, and I am proud to say that I was a part of that original group. Um, what did I learn from organizing? I learned that their creditors and the federal government wants us all alone and ashamed. ashamed. If we fight, they want us struggling as isolated individuals. Part of my organizing work over the last few years has been to change that narrative. It is the creditors who should be ashamed. <laughs> Since my debt has been relieved, why am I still fighting? Um, I want to live in a society where what happened to me can't happen to anyone else. We had free college in the US before, and the fact that we don't have it now is an example of how our economic system has failed us. We didn't bat an eye when we bailed out the banks. And I stand here and I speak for 45 million other, others when I ask, where is our bailout? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I'm here because organizing taught me that collectively our 1.6 trillion in collective debt can be a source of power. 
I'm here to fight until we win debt cancel cancellation and free public college for all. It's not a handout. It's a question of justice. Like other public goods, including housing and health care, education is a right. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. My name is Don Lewick and I am from Las Vegas. The fight to challenge the worthless degrees that we received from for-profit schools that scammed us really helped to penetrate the sound barriers that keeps millions of people silent about their student debt. That organizing helped to bring real conversations into places and spaces like this that we're having today. Education is a right, it is not a privilege. For anyone that's currently has student debt, whether you be the student, you be the parent borrower, or you're a co-signer, this fight is for you. We are also inviting you to join us in this struggle, whether you have debt or not. Let us be the ones that say this stops with us. No future college student or parent should be forced to debt finance and education ever again. If you want to get plugged in, you can start by visiting our platform. That's strike.debtcollective.org. If you're a professor, please share this with your students. And if you're a student, please share this with your peers. And be sure to join us outside at the end of the day when we actually launch our campaign at the end of this. You've heard the testimonies today of individuals that know what it's like to actually receive student debt relief. I mean, come on, 15 students that went on strike led us to winning over a billion dollars in student debt relief. Now we are coming for all $1.6 trillion of debt. <laughs> Thank you guys so much in solidarity. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Can we give another round of applause to the strikers and the debt collectors? I'm Ananya Roy. I'm on the faculty here at UCLA. I also serve as director of the Institute on Inequality and Democracy. This convening led by Professor Hannah Appel. And can we have another round of applause for her? <laughs> is a vitally important endeavor for the Institute. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Stephanie Kelton, our keynote speaker this morning. I'll be brief in my introduction so that we can spend our time listening to Professor Kelton We'll also have some opportunity for questions and discussion with her towards the end of this session. Professor Kelton, who does not really need an introduction to this audience, is an economist whose scholarship has had a transformative impact on the discipline and its analytical frameworks of public finance. Her work is central to the concerns of the Institute and this convening so we are so thrilled and grateful that she has joined us here this morning. What is at stake in her work is a decisive repudiation of what we might think of as austerity democracy. Those two words can't really coexist, I'm sure you can tell. And a bold vision of the role of government spending. What is at stake is a radical reconceptualization of deficit and surplus, and thus of capital accumulation itself. We all eagerly await her forthcoming book, The Deficit Myth, Modern Monetary Theory, and Creating an Economy for the People. Dr. Kelton is Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Stony Brook University. She is also a Senior Economic Advisor to Bernie Sanders' 2020 presidential campaign. Amidst the many debates, oh yes, 
Amidst the many debates afoot at this political moment, she brings a clarity that serves as a normative horizon for us all. As she has repeatedly noted, we need to stop asking, how will you pay for it? And instead ask, how will you resource it? Please join me in welcoming Professor Kelton. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that um, extremely kind introduction. Thank you to Hannah, to all the organizers, to the strikers. Um, it's, this is an incredible convening, and I'm very happy to have been able to get here from New York in order to be part of it. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to make sure that we have the time for Q&A. I think usually that's where the most uh, fun happens is during the Q&A session. So I want to be mindful of how much time I take and leave time for us to have a dialogue at the end of this. Um, this is inspiring. This is a moment where, you know, in many ways for almost the first time in my lifetime, we have a political discourse that is swinging for the fences, where politicians are putting forward big, bold, ambitious, aspirational uh, programs, um, policy programs, and we're getting a chance to see what kind of a world we could actually live in if we were able to pass some of this legislation. Okay, so I titled the talk, but can we afford it? Because that is always the first thing you run up against, right? Well, how are you gonna pay for it? Where is the money gonna come from? What about the deficit? We're already broke and all of those sort of conversations. So I wanna see, I know that some of the faces that you see on the screen here are no longer with us. Um, <laughs> and with any luck, that will be more true in the coming weeks. Um, but, but let's see what, what kinds of things we're talking about here. Okay, so let me see if my clicker will work. Is my clicker going to work? Are we gonna advance the slides? No, that's okay, I can do this. So we're, we're hearing things like, listen, this is not realistic. These, some of these candidates are promising the moon, right? You can't have the moon. It's not reasonable. This isn't realistic. So whether it's universal pre-K, whether it's Medicare for all, whether it's a Green New Deal, whether it's canceling student loan debt and making public colleges and universities tuition free, we got ourselves a problem because we need to find the money. And we are already running trillion dollar deficits. We already have multi-trillion dollar national debt. How could any of these things possibly happen in light of our nation's fiscal challenges. That's what we're told, right? So here's this question, never goes away. First question, you get a candidate on TV, you get a candidate in front of an audience, and they're pitching their values, they're pitching their morals, they're talking about building the kind of world that they believe that we could have if we all got behind things like Medicare for all, debt cancellation, and so forth. And they get the first question from the journalist sitting across from them, morning talk show, whatever it is, how are you going to pay for it? How are you gonna pay for it? And then the whole conversation deteriorates because you say, well, we're going to pay for it by doing X, Y, and Z, and someone says, but X, Y, and Z won't raise the revenue you think it will because think tank A, B, and C say that it won't, or, well, but you're underestimating the price tag of all of this. So we start fighting over the numbers and we lose sight of the morality of the policy and the vision, right? Because we get bogged down in the number uh, in the number game. So this question, how will you pay for it? This is Washington speak. I worked for a period of time as the chief economist on the US Senate Budget Committee for the Democratic uh, senators on that committee. And what how will you pay for it means in Washington speak is, look, I want to do a trillion dollars of infrastructure investment building, modernizing, and repairing America's crumbling infrastructure. So I'm a staffer, and I work for a member of Congress, and my member of Congress, my boss has a bill to do infrastructure spending. My job is to go around and see how many other members of Congress I can get to jump on that bill, right? Support that bill. So I start calling around the offices, and the first question always is, what's your pay for? 
what you're paid for. What you're paid for means, in Washington speak, what are you going to pair with that legislation in order to extract a permission slip from the Congressional Budget Office? Because that's how bills, ambitious spending bills, move through Congress, right? You write a bill, and then you send it over the Congressional Budget Office, and the budget wonks take a look at it, and they score the legislation. This is the feedback that our legislators are asking for. Tell me what the budgetary effects of this legislation will be. How much will it add to the deficit over the next 10 years? How much will it add to the debt over the next 10 years? If those numbers come back and they're not favorable, you don't put your bill on the floor, you don't get support for your bill, and you don't get to vote to pass the legislation. So what you're pay for is a really common question uh, for lawmakers in Washington, D.C. People want to be assured that if they jump on a bill, that they're not jumping on a bill that's going to add to the deficit, right? That everything has been costed out and fully, quote unquote, paid for. It means that you're adhering to something called PAYGO, right? And so what is PAYGO? PAYGO, yes, yes. PAYGO is show me the money, right? Where, where is the revenue coming from? Show me the money. I need to see that this is realistic. So it's a self-imposed budget rule. When the Democrats retook the House recently and Speaker Pelosi regained the gavel, the first order of business was to pass a rules package. In the rules package was something called PAYGO. The Democrats reinstated PAYGO. The Republicans got rid of PAYGO so that they could pass the tax cuts. But the Democrats came in and said, no, 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 we must be fiscally responsible. We put PAYGO back in place so that if you want to spend a dollar into the economy, you have to take a dollar out of the economy. You have to fully offset any new spending. That's what PAYGO means, right? That you are offsetting your spending so that you're not adding to the deficit, okay? So you can either say you're doing infrastructure spending. You could carve a trillion dollars out of some other part of the budget and say, that's my offset. Or you can raise taxes and say, well, my offset is I found a bunch of money by closing these loopholes or doing this other thing, right? But it's all paid for, so we're not adding to the deficit. And that's what people really care about. It's the budgetary effects, not the human effects. We've prioritized budgetary effects over human effects. And that everything revolves around this line of thinking in Washington, D.C. You must not add to the deficit. So you got to deal with CBO. Okay, the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper considered a nonpartisan scorekeeper. Hey, we just look at the numbers. We evaluate the legislation. We give you the feedback. The problem is that the feedback that's given, and I'm not going to give you a lecture on CBO methodology, um, but I could, <laughs> and it's hugely problematic in many ways, which is to say that once CBO gets finished evaluating legislation using the techniques and the methodology that they rely on, the economic assumptions that they make, they very often end up giving a poor score to a piece of legislation that would have done great good for people, right? In other words, we end up not being able to put good legislation on the floor for a vote because of the response that it is given from the Congressional Budget Office. So if they give it a, a red light, you're done. If you can get a permission slip, a green light out of them, you can move forward. Problem is the Congressional Budget Office is mainly looking at the budgetary effects, right? And so if their feedback says it adds too much to the deficit, then people won't support it, right? Because, well, that won't look responsible. Now, if you're a Republican, you don't care. You say CBO's numbers are wrong, their, their methodology is flawed, it's going to all pay for itself, we can safely move forward, suspend PAYGO, pass your agenda. They don't let this stuff hold them back. They don't. All right? It's the Democrats who are committed to trying to play by the rules, to demonstrate that they can they have a credible plan to pay for every item on their agenda. We can find the money. We can find all the money, right? And so what happens is the Democrats are holding themselves to a different and higher 
quote unquote standard than the Republicans. We are, they are locked in an epic struggle where any new dollar of proposed spending has to be fully offset to avoid adding to the deficit. Now, this requires you to win on two fronts. Not only do you have to persuade enough of your peers to get on board your legislation, vote for it to pass it, but you've held yourself to this standard that says, oh, I'm also going to pay for everything. Everything's gonna be fully offset. So not only do I have to win the, the merit argument that this is good policy, this is good public policy, we should do this, I also have to persuade you to vote for this tax increase. So I have to win two fights, right? Whereas the Republicans only have to win one, you see. So the Republicans do this. They bust through the spending caps, they waive PAYGO, they do the biggest tax cuts in the history of the universe, so we're told, and their policies are going to add more than $2 trillion to deficits over the course of the next 10 years. We know that, okay? We know that. So what? So what? They're not afraid to use the deficit to fund their agenda. They're not afraid to use the deficit to pass legislation that's important to them. Should we follow suit? Can the Democrats do what the Republicans can do? Can Democrats use deficits to fund their priorities? So we're talking a lot here today about canceling student loan debt, and I wanna focus uh, for a little bit on that because some colleagues of mine and I uh, wrote a paper, big report, a number, what, a couple years ago now, and published it with the Levy Economics Institute, a uh, think tank in New York. And what we did was ask this general question. I wonder what would happen if, I wonder what would happen if somehow, some way, we could make all, it was 1.3 trillion when we started this study, it was 1.6 trillion when we finished it, yeah? So we said, what would happen if we could just make all of the outstanding student loan debt go away? What if we could cancel all of it? What we were interested, were, what we were interested in were the macroeconomic effects of canceling student loan debt. What would it do for the economy, okay? So that was the question, and here's what we wanted to know. What would happen if somehow, that's funny, <laughs> the cartoons are great. What would happen if we could make it go away, all right? And if we did it as part of, we assumed in the study that this would be implemented as part of a wraparound holistic uh, reform to higher ed. In other words, that you're phasing in making public colleges and universities tuition free because otherwise you hit the reset button and then the debt clock starts running again, right? So we wanted uh, to ask that question. How would it impact the real economy? And so here's what we found. You cancel $1.6 trillion in outstanding student loan debt. You got 45 million people, most of whom are in some form of repayment at any point in time, right? So you say to them, don't do it next month. Keep the checkbook in the pocket. Don't take it out. Don't write the principal and interest payment. Figure out something else to do with that money, right? So there's an income effect, which is to say every single month, People have additional disposable income available to them. Whatever it was that they would have written, a $300 check, a $700 check, a $1,200 check, an $1,800 check, whatever it is, that money is now yours to do something else with. Okay, so there's an income effect, and then there's a wealth effect, because the difference between the assets on your balance sheet and the liabilities on your balance sheet is your net worth, right? So if you eliminate all the liabilities that are associated with student loan debt, and your assets don't change, well, your net worth goes up. So your wealth is increased. So those two effects, the income effect and the wealth effect, both have positive economic implications. People tend to spend more when their income goes up, disposable income goes up, and when your wealth is higher. So the models that we use, I won't get into the economics, not an economics lecture, but we used a couple of um, very well-known macroeconomic models to simulate the macroeconomic effects. Tell us what would happen to a variety of economic measures, the unemployment rate, the uh, growth rate of the real economy, real GDP, right? Inflation, interest rates, uh, this sort of stuff. So tell us what would happen. 
So the models tell us that the economy would benefit to the tune of somewhere between 86 billion <laughs> and 108 billion dollars annually, annually as a result of canceling student loan debt. That it would reduce the unemployment rate by about 0.3 percentage points. So if the unemployment rate was 3.7, it'd go down to 3.4. Okay, not a massive reduction in unemployment, but you get a growing economy and you get lower unemployment. Why? Because you left people with a whole bunch of money that they could turn around and spend into the economy. You don't go out to eat because you can't afford to. Well, now you can. So you go to the restaurant and you have a meal. And guess what? The busboy gets a better tip. The wait staff gets a better tip, right? People go out and spend. You can maybe afford to move out of the basement and get an apartment because you have the extra 700, 1200 bucks a month to do that with. You can buy a car and make a car payment now. So it's pretty obvious all of the ways in which this works like a fiscal stimulus, right? This is good for the economy. Peak job creation. You're adding about 1.2 to 1.5 million new jobs annually through debt cancellation. So it works like an economic stimulus, right? We went through the mechanics. I'm not going to spend time on this. How do you actually do it? This is important, you know, understanding. It's one thing to say, make it all go away. It's another thing to actually lay out in detail uh, a description of how you actually go about in practice removing the student loan debt from people's balance sheets and what happens as a result. So in this paper, I left this out of the slides, but we, ca we carry this forward and we say Congress could lead, the Fed could lead, that one's a little trickier probably, but there are a number of ways to do this. Dealing with the student loan debt that's already on the government's balance sheet is the easiest part, the part that's on the Department of uh, on the uh, Department of Ed balance sheet, that's easy. The privately issued debt is also easy, but you deal with it differently. You can buy it and cancel it outright, or the government can simply take over the payments. Canceling the part that's on the federal government's books, on the Department of Ed's books, is easy. You just tell people stop paying, and then you sacrifice the interest that they would have paid. You just don't collect it, okay? So that's easy. As I said, we also ran through how the Federal Reserve, if they can buy mortgage-backed securities and they can buy U.S. Treasuries to the tune of $80 billion a month in quantitative easing one and two and three and so forth, well, we think that, you know, there is potential there as part of doing its job, which is creating a healthy, um, stable economy that the Fed could conceivably justify um, being directly involved in something like this. So we could talk about that. All right, so look, we did this, and in our exercise, we didn't include a pay for. So we did not say, let's cancel student loan debt and put up this tax as our pay for. We just said, what would happen if we canceled student loan debt? What would happen? So yes, it adds to the deficit, but so what? Okay, here's where I wanna get into the so what part. The federal deficit increases by point six percentage points, let's say. So if you're running a 4% to GDP, if your deficit is 4% of GDP, now it's 4.6. So what? Is that important? Is that good? Is that bad? We'll talk about that. Okay, so the it adds to the deficit, okay? But it greatly improves state budgets. Why? So the federal deficit increases, but state and local budget if they're in surplus, they get a bigger surplus. If they're in deficit, they get a smaller deficit. Why would you think state and local governments would benefit? Taxes. Yeah, because, the, because in a growing economy, when people are spending more money, sales tax, people can buy a home, property tax, right, income tax. So in, because this is, works like fiscal stimulus, state budgets actually improve as a result of this. So that's very good. Does it require offsets? That's the question. I think that the way that we should approach all federal spending is not pay go. It's not to walk into every discussion assuming that for every dollar you want to spend into the economy, you need to rip a dollar out. That's not the right way to start. The right way to start, my perspective is, to ask the question, would it be safe for me to spend a dollar into the economy without an offset? Are the offsets necessary? And I'll explain what I mean by that. 
our macro study showed the reason we didn't include offsets is because they weren't economically necessary. We didn't need them. Now I'm going to explain what is meant by the offsets. Okay, so I come at this from a different place. I come at this as an economist from a macroeconomic framework known as modern monetary theory. This is uh, what allows me to ask questions in a different way. Okay, but it's a little bit jarring for people. And so I'm going to ask you to you know, recognize that we're entering a new paradigm here. Okay, we're going for a new paradigm. We're not putting this taxpayer at the center of the universe and saying all government spending must revolve around the taxpayer. We're going to put the government at the middle. Okay, and recognize that the government can be centered because the government has special powers. And the special powers the government has, the rest of us don't have, are that the federal government of the United States is the issuer of our currency and the rest of us are merely users of that currency. The federal government is not financially constrained the way we are. That's why their debt is sustainable and student debt may not be, right? It, they can't go broke. We can. Okay, so we have to get through this problem we have where we believe that Ma Mar Margaret Thatcher was correct when Maggie said, the government has no money of its own. There is only taxpayer money, right? It is your taxpayer money that finances the federal government. Well, my position is that she is wrong, wrong, and wrong again, right? Three wrongs don't make a right. But we have been convinced that this is the way it all works. So that's why we end up thinking that every damn thing we want to do is going to require picking somebody else's pocket, a tax increase to pay for it all, and so forth, right? This is wrong. There is public money. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you literally print money and pay for things. I'm just saying the way the federal government already finances all of its spending is by instructing its bank, the Fed, to carry out a payment on behalf of the Treasury by changing the numbers in the appropriate bank account. Look, Congress just approved $738 billion for the military. For the military. We didn't raise taxes to give that authorization. Okay, we didn't have a conversation about pay-fors and offsets and all that kind of stuff. Congress said, you know what, I know you didn't ask for $738 billion. I know you asked for less. But we felt like giving you $738 billion. So that's what they authorize. And I guarantee you every one of those payments will clear because the Fed will carry out every payment that is authorized by Congress. That is how it works. Okay? So here's Ben Bernanke. Bernanke was asked on 60 Minutes. Uh, I, I'm not going to roll the video, but I'll tell you what he says. He was asked if that was taxpayer money that was being spent as the economy was collapsing in the, in the Great Recession after the financial crisis. Bernanke said, it's not taxpayer money. We just used the computer to mark up the size of the account. We, that's what he said on national TV. We just used the computer. So these guys have powers afforded to them by our founders. Constitution, Article I, Section 8 gives our government the right and the exclusive right to create our currency. Can't come from anywhere else. It's counterfeiting if I try to do it, right? You can't do it. They have that power. And it is why Congress can commit to spending money it doesn't have, right? Because it's the issuer. It has to authorize the expenditure. The rest of it takes place automatically. The Fed carries out the payments. Is that tax money oh. that the Fed is spending? No. It's not tax money. We simply I told you that that's what he said. I didn't think the video. I didn't think the video was embedded. Well, now you know. I, I speak the truth. So here is. Uh, I love this so much because I worked with Warren Gunnels. He was the staff director on the budget committee. He's been with Senator Sanders for something like 20 years. Uh, and he does this series of tweets, and he's very agitated about how uh, simple it is to fund military spending and, and all of the opposition we come up against when it's for education or health care or anything else. So he gets on Twitter, and he does this really angry thread, and he says, you know, Congress keeps appropriating money to buy warplanes and other weapon systems. We spend, we spend. How can we keep giving more money to the Pentagon? And my answer is, 
Go back to step one. Congress keeps appropriating. That's how it works. Congress has the power of the purse. If Congress wants to fund something, the spending will take place. You have to find the votes. You don't have to find the money. You have to find the votes. If you have sufficient votes, whatever it is will be funded. That's the trick, okay? So what about this deficit thing that gets in our way? I think that what we have is not a deficit problem. What we have is a language problem. The words that we use to describe things, taxpayer money, revenue, deficits, the national debt, these are bad words. I'm not much for banning words, but I would ban these words. These are unhelpful, inaccurate description. This, let's, we should stop using them. People don't understand what the government deficit is. So let me try to illustrate what we're talking about. We talk about the government deficit. Suppose the government spends these 10 bundles of money. Now, they're not physically printing and putting cash in the economy. It's done, right, by a, an entry to a spreadsheet bank account. Right? So government spends this money into the economy, and then it comes along and it taxes part of it back out. So now we're going to spend 10 bundles in, and we're going to tax four bundles away. Now, the government has just engaged in deficit spending. It spent 10 in, and it only taxed four back out. We label that a government deficit. But because we use the word deficit, everyone thinks that someone's done something wrong, right? There's irresponsible behavior here. Why aren't things matching up? Why are you spending more than you're taking in? It's not irresponsible behavior, at least not necessarily so. If you put 10 in and only take four out, what you've done is made a financial contribution, a deposit, to some other part of your economy. Somebody got that six that's still sitting there. Okay, the question is, who got it? For whom is this deficit being run? And for what purpose? Are we investing in education, infrastructure, R&D, or are we giving you know, huge tax breaks to corporations and the wealthiest people in this country, the people who least need the help? Republicans understand perfectly well that the deficit delivers a financial contribution to some part of the economy. That's why they did it, right? They want to direct and divert that financial deposit into the hands of the people who least need the help. So they increased the deficit, and they helped a lot of people out financially, and they moved on, right? Deficit itself is not inherently good or bad. It is just the surplus that exists outside the government sector. Their deficit is our surplus. Their red ink is our black ink. The question is who's our, right? How many of us are captured in that use our? This is a graphic from Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs uses a framework of analysis that shows what I just showed, that the government's financial balance, which you see there on the bottom in red, is, in a sense, the flip side of our financial balance. Okay, So when their deficits get bigger, our surpluses get bigger. And when their deficits disappear, our surpluses, financial surpluses, disappear. So think of austerity and what that means trying to go out and shrink the size of the government deficit is the same as saying my goal is to go out and shrink the non-government's surplus, okay, to do away with that. So I see these headlines, trillion dollar deficits and all this stuff, and people panic and they think this is the reason we can't have nice things because we have a government deficit, right? So we can't have nice things. I see that headline and I interpret it differently. I watch this word deficit. Trillion dollar deficits are the new normal. It's meant to you know, provoke panic and fear and angst. So, but when I read it, I read this. I mean, we're gonna have trillion dollar surpluses this year, next year, the next year, and so forth. That's what we're predicting. Don't tell me what's happening on their balance sheet. I don't care. I'm interested in what's happening on our balance sheet, our collective balance sheet, the non-government part of the economy. Okay, so there's another way to look at this stuff. It's about perspective, right? You see a deficit. Well, I see a surplus, okay? Is it a six or a nine? It's, it's both, right? It's both. It's a matter of perspective. So we gotta get over thinking that government deficits are the reason that we can't increase spending without offsets, that this is what holds us back, that we have to adhere to PAYGO so as to avoid using the deficit 
to achieve part of our agenda, right? To accomplish some of the things we want to accomplish. I could spend a lot of time on this, I won't. Um, but very quickly, this is like data, real data. I didn't make it up. It's historical data going back to the 1950s for the US. The red is the federal government's financial balance. You can see the government has been in deficit almost all of that period with one exception, the Clinton years, 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, when the federal government's budget moved into surplus. And what happened to the private sector through that period? Well, the private sector is in blue. So you can see that the private sector's financial balance is normally in surplus. But for a period of years, beginning in the 90s and moving into the 2000s, the private sector's financial position deteriorated. It was households, largely, that spent more than their income. Deficits, right? We ran the deficits. We spent more than our income, and we accomplished that largely by leveraging up, borrowing. Debt, debt, debt. The household sector took on the debt and fueled a, an economic expansion that for a period of time People thought, wow, this is a great economy. Low unemployment rates, high productivity rates, low inflation, high growth. Wow, this is great. But if you were looking under the surface, you realized that all of that growth that was taking place was being um, fueled by private sector debt, private borrowing. Okay, And that's not sustainable. The government can live down there in the red ink. They can be in deficit for long periods of time. The rest of us can't. And the reason, again, is because they issue the currency and we just use it, okay? So we don't have the same fortitude that the federal government has when it comes to spending more than our income and taking on debt. So when I ask the question, how much of our agenda could we accomplish before we need offsets, before we have to pick fight number two? Are you all with me? Fight one and fight two. I get a sense that you are, okay? Pago is two fights. Kelton is saying, why do you wanna have two fights? Sometimes it's okay to just win on one, right? What if you could convince members who might not vote for the tax increase part, but who might otherwise support your legislation, okay? What if you could do that? Would you be willing to pass your bill even if it added to the deficit? And my position is that you should absolutely be prepared to move forward and pass legislation, even if it involves adding to the deficit, as long as that increase in the deficit is safe. What do I mean by safe? I mean that the economy is not already operating at full employment. If you have a full employment economy where everybody who wants a job is already working, Every business is producing as much as it's possible to produce to meet demand. If then, in that environment, you cancel student loan debt, people have all this extra disposable income available. They want to buy a car, they want to go to a restaurant, they want to get a haircut, they want to go, and they can't get an appointment at the salon because they're booked up, and they can't get a seat, they can't get a booth at the restaurant because they can't seat anybody else. That's a full employment economy. That, in that environment, Adding fiscal stimulus runs the risk of, say it, inflation, of inflation. But if there is space, if there's slack in the economy, if there is enough room to allow people to have higher incomes, which lead to higher spending, which lead to higher sales, capitalism runs on sales. Higher sales, higher revenues, higher profits, more hiring, that's where the economic boost comes from. That's why I said real GDP goes up, unemployment goes down. The economy had the productive capacity to absorb that additional spending safely without accelerating inflation. And for that reason, we said that student debt cancellation could be accomplished without pairing it with a tax increase. Okay. So the Copernican moment is getting us to rethink the purpose of taxation. That's the real big shift in the paradigm here because everyone in DC thinks of taxes as pay-fors, as revenue raisers. Okay, that's where the government gets its money that it can then spend on other projects. And in our framework, we say, don't think like that. The currency issuer doesn't need to go out and get 
dollars in order to spend dollars. Congress appropriates funding, right? That's what the budget authorization is. You can commit to spending money you don't have. Think of inflation, uh, think of taxes as your protection against inflationary pressure. So if you're close to full employment and that bath water, that sink water is about to roll over, then you can't just spend more into the economy. You're gonna have to offset some of that spending, maybe with higher taxes, maybe with cuts to some other part of the budget. But think of taxes not as getting you the money you need to finance programs, but as making it safe for the government to spend on those programs without creating an inflation problem. Okay, we used to know this, this is an article uh, written by the head of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, a guy named Beardsley Rummel in 1946, wrote this paper after the U.S. went off the gold standard. They were off a gold standard, so he said taxes for revenue are obsolete. That's not why the federal government taxes. We do it to control inflationary pressures. We do it to impact distribution. I could tax the wealthy, not because I need their money to pay for programs, but because I want to deal with these extreme concentrations of wealth that are driving wealth inequality and corrupting our democracy and causing problems in the functioning of our economy and so forth. I don't have to take their money because I need it to pay for stuff. I have to take it because it's creating other problems in society and in our economy, okay? Think of taxes differently, that's one thing. Taxes are for subtraction. Raising taxes doesn't make the government better able to spend, it makes someone else less able to spend. Taxes are for removing spending power from the rest of us, right? They don't augment the government's ability to spend money. Think of them as inflation offsets. So if someone wants to make public colleges and universities tuition free, figure out what that will cost, figure out whether the economy can handle that additional spending, what if you do that? Do we have the teachers? Do we have the graduate assistants? Do we have the labs? Do we have the parking? You know, I picked Michael Moore up uh, at the Kansas City airport years ago, and he got in my car, and I'm driving him to some event, and he said, you know, I, um, I was a student. I was going to a community college, and I showed up for school one day. I couldn't find anywhere to park. And so he said, I left. I never went back. He literally dropped out of school because he couldn't find a parking place. That's a real resource problem, you see? You have to have the real resources to deliver on your policy. The financial resources are the easiest part. It's managing the real resources that is sometimes the challenge, okay? So we got to get beyond PAYGO, think differently about when and why we need to pair legislation with taxes. Again, here's the finding from our piece and the reason that we didn't use offsets is because we ran the model and we showed that real output increases when you cancel student loan debt, which meant businesses can produce more. The economy gets more productive and the inflationary effects are over there on the right. And what you see is that the inflationary impact is extremely modest in the early years and then tapers off to statistically insignificant in the out years. In other words, it doesn't create an inflation problem. So there was no reason for tax increases to go along with the legislation. So what I'm suggesting is that we break that link between taxes and spending. Think of them separately, have separate fights. You can make the argument that it is sound policy, sound public policy to cancel student loan debt or make public colleges and universities tuition free independent of making an argument about the tax piece, right? They can be separate fights. The Republicans certainly let them be separate fights. Um, we've got this thing backwards. What we think is that the federal government needs our money. We believe Maggie, Maggie Thatcher, okay? They need our money. And so we think that taxes and borrowing, T-A-B, taxes and borrowing come first. That's how the government raises revenue, they tax or they borrow, then they have money, and then and only then are they in a position to spend. Spending comes after they've collected the money. That's what we think, and that's wrong. And that's what bogs us down and has us always asking, who's gonna pick up the tab? Who's gonna pick up the tab? How are you gonna pay for it? Because we have this tab model in our heads. My argument is that we have to flip it around, okay? My, you know, this is a bad joke, right? We have to take a stab. <laughs> at a better understanding 
because we have to understand that just like in the Warren Gunnels tweet, the money comes from the appropriation process. That's what Congress is, that's what they do. They appropriate funding, which means they commit to spending money they don't have. These, the authorization to spend comes first, then after that, you can decide how much of that spending, how many of those dollars you feel you need to take back out of the economy and whether you wanna offer bonds to replace some of the money that you spend in. The borrowing piece separate, but we don't have time for that. All right, so this is the last slide. We have to, have to break out of this pay-go austerity mindset or we're not going to get the policies that we desperately need and that people deserve. Okay, so when I see this the other day, I see Senator Sanders um, say, that, you know, we're the richest country in the world. We can afford to do things like guarantee health care and education to people. They say, how are you going to pay for it? That's what they say. Here's what we need to say. How will we resource it? How will we resource it? Not how will we pay for it. That's the easy part. AOC came out and said, how will we organize for it? Because you know we don't get any of it without that piece of it, right? So how do we move the discourse in a more fruitful direction where this is the stuff we pay attention to? Our real resources, do we have the doctors, the nurses, the uh, medical beds, the long-term care facilities, the dentists, the eye doctors, do we have the professors, do we have the classrooms, do we have the parking places, right? Do we have the real resources to deliver on the policies that we are proposing because that and only that is what limits us, right? It's our real resource constraint, not a financial constraint. And we gotta get beyond that thinking. So thank you very much. This is being live streamed. Uh, we have the opportunity to have a Q&A with Professor Kelton and Pamela has a wireless mic that we are happy to circulate. But I'm going to use my moderator's privilege to get us started with a question. That tweet of yours that so many of us have been thinking about, mm -hmm. how will we resource it and how will we organize it, brings us back to the work of the Debt Collective. So. We've been talking for so long about tax-financed public goods. And the fight for the public university has often involved a deep discussion about mm -hmm. political strategies that allow us to move from debt-financed education to tax-financed education. What is the political strategy required for deficit-financed public goods? Well, so I, I want to make one point, which I didn't make in the earlier remarks, just to make it very clear that states, unlike the federal government, are financially constrained. They do have a revenue constraint. So using the word revenue in the context of state budget finances is a perfectly appropriate thing to do, right? States are dependent on the ability to raise revenue to cover their budgets. So to the extent that we also are uh, asking and expecting states to commit resources, financial resources to higher ed, um, then at least the tax financed part of it matters, right? So what I'm saying is, look, the making public colleges and universities tuition free, the, the estimate is, does anyone know the cost estimate on an annual basis? That, right, who said that? It's about 70 billion a year, about $70 billion a year. So it's not trivial, but remember, we just did 738 billion for the military, and that involved giving them more than they asked for by about 38 billion. So we're halfway there just in because we can, okay? So if we could do another 40 billion, well, more than halfway there, right? Could they have done an extra 70 billion? The, the equipment, of course they could. Would it have created problems in the economy in terms of inflation? It would not. So what I'm saying is you could commit the amount that is estimated to be required to do free college without the need for offsets. Is anybody talking about that? No. 
Why? Because our political discourse is corrupted by the deficit myth, by this belief that adding to the deficit is inherently irresponsible and thus everything must be done on a pay-go basis. Let's open it up for questions. So if you could also just take a second to introduce yourself. Hi, thanks for the talk. My name is Yusuf Al-Belushi. I work at UCI down the road. Um, and I have two questions, one that's more economic, one that's political, following up on Ananya's question. So the economic question is just if you could give us a sense of, I mean, you've given us this nice introduction to MMT, what is the difference between MMT's approach to uh, deficit spending and Keynesian economics, right? You marked this departure point with Thatcher. So just in, in really simple terms, I'm curious if you could let, lay that out for us. And then the political question, building off Ananya's point, and it sounds like your response replicated what you were talking about earlier, which is that still working within the old framework, it seems like we're missing the opportunity to make an argument that I thought your colleague was making in his tweet about the need to actually cut the military budget in order to sp spend in, on redistributive policies like public education. Right? So in other words, what's the political cost of saying we can continue to finance the military, which will drop bombs on schools in Afghanistan, so that we can build schools and pay for schooling here, right? You see how there's a slippage there? Whereas, if, even if the economics may be right, that all we, have to, we don't even have to worry about inflation, we can spend extra money on the, on the schooling side, the political strategy potentially hurts us, right? Because we have to, working within the existing economics, that we actually have to pay for something, we have an opportunity to make an argument about redistributing where our, our spending is going, taking money away from the repressive apparatuses of the state that neoliberalism has poured money into, prisons and the military and the police, and actually putting it towards more public redistributive welfare spending. So how would you respond to that dilemma? Well, I don't see it as a dilemma because it's not working. So if the, if the argument is that MMT rips out from under us the ability to say, look, if we continue the myth, if we continue the myth and we say the, the only way we can have these nice things we want is if we find the money. And where we can find the money is by cannibalizing the military budget or by taxing the billionaires or whatever the case may be. Now, I'm a progressive, so that if I do that, I get to scratch two itches, because I really, re let's say I'm, I'm playing the role of someone who has these you know, positions. I really want to cut the military budget, and I really want to soak the rich, and I also really want to help people and have good public policy. And by marrying those and keeping them linked, right, I can scratch both itches. I have this great narrative. I can go out and I can say to people, we gotta cut the military, we gotta cut the military because then we can have all these things. We gotta tax the rich, we gotta, because then we can have all these things. My argument is, it doesn't work. It hasn't worked, it didn't work last year, it didn't work four years ago, it didn't work 10 years ago, it didn't work 15 years ago. The military budget blows up. The prison industrial complex has blown up. It's not like Democrats haven't been saying these things for decades, it's just that it doesn't work. What happens is you don't get the progressive policies that you're fighting for, so you're holding hostage the progressive agenda to the, your ability to also win on these other fronts, to win with the defense. Look who votes for these defense budget authorizations. The votes are 91, 91 senators voting in favor or 87 senators. Go look at the last few years. It's always more than 80% of the Senate. You're not gonna get Democrats in Virginia to vote to cut defense. You, you don't even get half of Democrats voting against it. So I would rather, you know, there's no reason you can't make the argument again separately that we don't need to spend more than the next 10 countries combined on the military and that this is not the best use of our real resources have that argument, try to win support, get your colleagues to try to vote to cut the military budget, fine. But don't hold hostage the rest of the progressive agenda on an unless and until basis. Unless and until we can cut the military, we can't do these other things. I, I find that self-defeating and we'll never get 
any of what we want. We might as well do it the way the Republicans do it. Pass your agenda, right, and, and do it in pieces. The Republicans want tax cuts, and they want to cut entitlements. But did the Republicans say that we're not going to cut taxes unless we can pay for it by cutting Social Security and Medicare? Because they could have done that. They could have got, gotten a bill together that said to CBO, we want these big tax cuts, and it, they won't add to the deficit because we're cutting Social Security and Medicare. They could have done that. They didn't. They, they wanted a win on at least one front. So first they said, well, we can do this piece, right? We're going to get hit too hard if we go after entitlement. So let's get what we can. I'd like to get what we can, right? The first part of your question, the difference between Keynesian uh, and MMT, it's, it's not even something I can do in five minutes. It's the old joke where the tourist, uh, you know, is walking around somewhere in Ireland, Dublin, and comes on a farm and says, you know, how do I get to Kilkenny? And the farmer goes, well, I, I sure wouldn't start from here. It's that kind of a question. I can tell you a lot of things that are different, but they're so fundamentally different that they're not differences at the margin. When I say taxes don't pay for government spending, well, every Keynesian textbook out there says the government finances ex its expenditures by taxing and borrowing. So it, it's a litany of, of differences. Great. Let's take a few more questions. Thank you so much for this. Uh, it was enormously illuminating. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you some hard questions about MMT. I've always wanted to ask um, an expert about them. <laughs> How much of your argument has to do with uh, the dollar being a reserve currency and a sovereign currency, given that there are nations collapsing everywhere under debt who obviously cannot um, do exactly what you're describing? And what about the criticism that the risk of runaway hyperinflation, if the thing gets out of titration, is so great that we would just see radical bond divestment from around the world, and um, that it's just a very rickety, precarious way to run a, an economy, even if it has some merit. Okay. Could you just address those yes, two yes, things. Yes, yes, yes. I, I know I, it's a little bit in the weeds. No, but no, that's okay. I, I, can, I, I the, uh, let me just say one more thing. Okay. The reason I think it's really important is that if we, who support a fundamental transformation in our political economy, are going to move behind MMT rather than quote unquote socialism, I mean this is a form of capitalism that that uh, provides for social goods in a in a remarkable way. Um, we really have to know we're on the right train. And so, and we, and we also have to know if we're on an American-centric train. Thanks. Good. Super. OK, so your question about the role of the US currency, uh, dollar as a reserve currency, is much taken up in chapter five in the forthcoming book. But let me give you, um, well, it's not like we haven't talked about this a lot. So <laughs> does what I've said here today require, is it US centric? Is it something only the US can do in terms of the paradigm shift, the way we think about federal budgeting? Does it require a, a country to be the global reserve currency issue? The answer is no. Canada can do it, the UK can do it, Japan can do it. Look at Japan as an example, right? Sustain um, substantial budget deficits, a debt to GDP ratio that is about 240% debt to GDP, ours is 100 or 70, depending on whether you go gross or um, not. But there's no debt crisis facing a currency issuing sovereign that refrains from borrowing in currencies that they don't control. So if you look around the world and you see countries that have experienced debt crises, Venezuela, Argentina, um, Russia in the 90s, right? These are countries that started borrowing in currencies that they don't issue. Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, the debt crisis that gripped much of the periphery in Europe in 2010. Well, these countries gave up their sovereign currencies. Greece was fine in terms of financial uh, sustainability when the, all the debt was denominated in drachma with a 140% debt to GDP ratio. It was all denominated in a currency that the Greek government and only the Greek government could issue. So there's no default potential when the debts are denominated in your own currency. So set that one aside. That's, uh, you don't have to be the reserve currency. You just have to um, control your own currency, not 
pledge to convert it into gold or another country's currency and not borrow in currencies that you don't control. The other thing I want to make, try to make clear is that MMT is a descriptive lens. I gave you a description today as someone who worked in the Senate for the Budget Committee of how the government already spends. I wasn't making a proposal, really. I was providing you a description of how it all already works. So MMT is a lens that is meant to help us see more clearly what we do is we walk around with a set of lenses that are outdated, our prescription, right? Somebody has not filled us with a new prescription, and so we walk around with lenses looking at the world as though we're still on a gold standard, as though we're constrained financially because we might run out of money, like you run out of gold. We are not on a gold standard. 1971 happened. Richard Nixon closed the gold window, suspended convertibility, and then by 73 it was all over, and we have a floating fiat currency today. And that's the new lens we need. We need to recognize that when the monetary system changed, that it opened up policy space that is available to us that we aren't taking advantage of. So the last part of your question, I very quick, um, how do you make sure that you don't overtake advantage? So that you're, you, there are limits, right? And I tried to say that the limits are in our real capacity. Our economy, like every economy, has a speed limit. You can only ask so much of your labor force, of your machines, of your technology, of the factories you have. They can only do so much at any point in time. The productive capacity is limited, right? So if you try to run your economy beyond its full capacity constraint, you get inflationary pressures. It happened in World War II, right? Women came into the workforce. People started working double and triple overtime, and we got some inflationary pressures. So what I'm suggesting is that today what happens in the federal budgeting process is that no one, and I mean no one, thinks of inflation. Right now, today, there is not a single member of the House or Senate that I've ever met or heard from that thinks when they write a bill, I wonder if, the, if this is potentially inflationary. And MMT is asking us to center inflation risk and to think about the impacts of any proposed new spending in terms of the economy's real resource capacity to handle that spending. So we could just as easily task CBO with you know, evaluating proposed legislation for inflation risk. We don't do that. We just say, tell me if it adds to the deficit. But you could add, you could add to inflation big time without adding to the deficit. You see, so my point is that MMT is asking for greater fiscal responsibility and oversight and sensitivity to inflation risk than what we currently have. And obviously there's the political question of how we can task CBO with a lot more than that as well, which is something that we'll hopefully yeah. come back to later today. We have a few minutes left. So I want to take a, a round of questions together. Is that all right? And then you can pick... Okay. Which pieces of them you want to answer? I want to get all the questions out. Oh, yes, Please thanks. introduce yourself. So that was Professor Wendy Brown from UC Berkeley. Um, I want to make sure that we um, get that as well. Hi, I'm Andy Preen. I work in the library here and organize locally with the Democratic Socialist of America. Um, I'm very glad for your framing of the Cheney administration's very eager spending uh, to increase the deficit, but something I, growing up in that era, there was definitely a dissonance when they were talking on the other side of their mouth that all these immigrants were coming here, taking jobs, taking money out of the economy. And I'm worried about modern monetary theory being co-opted by the build the wall people, the nationalists in Europe and Japan as well, that they might um, take this and then argue that we need strict controls on immigration. Are there any arguments, economic arguments, within mon modern monetary theory to push back against nationalist, xenophobic immigration policies. Um, hi, my name is Masur Khan. I'm with the Service, em the Service Employees International Union. And um, so we're sort of, th this is more of a higher education, like the College for All bill, because um, I, mean, I think one of the benefits of the, of the way of this fe the federal state partnership that is at the core of the Bernie proposal is the federal government can deficit spend and states cannot and so you can have uh, with, a, with higher education like all public goods being counter cyclical 
you can write the, uh, recessions. And my question then is like, it's more like, do why need why do we need the state part of it? Why not sort of move towards a more of a Medicare style instead of Medicaid, where the federal government just creates an entitlement and funds higher education directly instead of trying to run it through the states when the states could have problems during during a deficit uh, during a recession. And one last question, and then the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Jason Wozniak. I teach at Westchester University in Pennsylvania. Um, just a quick question. Is this an attempt to avoid class struggle? Um, and what does it do to production and redistribution? All right. All right. So let me go in reverse order. Um, is, it, is what I put forward here an attempt to avoid... Uh, picking fights or having or, or class struggle. No, I made it. I hoped that I made it clear that this is about picking separate fights. That it's about not tying the success of the progressive agenda to the simultaneous achievement of other goals. That to me seems um, cruel. Frankly, it seems cruel. If we're going to say that we are willing to tolerate mass misery, hungry kids, crumbling infrastructure, homelessness, and the rest of it, student debt, I'm willing to allow those things to continue until such time as I beat the billionaire class, or until such time. That's cruel in my mind. That is cruel. If you can alleviate some suffering today, while the fat cats stay fat for a little while longer, I bet you that if you could pass a robust progressive agenda, uh, you would have the votes that are going to be necessary to deal with wealth inequality and the rest of it. I, I believe that. I think that there, are, there is a better chance that you can pick up the votes you need to cancel student loan debt or do Medicare for all if it isn't always paired with something that many Democrats won't support. I mean, I, I just at least think it, you have to be willing to have that as plan B. Let's say that, okay? Plan, B, plan A can be move forward with both. Pair them. Tie your, tie your spending bill up in a wealth tax or whatever uh, other progressive type of um, legislation you want and s see if you can get it. And if you can't, are you prepared to do what Republicans will do, which is to get part of what you want and then keep fighting for the rest of it? So that's my position. Um, asking states why not, if the federal government is uh, the currency issuer and has the power of the purse, why not let them fund it all? Well, you could. You could. There may be reasons, I don't know, but there may be reasons why it makes sense to ask states to have some skin in the game. But you are right, absolutely right, to recognize that state budgets are countercyclical. And when the economy turned down after the financial crisis, state budgets were hemorrhaging revenue, hemorrhaging. And so that is when you most need, because that's when the demand for right enrollment increased. People want to go back to school. So that makes it especially difficult for a state to shoulder much of the burden um, in terms of the financing. So it's a great question. I don't feel especially strongly either way, I, I, mostly because I haven't thought about the implications of freeing up entirely states from any responsibility to fund public schools. Your point, um, MMT and nationals policy. Okay, so. What, we, what I have tried to do and what the MMT project is largely about is getting us to have a better understanding of the monetary system and how it works. Descriptive lens. It's a pair of lenses. So if I come and I give a speech or I write a book and people say, wow, that provides a lot of clarity. I understand now better how the federal budgeting process could be used to fund public universities, cancel student loan debt, build a wall. So your concern is that this might fall into the wrong hands. And I'm saying it's already in their hands. 
They did the tax cuts. They put money in the budget for the wall. They did it, and they know they can do it. It was, you know, I mean, so they already have an understanding of the federal budgeting process. They know that votes fund spending, and they know that the power of the purse can be abused. Look at the federal budget. You think it's not abused? They don't abuse the power of the purse today? They do. Um, I can't, you can't put ideas out there and then put, put up, um, what am I trying to say? The, well, barriers or uh, curb, you know, you can't say, but they're not for you. You can't, you will, s somebody, if we don't, they will. If we don't wake up to a clearer understanding of how it all works, I assure you they will. Well, that's a good note on which to end this session and look forward to the next one. Thank you, Professor Carter. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll be back here in 10 minutes. So the next session starts at 12 noon. Please take a short break and join us at noon.
people outside the door to come in. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. At the 15 minute phone call, Taj to five minutes. Just um, maybe, uh, wrap it up, but I can come to you. Or just, eh, just make that sound. Bing, bong, 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 bing, bong. So I'm actually going to start with an announcement, which is that we found this notebook and set of keys on a table. Does this look familiar to everybody? Anybody? A notebook and set of keys. I will keep it up here at the front table. Perfect. So without further ado, we will go ahead and start the second panel. Again, if I can ask everyone to sit down and to encourage people outside to come back in. Thanks so much. Could people please come in, come back, <laughs> or, not. or not, but one way or another, be decisive. <laughs> Separate out the two questions. <laughs> okay, so why don't we start? Um, Today's first panel is um, entitled Remaking the Public University, which is a wonderful title. Um, Colonialism, Austerity, Other Futures. I'm Michael Morans. I teach in the History Department um, here at UCLA, and I'll be your vanishing mediator for the afternoon. Um, we have three uh, wonderful speakers. I'm going to introduce them all now, super briefly, in alphabetical order, and they're going to speak in alphabetical order, so there's... We figured that was the uh, least tendentious way to organize the panel. Um, so our first speaker today will be Wendy Brown, um, who's a professor of political theory at Berkeley, um, is one of our leading theorists on um, the effects of neoliberalism on American democracy and higher education, and also has been a stalwart um, in keeping the Berkeley Faculty Association alive um, probably for more years than she cares to remember. Mm -hmm. um, our second speaker is Rima Brusi, who is from the CUNY Center for Human Rights and Peace Studies. Um, Rima is a longtime activist, both in Puerto Rico um, and in the United States, and a major scholar on issues concerning access to higher education, um, the effects of neocolonialism on um, inequalities, especially around um, racial exclusions. And our third speaker from down the road is Dylan Rodriguez. Um, Dylan is professor of ethnic studies at UC Riverside. Um, he is also the chair of the UC Riverside Faculty Senate, the Division of Academic Senate, and I believe still is president of the American Society. Uh, so president elect. President elect of the American Studies Association. Unless I get impeached. So, well, there is there is questions. There are questions about some of your phone calls. So, um, you may find that um, Dylan, as you may know, is a um, a leading scholar um, on uh, the history of uh, activism around um, prisons, incarceration, um, and uh, racial destruction. Um, in the United States and elsewhere. So, Wendy, uh, if you'd start. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's just a great, great pleasure to be here. It's, um, it's really rare to be in this kind of combination of organizers, activists, scholars, who are all excited uh, at the opening that these really dark times have given to our cause. Um, and I think to be thinking together today uh, is both important politically and, and uh, yeah, 
well, let me just leave it at that. Um, I appreciated Hannah's um, idea about the idea of organizing for the day after victory. Sorry? Ruthie's idea that Hannah gave us about organizing for the day after victory. It seems to me to, that especially it means thinking now about what happens if we win, um, which we're poised to do in this country in November 2020. And, um, but being poised to win also means we have to start right now getting beyond our slogans and make sure we really get what we want. Uh, and so that's what this talk is about. Coming after Stephanie Kelton's talk, um, it's gonna seem like I'm stepping back into the tax and spend framework, but as you'll see, this has a lot to do with my understanding of how public education in the United States is organized, which is in states. So, um, let me go. Healthcare and education are, of course, both public goods, not just rights, public goods. They both ought to be provided by and through the public, derived from, among other things, progressive taxation. Both are essential to both individual and shared welfare. They're both prerequisites to decent lives for individuals, and both are absolutely <coughs> fundamental to democracy. Without them both, along with food and shelter, one cannot either craft one's individual life or participate in sharing and shaping our common one. So both healthcare and higher education provide thresholds of capacity, physical and intellectual, to enact our individual lives and our lives together. Both, therefore, must be high quality and equally available to all. Both are very expensive, but that's where the similarity ends. So I wanted to spend just a minute thinking about the political demands of the moment on the left. Medicare for all. If we were to succeed, it would be a system in which healthcare would be privately provisioned, obtained by individuals, where the quality is largely controlled by the health provision professions. The aim of Medicare for All is simple, and in some ways, its administration would be simple. Everyone who has health care now keeps it, but no longer has to struggle with insurers about coverage, and everyone who has no health care gains access to it. Health care provision itself does not radically change. Practitioners, health care practitioners, remain in their practices, clinics, and hospitals whose standards they largely control. What changes is how it's paid for, the public rather than private individuals, a single government reimbursement system rather than the hundreds of profit-extracting insurance companies. What changes is that every single human being gets access to quality health care, and what assures that quality is the health profession. The demand for tuition-free public education is really different, and I'm going to be focusing in these few minutes on college for all, not debt relief. That's easy in my mind. College for all is the hard nut. The demand for tuition-free education immediately takes us to the enormous range in levels and systems and kinds of public higher education. Levels and systems and kinds of public higher education that serve an enormous number of aims from the trade skills offered in community colleges to humanities degrees offered in research universities at the PhD level. Most importantly, in the US, as we know, public higher education is state provisioned and controlled, which means that its funding and quality is largely determined by states, as well as, at this point, an enormous amount of private fundraising. The provisioning and quality of public higher education is incredibly varied, from the Sterling Research University that we're hanging out in today, to just down the road, Los Angeles City College and the Trade and Technical College, from the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And even within systems of higher education, such as 
the University of California or the California State University System, as you know, there's tremendous variation in costs and quality and in offerings. Now, what we want, obviously, is not to wreck the quality at the top, but rather to make that quality universal, universally accessible, and close the gaps between the parts of these systems and across these systems where there's starvation and there's thriving. We want to level up, not down. But how do we get there? In healthcare, if we're to shift to single payer next year, we would increase access to healthcare for millions of Americans and do so by slicing into massive corporate profits. We'd eliminate the private health insurance industry and its go-betweens. We'd torpedo big pharma, the medical equipment industry, and so forth. If we shift to tuition-free public higher education tomorrow, other than a few stupid outsourcing boondoggles that every public university system is now in, there's no corporate profit to hack into. And other than some grossly bloated administrative and faculty salaries, and those do exist, there's not very much fat to cut. Rather, getting college for all is pure expense, and the danger is that this expense might be accommodated, probably would be accommodated, by cutting into quality choices and the nature of universities themselves. You all know the story. It's already been our story. It could speed up exponentially. Onlineification, adjunctification, outsourcing, extremely compressed time to degree, and enormous downward pressure on offerings and learning outside of STEM and professional fields. That means enormous downward pressure on the humanities, the arts, the interpretive social sciences. That's what our free tuition movement must avoid. But why? Why now? Why wasn't this a problem in the heyday of tuition-free higher ed? In large part because universities, even public universities, were run by faculty guilds, what we quaintly called shared governance. They were cities on a hill, largely independent of the legislatures that meted out their funding, and they determined for themselves what they should be about as universities and what students should learn. They were remarkably insulated until the beginnings of neoliberalism, privatization, and financialization from external political and economic efforts to influence them. And they were, bizarrely, largely trusted by the public to do what was right, to set their own agendas, curriculum, majors, and so forth. Now, of course, this also insulated them from representation and responsiveness to a broad public in admissions, hiring, curriculum, and more, the elite white maleness settled deep in their bones. And this is, of course, also why, in part, they were secure in their power, trusted by other kinds of power. All this is gone. In public universities today, shared governance, faculty governance, is pretty ghostly. It's been eroded from above and from below. And on the rare occasions when faculty try to exercise their collective will, it's often roundly ignored by administrations who, instead, dance to the tune of business metrics and donors, not faculty determinations of what an education should be, how scarce funds ought to be allocated, and so forth. Moreover, as you know, latter rank faculty are a rapidly shrinking bunch. 70% of US faculty today are contingent, meaning non-tenure track, and these numbers have been rising steadily for 30 years. The contingent faculty have never been allowed to determine broad university priorities or agenda. Moreover, legislators and publics no longer trust universities, and especially faculty, to generate the right priorities in curriculums and degree structures. From right to left, especially our large public research universities, are re often regarded by publics and legislatures alike as creaky old institutions from another era, where faculty are overpaid, do too little teaching, and are intellectually self-indulgent. 
where much of what they do is understood not only as unnecessary, but even inappropriate, and certainly easier to provision at one-tenth the price. So what's the risk here? That higher education, without some kind of protection of the sort it had in the past, and I'm not going to argue for resurrecting faculty guilds, don't worry, without some kind of the protection that it had in the past, will become fully dictated by public and private economic interests and not necessarily those that would be expressed in this room. That the substance and purpose and quality of public higher education could slip our grasp at the very moment that we demand and possibly get universal access accessibility. I am not making an argument for faculty guilds. Way too much was wrong with that system. But we do need some kind of stewardship and protection to keep institutions of higher learning dedicated to knowledge that is deep and long and wide, not merely technical, knowledge that is really about studying hidden powers and histories and literatures and languages that make sense of this world and make us worldly, Knowledge that has to do with intelligently crafting our lives together. Whether you want to call that democracy, sociocracy, social democracy, communism, or something else. If we don't protect this kind of knowledge as fundamental in public higher education, then our institutions, at the very moment that we get universal access to them, will become job training factories, nada más. This is not something only that the right is pushing toward. You saw it coming from Klobuchar and Buttigieg in the debate about free college in the last democratic debate, where both came back at Bernie and Elizabeth by insisting that instead of college for all, what was needed was funding vocational training for those who would be our future technicians, plumbers, and so forth. So our demand cannot just be for tuition-free public higher ed. It has to be nested in a demand for higher education of high quality and public purpose. Otherwise, we're going to get tuition-free access to educational fast food or worse, soup lines. Of course, as I said, faculty and administrative salaries that jump to scandalous levels in the era of privatization should be capped. There is some fat to trim from elsewhere in the publics, but not nearly enough to fund the quality and access we want, which is more reasonably estimated, in my view, at 200 billion than 70 billion. In California alone, Michael and I, who work with the UC um, Council of Faculty Associations, work with estimates that would put the cost of refunding the entire system of public higher education in California, the University of California, the California State Colleges, and the community colleges at close to 20 billion. So if it's 20 billion in California, it's not 70 billion in the country. All right, so all this relates to a second danger, which is this. Since universal access to higher ed is incredibly expensive, we have to make sure it's not arrived at by throwing everything else that we who share a progressive agenda, would not want thrown under the bus. Union protected workers with decent minimum wages, health, and pension plans. So many of these jobs have already been outsourced. So many unions are already under attack. Secondly, secure, decently paid faculty comprising one tier, not four or five, Relevant support services for students, affordable housing for students. In UC, especially on the coastal campuses, the price of attendance is way greater in uh, non-tuition than it is in the tuition half. Support for research and for university infrastructures, classrooms, laboratories, and so forth. Now the problem, of course, is that for the most part, Faculty will only fight for their own remuneration and research support. Very few latter faculty even oppose adjunctification, despite the fact that it has huge consequences for their own grad students and departments. 
The unions, understandably, struggle only for their own workers. Students, understandably, prioritize affordability and access. And despite mentioning other things in their plans, these things remain what Bernie and Elizabeth tend to highlight whenever they're discussing higher ed. And as long as all these things are separate, they can and will be played off of each other. No one, almost no one, is fighting for public investment in the entire enterprise and reckoning with the enormous expense of quality public higher education. So um, this is not an advertisement for this project, but I just want to show you what, do I have the right slide up there? Um, something um, called the $66 fix or Reclaim California, which is a plan that a uh, great number of uh, folks and organizations have signed on for that is very California specific, that tucks tuition free education into a broader mission of public reinvestment in public higher education in California and addresses all three tiers of public higher ed. So what does it aim to do? It aims to rehabil rehabilitate what we called the California Master Plan, which guaranteed every California high school grad a place in the system, secured the quality of all three tiers, and made it free. So in rehabilitating this plan, the proposal is to pay for this through a California income tax surcharge that would generate the needed approximately 18 billion a year at this point. This would cost the average taxpayer, I told you I was gonna depart from the last talk, $66 a year, I'm sorry, the median taxpayer, yes, 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 the median <laughs> taxpayer, we've been over and over this, $66 a year. It would cost two thirds of state households, I'm just gonna give you one more slide here, two thirds of state households less than $185 a year. Now in a state with high income, extreme income inequality, some people would be paying a lot more, but no one would pay as much as it now costs to send their kids to the University of California. More importantly, the annual income tax surcharge would free up enormous amounts of financial aid for non-tuition related support, housing, food, books, survival. Now, I'm not interested in you all signing on to the California campaign. Rather, I'm saying that some elements of it might be important to tuck into a national campaign in which our demand is not just eliminating tuition and debt, those are vital, but significantly reinvesting in higher education as a high quality public good that renews democracy, renews the possibility of an educated democracy, and gives the possibility for every individual to make something of their own life. The point? simply that we get free access to an education worth having. Thanks. should never wear heels. <laughs> okay, so hi, my name is Rima and I'm so happy to be here and so grateful for the invitation and already learning so much. Um, so what I want to talk about today uh, is about public higher education and student debt in Puerto Rico. And I also want to talk a little bit about how these are embedded uh, in a broader context of colonialism, neoliberalism, and the debt economy, of course, and also issues of inequality and access to higher education in a, in a broader way, in a broader sense. But I always need to start with some basics about Puerto Rico and who we are and stuff. Can you hear me? I, I hear feedback. Um, the, U the U.S. took possession of Puerto Rico, that's us, next to the Dominican Republic, to the east. Um, they took possession of Puerto Rico, the U.S., in 1898 at the end of the Spanish-American War, together with the Philippines and Guam. Puerto Ricans technically became citizens in 1917, but this citizenship is different from the one in the 50 states. For example, residents of the island don't vote in presidential elections, although we do vote in primaries. Um, we don't have Medicare parity, 
uh, Medicare parity happens in the States at the rate of uh, 100%. We only get about 55% parity from Medicaid, and so forth and so on, including the um, unequal reaction in terms of federal aid to the recent hurricanes and earthquakes compared to the levels of aid in the States. The insular cases, a series of court cases at the beginning of the 20th century, clarified Puerto Rico's colonial condition in a way that I think still holds today. Puerto Rico is an unincorporated territory that, the judges say, and I quote, belongs to, but is not part of, the United States. It's true on that. <laughs> so the structural inequalities and dependence created by our colonial condition, together with those created by the global economy and with the failure of elected politicians here and there to see beyond the next election, mean that now Puerto Rico owes more than $70 billion in debt and $50 billion in pension obligations. Um, yeah. So as a result of all of these, about one third of Puerto Rico's budget is now funneled towards servicing a debt that many believe is both unconstitutional and unsustainable, even odious. With the legal status of neither a state nor an independent nation, Puerto Rico cannot re re refinance or default on its debt. So in an effort to stop Puerto Rico's debt, debt spiral, debt spiral, the then Governor Garcia Padilla declared the debt unpayable in 2016 and announced that they would seek concessions from the bondholders in a sort of, you know, a new bankruptcy process because it didn't exist. There, nothing exists of the sort for us at this point. Now, when the bondholders heard this concessions part, they didn't like it. So they started an aggressively lobbying uh, campaign against any restructuring effort that Puerto Rico wanted. And they framed restructuring and bankruptcy as a bailout. Portraying them, and this is not a video, so I'm not gonna play it for you, it's a screenshot of a video that they used, basically pitting um, Puerto Rico's bankruptcy process and claims against the interests of regular taxpayers in the US, including and actually emphasizing people that had their retirement money um, bound with them, Puerto Rico's debt. Now, the irony of this scenario where the senior American citizen suffers because Puerto Rico doesn't want to pay its debts is really disingenuous. It glosses over the fact that the actual senior citizens losing their retirement are the Puerto Rican retirees that are seeing their already small pensions slashed, and over the fact that the bondholders vigorously fighting against PR bankruptcy were distressed debt specialists, aka vulture funds, not old people fighting for their retirement money. Some of these bondholders commissioned reports like this one, authored by three people who used to work at the IMF. The bottom line of these reports was always the same. Puerto Ricans can pay, Puerto Ricans most pay. It is the right and the moral thing to do. These reports also had repeating or common themes. One of them was where the cuts are supposed to come from. And the constant was they have to come from education, especially the University of Puerto Rico, that has way too much funding and it is way too cheap. So no wonder that the governor that won the next election ran on a platform that included Puerto Rico can pay, Puerto Ricans must pay, it is the right thing to do. And yes, this is the same Ricardo Rosselló that we recently ousted through massive protests on the street. Yeah, and it was a million people on the streets. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I, get ex I get excited. <laughs> so, coloniality, our colonial condition, what it means is that is Puerto Rico ultimately is controlled by Congress. It's under the power of Congress. So and finally, when Congress decided we had to go bankrupt in some manner, right? It was unsustainable. They approved this bill, signed by Obama into law with the acronym of PROMESA, which ironically means promise in Spanish. And this bill, what it did this law, was establish the Fiscal Oversight and Manage Management Board. In Puerto Rico, we call it La Junta. A non-elected group tasked with overseeing the restructuring of our debt and also the whole economy, comprised of four Republicans and three Democrats, again, non-elected. The president of the board in the middle is um, Jose Carrion, and he's also the president of Latinos for Trump here in the US. 
And they brought in an executive director. Her name is Natalie Jaresko. She used to be the Minister of Finance in Ukraine and is currently under investigation because Ukraine is saying, probably and probably they're right, that the way she restructured the debt means that the, their economy was hurt in the long run. So this is clearly, and let me say this very clearly, this is clearly not a bailout. Puerto Rico has to pay for the board. We have to pay for the board ourselves. Uh, and it's about $200 million a year, including Jaresko's salary and her house and her plane trips to the US and Ukraine and her daughter's school, you, you get it. <laughs> so the fiscal board's target, and this was very interesting, the target of the very first cuts, the very first set of austerity measures was Puerto Rico's public university system, half of its budget in the next five years. Huge cut. Now, the University of Puerto Rico is one of the strongest contributors to upward mobility and the local economy. And ironically, it was the one public agency that had the retirement system healthy and funded and that had done a relatively good job at handling its own debt. So why start there? It made no sense. Perhaps, they thought, precarity would make the students more docile and less likely to lead the resistance. Because the UPR, the University of Puerto Rico, also has a history of a robust student movement that has consistently resisted not only concrete measures like tuition hikes and so forth or phantom fees, but also broader issues like colonialism, neoliberalism, capitalism. They've also been able to support other people, other sectors like workers and whatnot, in their own struggles. Here they are protesting against the suppression of anti-colonial sentiment on campus in 1948. And I can never resist that woman on the right with the flag, my grandmother. <laughs> yes, Lala. <laughs> Here they're protesting fees and also measures to debilitate labor and weaken environmental protections in 2010, which is when most of my original fieldwork on this topic uh, happened or started. And this is 2016, right after the PROMESA bill was approved and the fiscal board was slanted to start working in Puerto Rico. While some people were still saying, ah, maybe it's not that bad, you know, maybe the junta will help because they know about the economy and they can make it, the students knew right away and they took to the streets and there's something I've learned by working in Puerto Rico all these years, is that they're usually right. <laughs> so you, you better pay attention. When asked about the reasons for the cuts, for cutting so much money, and off of the one single thing that seemed to be going well for, for Puerto Rico, the University of Puerto Rico, um, the members of the board either ignore the questions, they actually ignore the questions a lot, they explain themselves very little, accountability is really not another thing. Or they say things like, oh, the University of Puerto Rico is way too cheap, and it has to be more like las universidades del norte, the universi universities in the north, like, here. This ideology of too cheap or let's be more like the North is pushed in opinion columns, Twitter trolling, all over the place. The interesting thing is that this idea that the University of Puerto Rico is too cheap, it is not really true. I mean, yes, tuition is slow and we work really, really hard to keep it slow. In our case, we had a formula system, it's a long story, but the basic formula was 9% of the whole country's budget, the whole island's budget, went to the public university. And the idea it was that it was basically tuition free. You had so the tuition was low enough so that it was tuition free, especially if you had a Pell Grant money. But it is not really cheap because when you take into account, and that's what this table is for, when you take into account the cost of college, the total cost and the, and the net price, and put it in the context of the median family income, as it turns out, actually Puerto Ricans are paying a lot of money for even this public education that is so, so inexpensive. About 65% of their annual income of a middle class family. Right? So this is one of several crazy ideas or rather ideologies that are used all the time to justify not only national debt in terms of Puerto Rico, but also uh, student debt and personal debt for families. The idea is that people connected to the policy world have told me things like, um, what student debt, or at least, you know, pricier tuition, actually makes students appreciate education more. So they graduate 
faster or learn more or something, <laughs> which is something that doesn't really, it doesn't really happen. When you look at the research, that's not the way it works, right? Particularly for the lowest income students and particularly above certain debt thresholds. Like I think some studies suggest that it's $10,000, that that's when things start going really bad. Some policymakers and some of the people that think that the Junta was right in imposing these cuts and some people even inside the university, I'm sorry to say that some of my fellow uh, colleagues think this way. Hi, if they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> so some of people have hinted at the fact that they think that the university is too big, too many campuses for such a small island. But really, when you look at the absolute numbers again, when you look at the proportion of the population, for example, you'll see that Puerto Rico doesn't have more campuses than, say, California or New York, New York State. Actually, a little bit less. And even when you look at distances, because it is a relatively small island, when you take into account the fact that there's no reliable public transportation, distances are a relative thing. They depend on whether you can get from one point A to point B and get it they're fast, right? So closing these campuses means that place-bound students will not be able to go to college at all, or we have to settle for something else. And we'll talk about that something else in a minute. So in terms of student access and equity, what these cuts could mean, and already mean in many ways looking ahead, are one, less access for disadvantaged students because of the tuition increases. Two, Less access, and this is key, and it is connected to what Wendy was saying earlier, less access because the selectivity would go up and the ability to support disadvantaged underprepared students and keep at the same time the academic rigor required for quality, that ability costs money. You need to provide the supports. Oops. So where do they go? Yeah. Right. So they end up going to places like the University of Phoenix, and there's also many other places, but I just, I, I have a thing with them. <laughs> I have a thing with them partly um, because Apollo Global, who owns Apollo Education, who owns Phoenix, they were bondholders. And they were some of the bondholders that more and most aggressively and most intensely fought against any form of bankruptcy. So on the one hand, they're making us go bankrupt and go in debt, and on the other hand, they're taking advantage of our students and making them get debt, right? Right? So, you know, I'm not even going to go into this because you all know this. this. This audience actually knows. Basically, the blue is graduation rates. The red is student debt. All of the ones to the right are for profits. Only the one to the left is the public university campus. You know? So evidently, the best bank for your buck, even when you consider it in such a context without any idea of, um, you know, what education means or what college means, even in terms of money for what you get, the public university is the best. But anyway, Phoenix and Apollo are not the only connection that for-profit colleges have with the broader debt facing Puerto Rico. Also, there's the case of Educa Group. Educa Group basically comprises 11 of the main for-profit education companies in Puerto Rico right now. And Educa Group was acquired by Leeds, Leeds Equity. And Leeds, together with Goldman Sachs, owns a big chunk of for-profit higher education in the U.S. Right? Um, they were the owners, for example, most recently of Education Management Corp, which defrauded students, went bankrupt, and then got a bailout. Now that's a bailout. That's the bailout Puerto Ricans want. I mean, that, give us that bailout they got. 66% cut on what they had to pay on their debt. And they still got their bonuses and salaries and all that stuff. So that's the way it is. So. The connections are everywhere, of course. Recently, for example, or in recent years, Sodexo, you guys know Sodexo has been buying um, or renting or whatever it is, the rights to have cafeterias open in Puerto Rico's campuses. And these are the same Sodexo that not only has cafeterias here, but also has very concrete and different links with the for-profit education industry in the States, more recently or most visibly with uh, Kaiser. Kaiser is one of those for-profit education companies that is technically a non-profit but it's actually so profitable. The non-profit is the technicality to get away with not following the gainful employment regulations. And it's the same Sodexo that runs prisons in the UK and in Australia. So our bodies and the bodies of our students and the bodies of Puerto Ricans and the bodies of people here in the States are the very vectors used to transfer capital, you know, to transfer resources from the public sphere into private hands, right? 
Hurricane Maria had little impact on the way they were handling this and the way the Junta is handling austerity measures on the island. In fact, from the Hurricane Maria relief money that supposedly went to universities on the island, very little was actually seen by universities on the island. Very little was actually received by the University of Puerto Rico, which was the one that got hit the hardest, and is the one that has facilities not only for education, but also hospitals and museums and so forth. Some of it went to Canyon University here in the States, and some of it went to NYU, because they took students in and gave them in-state tuition or cheap tuition during that time. The only, the single lonely bill that our representative in Congress has written to support higher education in Puerto Rico was this bill. It only supports for-profit education uh, companies on the island in an attempt to free them from the little regulation they have left so that they can get more government money, more federal money. And these are the same guys that bundle, and of course, you know these too, they bundle as part of their financial aid package their own loans, their own predatory loans to the students. They don't even tell them about um, federal loans or any other possibilities. The earthquakes, the recent earthquakes that are still going on, haven't really made much of a, an impact in the junta's mentality with respect to austerity measures. And in Puerto Rico, our local leaders have decided that the best way to deal with the crisis is to incentivize wealthy people to go to Puerto Rico so that their money and happiness somehow trickles down on us. That they, had, they don't have to create jobs, they don't have to do anything except live there half the year. You know, ah, yes, and contribute $5,000, $5,000 to charity every year, 5000 They get all tax exemption, no state tax, no wealth tax, no tax on passive income. And also, what they're doing for them is called incentives. What the university was getting from its people, that they call the subsidy. Now, just to conclude, clearly their idea is not to revitalize the economy. If it were so, they would be investing in the public university, arguably our most successful project and institution. In fact, maybe they attacked it first because they were afraid that now with all this new visibility Puerto Rico was getting, somebody would notice and say, huh, those guys are poor and still they were financing their public university and do it so with high levels of quality. Huh, you know, I wonder. So, in fact, instead of cutting funding to try and force us to be more like Las Universidades del Norte, I bet many people in El Norte, some of them in this room, would rather make sure quality higher education remains affordable in Puerto Rico and elsewhere, because it does look like we're all in this together. Thank you. I'm here under protest speaking after these two brilliant people. I'm gonna do my best, I don't have slides. You just got me. Um, I wanna thank Hannah, um, Ananya, everyone for inviting me and doing the work of putting the day together. I wanna um, give a shout out to all the folks who did the work, um, putting the lunches out, putting the food out, getting the rooms ready. It is not taken for granted. I just wanna make sure folks know that. I wanna say thank you to the debt collective sitting in the back. Um, just because you all push the space, right? And you, you're, you're the ones that are kind of expanding this movement and pushing it into existence. And um, you're generous and capacious enough, enough to allow somebody like me to try to be part of it in some way. So I appreciate that. Um, so Hannah reminded me yesterday that I'm on this panel to challenge us to take the abolition part of debt abolition as seriously as possible. Uh, so I'm gonna do my best. I'm propped up, of course, by a living tree of abolitionist thinkers and organizers to whom I pretty much owe everything. Um, it would take me half an hour to go down that list of names. But some of y'all are in the room. Um, and many are not. So many of us in the room, um, and, and perhaps some of us that'll be watching the, the live stream and watching the archive of the live stream, have shaped our collective life work in a direct relation to the long historical violences of anti-black racial chattel incarceration, racial colonial conquest uh, and coloniality, gender and sexual normativity, and the structuring logic of racial capitalism, which uh, I, I always wanna go back to the text. Uh, Cedric Robinson reminds us racial capitalism has the tendency of not homogenizing but differentiating, of exaggerating regional, subcultural, and dialectical differences into racial ones. I read that because, damn, that is what student debt does, right? It, it, it does not homogenize, it differentiates even within the uh, external appearance as if it is homogenizing this giant thing called debt. So I wanna think closely about the differentiation that student debt creates as well. 
uh, those of us who are engaged in creative insurgency against these and other violences and their long present tense legacies tend to constantly be reminded that the United States is in fact a condition of domestic war. That's my thesis today. Um, it's my thesis in life. Uh, it, it's, it's a domestic war that is waged through an ensemble of low to high intensity militarizations and weaponizations, including regimes of debt that sustain the logics of anti-blackness and racial colonial power. Given this, what better way to continue my contribution to this panel than by directing your attention to the U.S. Army's counterinsurgency field manual, revised in 2006, by the way, completely free and accessible and downloadable online. I encourage you to read it. Um, revised in 2006 under the principal authorship of nobody other than that fucker, Mike Pompeo. I ask that you follow me in reflecting on the punitive carceral formation of the 21st century university, which is to say the reproduction of the university in the logics of anti-blackness and racial colonial power, as an iteration of domestic counterinsurgency, if you will. Let us consider state-administered debt, neoliberal austerity, and the life-deforming miseries formed in the institutional protocols of the alleged public university as long considered responses to the fact of the public university as a place that's shown itself to be vulnerable to being seized and squatted on by people committed to transformative and radical forms of collective praxis and movement. Perhaps it's time to take seriously the fact that, in fact, the crisis that convenes us here this morning, this afternoon, is not merely a symptom of incompetent university planning, bad faith neoliberal administrators, or failed public politics, all of which is true, but as a local fulfillment of the U.S. Army's conceptualization of counterinsurgency as a complex dynamic totality of repressive technologies. After all, what is the crisis of massive student debt if it is not a form of calculated social immobilization targeted demoralization and economic carcerality. That's capture. Here I want to be especially attentive to the convergence of the university's tactics and technologies of diversity and tolerance, a field of power that Wendy Brown has so thoroughly addressed, with the statecraft of identifying potential insurgents. That's y'all. That's us. That's our friends. Uh, bear with me um, as I read a couple passages from the counterinsurgency manual. 1-4. Long-term success in counterintelligence requires the government to eliminate as many causes of the insurgency as feasible. This can include eliminating those extremists whose beliefs prevent them from ever reconciling with the government. Counterintelligence thus involves the application of national power in the political, military, economic, social information, and infrastructure fields and disciplines. Pompeo's pretty rigorous. 1-128. This is all chapter one, by the way, right? There's, I think, seven or eight chapters in it. This is all from chapter one. 1-128. Oh, it's also interesting, there's no page numbers, right? So there's sections, so it's 1-128, there's no page numbers. 1-128, it is easier to, easier to separate an insurgency from its resources and let it die than to kill every insurgent. I'll read that one more time. It is easier to separate an insurgency from its resources and let it die than to kill every insurgent. Clearly, killing or capturing insurgents will be necessary. However, killing every insurgent is normally impossible. Attempting to do so can also be counterproductive in some cases. It risks generating popular resentment, creating martyrs that motivate new recruits, and producing cycles of revenge. Okay, last one, I promise. 1-129. One Dynamic insurgencies can replace losses quickly. Skillful counterinsurgents must, must thus cut off the sources of that recuperative power. There's a lot more, but that's just a taste. Um, this is me now. This is not counterinsurgency manual. This is the rest of me. <laughs> in reading the contemporary public university in the context of a turn from serving as a primary site of insurgency to being reoccupied as a principal site of counterinsurgency, I want to raise the stakes by asking us to collectively consider the political imperatives of abolition as a contemporary praxis in and against the counterinsurgent public university. Let me be clear that abolition is a practice of futurity. Abolition as a practice of futurity emerges through insurgent counter-civilizational histories, genealogies of collective genius that perform liberated human being under conditions of duress. In other words, it's not somewhere else, right? It's not some past tense. It's not some abstracted future tense. It's always already being done. The late black liberation warrior organizer and vice president of the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa, Safiya Bukhari, um, who wrote a great book um, called The War Before that should be required reading in every classroom, she wrote in a characteristically crystallized terms that, quote, by definition, security means the freedom from danger, fear, and anxiety, end quote. That's it. That's all I want to start with. 
as far as thinking about abolition, is Sophia Bukhari's notion of what security is. Freedom from danger, fear, and anxiety. Security and freedom for people subjected to the normalized state and extra state violence of global US nation building and the so-called public university require a decisive departure from typical demands for policy reform, formal equality, and amped up electoral participation, with all due respect to um, our keynote. What would it mean to think about Bukhari's words in the context of the so-called public university? To consider the fullest implications of Bukhari's statement in this context is to embrace the imperative of abolition, understood in part as collective liberation from systemic, institutionalized, and transgenerational danger, fear, and anxiety, as a minimal condition of sustainable social existence for those subjected to the violence of the university's gendered anti-blackness and its racial colonial logics of dominance. This is also to suggest that abolition is better understood as a collective form of cultural and social creativity than as an accomplished definitive outcome. It's always engaged in making things, as Ruthie Gilmore reminds us. Consider abolition as a long historical accumulation and future planning of acts performed by and in the, names of pe the name of peoples and communities relentlessly struggling for their collective integrity as such. And by this, I'm talking about cultural integrity, physiological integrity, um, uh, you know, collective tribal integrity, every form of integrity you can imagine. Embrace the obligation that accompanies affinity and identification with abolitionist praxis, understood as a point of reference for the complex, dynamic, and deeply collective labors of creating new infrastructures of human being against the duress that some call dehumanization, others name colonialism, and still others identify as slavery and incarceration. Abolition in this framing is constituted by acts long overlapping, dispersed across geographies and historical moments that reveal, reveal the underside of the new world and its descendant forms, the police, jail, prison, criminal court detention center, plantation reservation border, and the so-called public university. Untethered from nationally vindicating liberal narratives of late 19th century white abolitionists seeking redemption of the American project against its own constitutional anti-black chattel carcerality, and in critical dialogue with early 21st century articulations of abolition, another conception of this term becomes possible. Now and long before, I'd like to remind us, abolition is a black radical practice, an analytical method, a present tense indigenous visioning, a queer infrastructure in the making, a creative project, a collective performance, a feminist counter war, an ideological struggle, a trans pedagogy and curriculum, an alleged social impossibility that is furtively present, pulsing, produced in these persistent insurgencies of human being that undermine the totalizing logics of debt, empire, chattel, occupation, heteropatriarchy, genocide, and civilization, and so forth. Abolition in its radical totality consists of constant critical assessment of the economic, ecological, political, cultural, and spiritual conditions for the security and liberation of oppressed people's fullest collective being, and posits that revolutions of material economic political systems compose the necessary but still inadequate conditions for abolitionist praxis under the protracted violence of what I'll call white beings' resilient ascendancy. Uh, guided, here I'm guided by Sylvia Winter's radical critique of European and Euro-American humanism. Uh, I understand white being as a form of imminent and solicitous narrative power. It's precisely the power that lurks behind, over, and underneath the key words of today's gathering, financialism, futurity, public, university, democracy. In short, white being is the militarized normative paradigm of human being that inhabitants of the ongoing half-millennial civilization project have involuntarily inherited as our violent universal. The ascendancy of white being composes the grammars for this modernity's symbolic, cultural, economic, and epistemic coherence under the sign of civilizational progress. This is central to that which must be abolished. Consider abolition, then, as a counter-civilization practice of freedom that defies the modern disciplinary and generally militarized orders of the citizen, the nation-state, jurisprudence, politicality, and most importantly, the gendered racial ascendancy of the white racial colonial chattel university and its deadly regimes of normalized physiological and cultural epistemic integrity. Let me, let me emphasize that the long historical praxis of abolition reflects, honors, and extends the creative genealogies of not just black radicalism, but indigenous anti-colonialism and other forms of radical counter-civilizational and anti-civilizational labor. Abolition is, of course, not merely a practice of negation. It's not just a collective attempt to eliminate specific forms of institutional dominance over targeted people and populations. It's also, as Angela Davis, Ruthie Gilmore, George Jackson, Marilyn Buck, Asada Shakur, and so many others remind us, 
a radically imaginative, generative, and socially productive communal and community building practice. So I go back to echoing Sophia Bukhari's terms. Abolition envisions as it performs a radical reconfiguration of justice, education, collective spiritual and physiological integrity and sociality that do not rely on the paradigms and methods that are universalized through the regimes of white being and their specific formations of anti-blackness and racial colonial violence. So departing from the theme of our gathering, financial futures, consider, I want to ask us to consider the notion of insurgent abolitionist futurity. Insurgent abolitionist futurity. As a collective, vulnerable, experimental, speculative practice of liberation from carceral violence that confounds counterinsurgency. I want to think about a response to counterinsurgency. Consider as well insurgent abolitionist futurity as a radical challenge to the fraudulent universality of liberal social futurity, which is to say liberal white humanist futurity. On the other hand, I would argue that it's within the complex mess of what Sylvia Winter and Catherine McKittrick call the praxis of human being, the forms of human being engaged by the peoples incarcerated by civilizations, geographies, and institutions, including the public university. It's within that praxis that abolitionist creativities flourish and grow into fully articulated revolt. Assertions of insurgent being the human praxis of people in these various stages of revolt, survival, and collective creativity are abolitionist acts. I'm talking about forms of community, kinship, and social life, methods of survival, if not collective thriving, that fundamentally challenge the institutionalizations of misery, including debt, that accompany the counterinsurgencies of white life in and beyond the university. The insurgent possibility of abolitionist futurity is realized in the politicization of this underside position. It is in the collective creative re-narration of the terror that prevents some of us from believing that we can in any way presume our own futurity. The debt collective has been doing this creative work, as have prison and jail strikers in Georgia and California, as have the Standing Rock Sioux, Cheyenne Sioux, and other water protectors at the Dakota Access Pipeline, as have the Kanaka Maoli at Mauna Kea, who are confronting the 30-meter telescope, a project supported by my employer, the University of California, as well as countless other less publicly visible collectives and communities of people struggling to envision and build futurity rather than assimilating themselves to a fraudulent and doomed futurity. This is what the frightfully beautiful abolitionist present and future tense actually looks like. Now, finally, I ask us to consider abolition as an art form, the kind of creative truth that mixes the stuff of history into memory, survival, and breath, as well as resilient, resurgent, internally vexed, and nourishing formations of community that constantly escape the guarantees of any conventional platform or organizing plan. Again, with apologies and all due respect to those folks who are bringing conventional platforms and organizing plans. In some ways, this is not the time to exist on the renewed urgency of a radical abolitionist struggle because such a time preceded all of this. Its messengers have already presented themselves to us in the poetry, letters, manifestos, collect phone calls, and never quite private conspiratorial conversations shared with each other sometimes, but really all the damn time. Abolition is an artful disruption of civilizations and white beings presumed privileged futurity. I feel compelled to reiterate that rigorous, that is, create, critically researched and deliberately theorized experimentation and radical creativity are the soul of abolitionist praxis. There is, in the end, no final fulfillment of the abolitionist social vision. There is only a collective, always emerging desire that surges from the unshakable imperative to fight those forms of systemic violence and institutionalized dehumanization that are the most culturally and politically taken for granted within the conditions of our, of our own historical moment. So maybe abolition is the nightmare that domestic counterinsurgency is always trying to quell. And what better way to be than to exist as Mike Pompeo's nightmare? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, so Hannah and Ananya uh, uh, kindly gave me the task of trying to ask a question um, to the panel after their um, talks that would allow them to um, talk amongst themselves, as they used to say on Saturday Night Live. Um, and um, I thought that perhaps the, the way that I would try to um, pose a question which I think um, comes back to all three of you and loops back a bit into um, this morning's keynote, which is to say, um, uh, as you imagine your uh, 
various universities as you would desire them, either um, after or during abolition, um, properly um, reimagined and flourishing and non-colonial. Um, how would you imagine the real resources that are necessary um, to, um, to bring this vision to fruition? So stepping aside, leaving aside the question of paying for it, when you think about the university that you think we need, what would that university look like? And um, you can all fight each other to answer first. That doesn't mean I'm gonna follow his logic. <laughs> okay, I can say something, but then because I'm the first one, I reserve the right to be the fourth one, as needed. <laughs> okay, so there's it's it's a big question, right? But I want to say, um, yeah, it's huge. So um, because it, it it forces you to take into account reality, even if if you're imagining possibility, right? So you're imagining possibility against a reality that does exist already, and in that sense, for example, we will have to consider. My, my ideal university, for example, would be very good at keeping quality, but we would also be free. And even pushing, putting aside the question of money, this requires a lot of things. A, a reckoning with our K-12 system of education, um, a reckoning with the fact that inequality means inequalities in education that you know, translate into inequalities of admission and inequalities of graduation rates and inequalities of learning in the classroom and the ability to benefit from opportunities in the classroom. So for the university to be truly the colonial, it also has to be um, capable, and this is expensive in more than one way, of providing a lot of support so that people can actually benefit from its, from its being a site. Um, of decolonization. So that would be my first thing. It would be like, it's a very ambitious project and I think it's doable. But I think we, it, it sort of requires that we reckon not only with the other aspects of the system that somehow impinge on the university's ability to teach people and to help people realize you know, their full potential um, in, at the university, but also it's a very practical matter of things like space, that parking lot metaphor from this morning. Right, um, and the, the more, the less space you have inside a university, the more selective it becomes. And regardless of its funding, and regardless of how much it costs, the more selective it becomes, even if it's free, perhaps especially if it's free, it leaves out people who should totally be there. Mm -hmm. So we have to reckon with that. And that's a problem not only of funds, but also of attitude, ideology, space, and other things. So I'm gonna leave it there for now. It's a really good question. I think I got it. Thank you. Um, that one up. No. Yeah. So I'll just say two things about it, I think. One, um, I still believe in universities as places to come apart and put yourself back together. And I don't mean emotionally, I mean blow the top off your head and, um, and, and, th and then start thinking about who you wanna do and be and what kind of world you wanna make. And what would make that possible connects directly to what you're saying, which is that every institution of higher learning across the unevennesses I described in our current systems, in states, between states, would offer that to every single human being. And to do that without anxiety and fear and desperation about what you're gonna become and how you're gonna pay for it and how you're gonna take care of your parents and um, so forth, is such a radical transformation from all of what we have now. The second thing I wanna say is that the people who would be offering this opportunity for the top of your head to come off and think new thoughts and learn 
stuff about our world and how it came to be what it is and what its possibilities are and predicaments and perils and all of the rest of that would be people who don't look anything like the faculties of our universities do now. <laughs> they would be all those who have been historically excluded or simply discouraged from becoming those faculties. And they would thus mirror the students in these institutions. To get to both of those places uh, would be an enormous challenge. But I want to say I don't think it involves building parking lots. <laughs> Michael Moore, we love him. That era is over. We're done with the driving thing. We've got to get out of the driving thing. And we've got to get out of thinking about needing really, 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 really big, sprawling spaces for this work. We have to think about different ecological and tropological domains and dominions for such work. And by that, I don't mean scattered distance learning. That was the threat of how something like UC Merced, our, our stepchild campus, was supposed to be built. It's going to be all distance learning, has no library of its own. It's all just supposed to happen in relationship to others and so forth. But rather, super dense, intense, condensed spaces with beautiful modes of non-fossil fuel-based transportation to get to them and interactions amongst peoples of all abilities and colors and spaces and races that isn't anything like our universities now. I got it all figured out, Michael, <laughs> especially after listening to, to my, my co-panelists. Actually, I've been saying this for a long time. How about, how about decarceration and shutting down a fucking prison or two? How about do that? Start, start with decarcerating, reducing state capacity to criminalize, to wage war, to engage in militarized counterinsurgency, to lock people up all the goddamn time. How about, how about a redistribution of, of, of public wealth um, toward the anti-colonial abolitionist college and university? How about that? How about we start with that? Um, again, that's just a start. That's, that's a minimal condition, right? Um, um, but, but it's to also, to, to, to echo what Wendy was just saying, it's to, it's to prop up the abolitionist um, decriminalizing capacity of education and higher education in particular, right? And, and I'm saying that with a, a, a lot of salt because, because I don't take criminalization for granted, right? So when I say decriminalization, I'm not on the side of rehabilitation parole officers and whatnot. I'm, ta I'm saying take it with a grain of salt. It's the decriminalizing, decriminalizing capacities of higher education are well demonstrated, especially when you are talking about forms of collective conversation, of schooling, of creativity, of learning, of, of letting your head be blown, right, and then coming back to try to figure shit out again, right? Like that has shown so much more capacity um, to create, you know, creative, creative community um, for folks who are subjected to all different forms of systemic state and extra state violence all the time and who are therefore end up in sites of policing, counterinsurgency, and incarceration than anything else, right? And, and I'm speaking to higher education in particular because um, uh, I work with the Underground Scholars Initiative, right? I'm, I'm the co-faculty advisor at, River, at UC Riverside for the Underground Scholars, which is a group of system impact and formerly incarcerated students that are in the UC system. They're trying to build these pathways to get into higher education. Um, so so part, of, part of what they, they are dancing on is this line between the kind of vindicating carceral Horatio Alger, Alger narrative, which the, which the administration fucking loves, right? They want to take former gang members, slap them on the website, and say, hey, look what they're doing now, right? So there's that. There's that narrative. Then there's this other narrative, which is the real one, which is, you know, you have people who did 15 years for second-degree murder, right? You had somebody who participated in, in, in a hostage taking a kidnapping. You have somebody who was locked up uh, during the drug war. You have people who are system-impacted, meaning both their parents were incarcerated. And, and those stories don't have the kind of vindicating Horatio Alger narrative. It's, real, it's human. It's actually just human. It reflects what, what I think, Wendy, was what you were getting at the end of your statement, which is it's just, it's, 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 this, it's a fucked up mess, and that's the whole point, right, is that you get people in a room, and you, you, you have the freedom, and you have the security, you have the safety to actually uh, engage in that kind of a human praxis. So at the same time I say all this, I actually don't think we're ready for it, right? I think it takes a lot of work to get to that point. But I'll come back to my original point, Michael. You said, um, I think the question was something like the resources necessary. The bare minimum is decarceration and shut a couple prisons down. Let's start there. I 
Todd, we're actually going to open this up. <laughs> Don't be frightened. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you. Yeah. So uh, you have to speak into a mic, sorry. So this is immediately directed at Wendy Brown, but then with opening it up, um, you said in your presentation that you don't want to go back to the guild system. So uh, the more provocative way to ask this question is why not? Doesn't it make sense to have professors governing a university? It maybe would with all, also including students. Isn't it, doesn't it make sense to have a space of governance that's outside, that's not connected to state government, to the federal government, right? There's a space of autonomous decision making with funds coming to the university with you know, a certain degree of trust that you know, the professors have the best judgment about what should be learned and enough you know, wisdom to understand that it relates to the world and not just their own scholarly agendas. Should we take two? Yeah, well, I'm going to ask a second one, and then they can respond. Although I'm wondering if you have met professors, if you use the word wisdom. <laughs> but was there a second? Was there a second? Yeah. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Here, you can have our... We're those kind of professors. <laughs> uh, Stephanie, alumni of UCLA, and I'm also a grad student at Cal Poly Pomona, but I do want to say that I also recognize that my participation in the institution reconciles the things that we're criticizing. Like criticizing. But my question is, um, what popular education tactics can we work towards so that th these platicas and conferences that we're having extend beyond the institutions, right? And out into the streets so that we're actually engaging with los de abajo. Because if it wasn't for that, all of us that are in this room, how do we do that outside of this? You know, I'm not even from this school anymore. Like, how are we actually getting these messages to students at UPR, so students from South Central, students from Compton, like myself? Thank you. So just, just so everyone knows, we're going to um, bundle those two, as they say. And uh, once you three have had your opportunity to respond to them, we'll um, move on to the um, consumption of calories. <laughs> Very briefly. Um, I'm not saying that faculty should be excluded, but um, one of the one of besides having reproduced themselves demographically and physiologically for centuries uh, by virtue of running things, um, they also reproduce frameworks, methodologies, and uh, forms of knowledge. Um, it's very, very, very difficult to introduce new ideas, heterodox challenges to um, most fields from within the disciplines, and that's getting harder and harder and harder because of metrics, because of journals governing what's sayable and what's not, because of hiring promotion and tenure processes and so forth. So while on the one hand, I think faculty are very important in being the stewards of what education should be about and should be for. They also uh, have to be checked, and they have to be pushed, and they can't control everything. And I say that as someone who not only is one and whose best friends are and so on and so forth, but I also say that as someone who is enormously sad about what we are losing in the way of faculty governance to administrative governance and to business governance. That's the wrong direction. If I had to choose between those three, I know what I would choose. But to give faculty back the ability to control curriculum, majors, decisions, and so forth at this point in history would be to perpetuate, I think, certain kinds of exclusions, not only of peoples, but also of knowledges. And this is the wrong time to be doing that. And anybody who's ever hung out in economics and has tried to push against that domain, we have one of those people here, um, knows what I'm talking about. But it's true not only across the social sciences, but also the sciences, the professional schools, and so forth. So that's the danger. Guilds are guilds have their advantages, and guilds have their dangers. So let's figure out how to de-guildify while figuring out what stewardship of higher education would look like that would control against the complete and final marketization and politicization that we are facing right now. I have a response to the 
kind of to, to, to both questions. First, I'm, I'm, I'm down for the guild if y'all are in charge of it. <laughs> then I'm in, um, but, only, but only if it's you three. Um, in response to the, the notion of how do you proliferate what we do in platicas and conferences, symposia, stuff like this. Well, I think, number one, I think that um, if, we, if we did an inventory of who's in the room, then those capacities are probably being generated here and right now today, right? So we don't have to look elsewhere for that outside necessarily, even though we're in a particular place right now, right? So to say, now that has to be, that has to be kind of energized and mobilized and made explicit, which is why I appreciate your question, right? Because the whole point is to deprivatize the Luskin Center. You know what I mean? Like it's a deprivatized UCLA. So there, there's that piece. I'll also say this though, as a kind of word of, of, of um, ongoing caution, the nonprofit industrial complex is as much a part of counterinsurgency as is the university. All right, so, so if, if, we're, if we're talking about trying to proliferate these forms of radical practice and radical thought and radical pedagogy in other places, um, we're, also, we're also in a counter, uh, in a, in a counter, in a counter war with the counterinsurgency of the nonprofit industrial complex. I've seen it. I knew Van Jones when he thought he was a communist. You know what I'm saying? Like, <clears throat> you no, know, that dude thought he was a revolutionary. And I remember that that was my introduction to the nonprofit industrial complex was through that dude. Um, so I got nothing good to say about them. Don't talk to me about them. It triggers me. Um, as far as far as as far as actual organizations right here that you could hook up with, I got to give a prop a shout out to Southern California Library. Um, they're always inviting folks. A bunch of y'all here at UCLA work with them. Find them. I mean, that's a great site to kind of engage exactly in exactly the kind of work you're talking about. I'm privileging them, but there's a whole bunch of others, and we should just share. Sure. Yeah, so my mind works, right? Yeah, those are great questions, and I, I I'm really. I would really want, like to bring them together because shared governance is one of the things I'm, I'm looking into right now. And the impact of neoliberal practices and the debt economy and all these things on shared governance goes beyond the, the, you know, the mere economic thing that okay, students have less time or whatever. And it even goes beyond the cultural effects that we know pretty well, which are the ones that have to do with um, the way we make curriculums fit with corporate goals and interests, for example, things like that. Um, it, it goes beyond those things because also at a very basic emotional slash bodily slash cultural kind of level, it gets to you and it gets to your ability to form opinions, express opinions and engage critically with what's around you. Uh, I think it's part, for example, of the reason that full-time faculty seem to have, have a hard time, not as individuals but in general as a group, seem to be having a hard time supporting adjunct struggle and supporting contingent faculty properly. I think it's because we buy into the mentality of scarcity and the importance of you know, watching out for your own interest and your own little money and your own travel funds because if, if I don't hire that adjunct then I lose my travel fund money or whatever or I don't get that sabbatical down the road. All, all, the, all these things are the cultural implications of the imposition of the debt economy and the neoliberal logic inside the institution. So that's one, that's one thing I wanna say. The other thing I wanna say is that to both questions now, is that the idea of shared governance that we have in this country tends to go along the lines of faculty participation and decision making. And so the basic idea of shared governance, the way I learned it and the way it's practiced or at least believed in, <laughs> not necessarily practiced in the Latin American university, in the traditional Latin American university, is shared governance shared with students and staff. That's what shared governance means. It means gobierno compartido. That's the whole idea of shared governance, right? And I think, well, one of the things, and I'm gonna say this last, and then we can talk about it over lunch. Um, one of the things that I always sur surprised about is that people who are very much um, in favor of the kinds of budget cuts we're seeing now in Puerto Rico and elsewhere, are also people that tend to be very scared by student strikes. You know, that's bad, that's a bad university because students, they strike all the time. What do you mean all the time? Well, you know, two years ago they had this strike, and five years before that they had this other strike. And I'm like, that's wonderful, you know, that, that's, that's, that's great. That means something is going on there. That means somebody's head is blowing up. That means people are learning outside of the classroom and that means you're taking the university to the streets because a lot of teaching happens during a strike. A lot of informal and formal classes happen during a strike. A lot of learning both ways and good learning happens during a strike. So I'm not saying let's go all on strike right now. I'm just yeah, saying, <laughs> yeah, after lunch. <laughs> What I'm saying is that we need to, the ideal university, to go back to the first question, needs to be able to tolerate some sort of unrest. Otherwise, we're not doing our job right. And shared governance has to mean more than the guild. It has to mean student and staff participation. Yeah, that's, I'm gonna stop there. Can I just add one thing? 
I think it's really important. Many of you have read Melinda Cooper's uh, wonderful book, which title I'm forgetting right Family now. Values. Sorry? Family values. Family values. There's a chapter in it on um, the history of California raising its tuition, which was directly tied to student unrest and directly tied to a think tank um, that said, the way to get rid of student unrest is to burden families with yeah. debt. And you burden families with debt, and it makes students go to class. And they go to class because their families are not going into debt for them to be on strike. So it's really important for us also to, to make the connection between the enforced quiescence of privatization and debt-structured uh, mm -hmm. public higher education that Ronald Reagan himself was fully cognizant of. I'm totally failing in my um, role as timekeeper because I'm so blown away by the generosity of our participants. So thank you so much. We now have a scant 40 minutes for lunch if we can start right away at 2 o'clock. So boxed lunches are in room 2343, right next door. See Marisa gesturing in that door. Please have your ticket for lunch ready, which you should have gotten outside, and form a line. There are vegan lunches and non-vegan lunches. Please move quickly through the line so that everybody can have a chance to get lunch and eat it before we return. Thank you so much.
this room, so please feel free to bring food and drink in. No, not at all. We got you. We totally got you. So welcome, everybody, back into the room. I am so excited for our next panel, Social Movements and the Fight for Reparative Public Goods. Just a couple notes. Some people who have been watching the live stream have said that the microphones are cutting in and out. So if you are speaking, whether here or at the table, please be sure you are speaking right into a microphone so that live streamers can hear us. And also, Dylan, are you in the room? Dylan Rodriguez broke Twitter. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, exactly. Woo! <laughs> no, Twitter wasn't working for a minute, but now it's back up. So everybody, please feel free to um, make up the tweets that Mike Pompeo refused to let go through. And welcome to our afternoon panel. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's panel on social movements and reparative public finance. Um, my name is Andrew Ross. I'm an NYU professor and longtime uh, participant in the debt resistance movement and the author of at least one book that's relevant called Creditocracy and the Case for Debt Refusal. Uh, I want to thank, um, thank everyone <laughs> from Hannah down. <laughs> Uh, who's been organizing this event so very, very, very well. And uh, I actually want to begin, before I introduce the panelists, I want to begin by going back to the, the, the land acknowledgement that, uh, that Hannah made this morning and just remind us um, of the unpaid debts that, uh, that originate in that act of land, the original act of land dispossession. It's the first of many unpaid de debts that accumulate over the decades and the centuries. And in that arrangement, who are the creditors and the debtors? The debtors are settlers, of course, in, in their many forms. And the creditors are descendants of the dispossessed and enslaved and socially denied, who have, with ever greater clarity, been stepping up to call in the obligations and the unsettled claims. And these unsettled claims take many, many forms. Reparations for stolen land, stolen liberty, stolen wages, stolen children, stolen languages, stolen history. Or in the realm of climate justice, they take the form of repayments of ecological debts for five centuries of colonial plunder and for the climate impacts that are widespread all over the world. And then in the field of education, of course, they've taken the form of affirmative action and curricular reforms, and now colleges, uh, reparations for colleges, past investments in slavery, 
or their current investments in the stocks of corporations that are doing violence to the earth and humanity all over the world. So these claims and many others are all part of the push for decolonization and abolition uh, that Dylan Rodriguez reminded us of so eloquently in the last panel. And so some of the questions that come up, which I'm hoping the panelists in some fashion might be able to, res to respond to, um, how can our calls for tuition-free college and debt jubilee fully embrace these decolonial and abolitionist causes? How central should these causes be to, or can be, to the College for All platform? And what happens to these claims when they leave the realm, when they leave the moral realm and enter the financial realm? And by that I mean, you know, debts, when it comes down to it, debts are root our social relations. They're what we owe one another. There's a moral economy to these things. But when they take the form of financial obligations, they alienate us from the bonds that tie us together. In the same way as wage labor alienates us from the product of our labor, or private property rights alienate us from our commonality with the land. These are really big questions, big challenges. We're not going to resolve them today, um, but I'm hoping that uh, the panelists perhaps can suggest a few pathways to doing so. For the most part, however, uh, they're going to be reminding us and um, telling us how crucial activist campaigns have been to getting us where we are today, which is this watershed moment where the right to education is finally being taken more seriously than the right to access education loans. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists, and they'll speak for 15, between 15 and 20 minutes, then we'll take it from there. Nicolas Cruz is from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's a member of Red Nation. Actually, he's one of the political education chairs of Red Nation, which is a network of indigenous revolutionaries formed to carry forward the latest generation of indigenous organizing and activism. And uh, this, uh, Hannah showed a, 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 an image of the first part of the Red Deal this morning. The second part of the Red Deal was released last week, and I'm sure it's fully accessible, and I'm sure Nicolas will have something to say about that. The second speaker is Leanne Naidu. Um, she's in education at the University of Cape Town, but more importantly, I think she's been a social activist, longtime social activist, participant, and chronicler of the student movement for decolonizing education, which originated in Cape Town and inspired so many campaigns in this country and others. She's the author of the forthcoming the New Student Movement in South Africa, From Roads Must Fall to Fees Must Fall. It's also a Palestinian rights activist, Mabruk. <laughs> and last but not least, Astra Taylor. Uh, Astra is a documentary filmmaker, writer, musician? <laughs> musician. <laughs> and activist, and most relevantly here with the Duck Collective. She's also the author of two major books, The People's Platform, Taking Back Pow Power and Culture in the Digital Age, which is 2014, and Democracy May Not Exist, But We'll Miss It When It's Gone, which was released last year. So, uh, Nicholas, the floor is yours. And please, I have to remind everyone to speak very closely into the mic for the purposes of uh, recording here. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, you actually talked a lot about what I'll be presenting about, so um, this will be brief. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, first, I want to, I want to uh, thank the Institute for having me and having the Red Nation here. Um, it's an honor to be here, especially um, I want to thank the Debt Collective and the work that they have done. Um, I attended a Jesuit university, which is the last place for an indigenous person to be, um, but that's between me and the Jesuits. Um, and I accrued uh, $30,000 of debt. Um, there, uh, in addition to what my father owes for loans that he took out to pay for my education as well. Um, so I really appreciate the work, and, and so far I, ha I have avoided paying any payments on my debt. Um, and honestly, I'm thinking about if you all will take me of joining the debt strike. Um, yeah. and, and so I'd love to learn more about that from you all. 
Um, I'm also really grateful that, um, especially Hannah in, in your opening remarks, uh, really brought the international element. And I'm really happy to be here um, with international comrades from South Africa, from Puerto Rico. Um, and, and I hope to kind of expand on that and why it's so important to the work that the Red Nation does. Um, so as, as I've been saying, I'm presenting on behalf of the Red Nation. Um, and the Red Nation is a native liberation organization. We recently became a revolutionary socialist indigenous uh, organization. Um, and it started in New Mexico where I grew up, um, but is now spreading across the country, including here in California, where I'm helping to start a chapter. We're very excited about that. Um, I personally grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico on Tiwa land, and now live in, a, in uh, Ohlone land in what is called Oakland. Um, I am a non-native member of the Red Nation whose family migrated from Mexico uh, with roots in the Mam Maya community of Chiapas. Um, the reason why we're here, is, uh, why the Red Nation was invited, I think, is to talk about the Red Deal, which some of you may have heard about. Uh, the Red Deal is a platform uh, for divestment from military, prisons, order imperialism, and fossil fuels in order to reinvest in education, caretaking the natural world, and indigenous sovereignty. It presents divestment and re reinvestment as a strategy for decolonization tearing down the oppressive structures that dominate indigenous peoples under colonialism and builds indigenous and non-indigenous futures. Um, and I also really appreciate uh, Dylan Rodri D Rodriguez talking about abolition, which is the twin of decolonization, right? And, and um, I think also links especially black and indigenous struggle. Um, but I wanna start out by sharing a short example of uh, a particular kind of proposal for free education, um, one led by politicians in New Mexico, democratic politicians in New Mexico. Um, and I think it highlights some of the issues of this kind of top-down policy change, right, um, and, and proposals for free college. And I think also problematizes the very notion of public goods within our settler colonial uh, context, which you already did in your introduction, um, which I think um, I will be presenting mostly about. Um, I hate to be a stick in the mud, um, but I often, you know, indigenous people are, in, are always in the way of settler colonialism, and I will join them. Um, and so some background on this. Uh, on this free college proposal. It was proposed by Democratic Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, um, who was elected as part of the blue wave in 2018. Um, you know, even some of our members helped campaign for her, and she uh, was elected with this promise of clean power, clean future. And this is kind of the image that she put forward. She was gonna regulate um, oil and gas in New Mexico. And what happened, and she proposed this free college, uh, public college in New Mexico, but it was based on oil and gas revenues in the state. Um, and New Mexico has a large fracking boom that has recently happened. Um, and so that was the proposal. And, and we, you know, it was this announcement celebrated for its free college uh, tuition. And then there's a caveat that um, it would be funded by oil and gas. And um, this is what the New Mexico Oil and Gas, um, let's see, I forget what their acronym is. The, oh, New Mexico Oil and Gas Association praised her for saying. She said, without the energy effort in the state, no one gets to make education the top priority moving forward. No one gets to make that education priority. Right? And so pay attention to how they link these two together. We get education with the price of our sacred sites, clean air, and water. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the drilling in New Mexico is in or, on, or near indigenous lands. Right. So if we look at the top left corner here, so I'm trying to point. Um, the San Juan Basin is in the Navajo Nation, the largest landmass, indigenous landmass in the United States. Um, it also overlaps the drilling with um, the northern tribes as well as the western pueblos, such as Zuni, Acoma, uh, and Laguna. And so the, this oil and gas revenue is coming directly at the expense of indigenous people, right? And indigenous communities and rural communities, such as in the south, uh, southeast of New Mexico, pay that price, right? And that includes increased rates of uh, cancer, increased rates of asthma, um, and, and even shortening of lives, right? Um, and as well as increased birth defects. And so it is at this expense that, uh, the, that the expense of indigenous communities' lives that the state is willing to trade for public education, right? This is the price that they are willing to pay with our bodies and our children's bodies, right? And so this got me thinking, what are some of the things that we have to consider when, when we're considering these proposals for free education in particular, but also public goods in general, right? And so I, as I was preparing for this, I thought about um, uh, what are some of these questions. And, and this is especially um, for those proposals provided by our current government, right, without any revolutionary transformation by Democratic or Republican um, uh, politicians, right? This, we have to consider these things. First is who is it free for, right? And, um, especially in New Mexico, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, in-state tuition for undocumented migrants. 
Um, so is it open to migrants with or without documentation? Is it based on a settler colonial uh, exclusive and racialized notion of citizenship, right? And does it limit who gets access to these public goods? And how is it free? Is it funded by resource extraction in internal or external colonies, right? Does the, does the funding come at the expense of indigenous communities or does it come from the global south, right? Extracted resources, labor um, that, is, that is stolen from other places and then we benefit from it, right? Um, and, and as I'll discuss later, the wealth of Western and wealthy nations always comes from the extraction of the colonized world. And is that a price that we're willing to pay for or to be paid for, right? And we have to ask ourselves that. Finally, what does it free us from? Is it a liberatory education or an indoctrinating one? Um, and you, you just have to look at the history of uh, US boarding schools run by both the church and the federal government and how they were used as a tool for colonization of indigenous peoples, right? They, as we said earlier, they have removed languages, cultures, uh, ways of life um, that are very hard to get back, right? And, and that is the, the history of education in the United States. And with public schools as well, even after the boarding school era, public schools are still an indoctrinating tool, correct? Um, I wanted to point to the, the work of um, K. Wayne Yang uh, on the UC land grant schools. I'm glad that Hannah brought this up uh, earlier that land grant schools were specifically built to provide settlers with the industrial skills in order to re uh, reproduce settler colonialism, right? And you look at that, that at the you know, agricultural departments of UC Davis and uh, the, you know, the trade schools, all of that is to prepare settlers to settle the land, right? And that, that uh, legacy continues, right? Um, those of us who go to, to higher education, we become prepared to ex uh, expropriate and exploit our own communities either through social control, we join the nonprofit industrial complex, right? We join businesses, corporations, um, or become politicians, um, or it's to expropriate from other peoples, um, from other lands. Um, but there is, of course, the question of uh, liberatory place-based education, which was kind of addressed in the last panel, um, which uh, I think is a, is a very um, fruitful and, and you know, there, there's a lot of potential in visioning what we actually want from education. Um, and, and then we'll talk about what we're willing to pay for it. But the notion of uh, public goods, and, and Hannah Eller used this image, I was hoping to kind of unveil it, because um, I remember the, the night before this action, um, I helped paint this um, banner and, and the, you know, the stolen land, that's the flag of New Mexico, and that's a symbol that was stolen from the Zia Pueblo. Um, and, and it came out on accident. We messed up, and we painted over our mistake, and then we came up with this idea of um, putting the Mexico flag in. When we unveiled it, it was such a, a big shift in the way that we were doing our work. And, and that's mostly because we were um, working particularly with uh, nonprofits and NGOs in the anti-fracking battle in New Mexico. Um, and so I don't know if any of you all have heard of Greater Chaco Canyon, uh, the Protect Greater Chaco mm -hmm. Canyon fight. Um, They're basically trying to lease public lands for oil and gas drilling uh, in the northwest corner of New Mexico near Navajo land and, uh, or Diné land. Um, and, and Pueblo land. Um, and a lot of the NGOs that we work with were uh, basing their campaign on, on the defense of public land, right? The, the main crux of it was that they didn't want the federal government to sell off public land to private interests. And what we kind of realized, and, and through this work, um, we realized that you know, the, the public land that they're defending is stolen land. And it's form, first and foremost an issue of indigenous sovereignty rather than public, uh, you know, protection of public land. And so that was really important to us. And, and by the way, Chaco, you know, um, there was a lease sale just yesterday where they sold, they sold 15,000 acres of uh, tribal land, of indigenous land, um, to oil and gas uh, drilling. And in those lease sales, we are not allowed to buy back land. There's a stipulation in the lease that says if you do not extract a certain amount of oil, the federal government will take it back from you, right? So you actually, can, we cannot buy this land. It is solely held for oil and gas. Um, but, this, but this public land kind of narrative is also evident in Bears Ears National Monument, um, right, which is uh, tribal land shared by five different tribes um, in the Arizona, like uh, East Arizona region. Um, and the, the battle right now is that Trump has just sold off um, the, the National Monument land to oil and gas drilling. And so, it, so that, that framing of public land doesn't take into account, right, that it is still an indigenous land. land. And <clears throat> so I want to talk about how did this land come to belong to the American public or private interests. Um, I kind of want to address the, you know, the Bernie Sanders quote, how did America become the richest country in the earth, 
right? Because when, when America formed in 1776, it wasn't the richest country on the earth, nor was it as large as it is today. Um, and so there's a complicated history of private settlers, right, squatting on indigenous land that first uh, the crown of England uh, refused them, right? They didn't allow them to settle. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the major impetuses for the American Revolution, right, is the settlers wanted access to more and more tribal lands. Um, and yet, once they started to exp uh, expand westward, the U.S. Cavalry, the U.S. Army, was one of the, the primary sources of expropriating lands, in addition to the private settlers and the militias uh, who took over the lands, right? And so I think despite what, you know, the, those white ranchers in Oregon say when they took over that, uh, the Malheur um, refuge, the nature refuge, the federal government and military do serve them in expropriating indigenous land and have always done that. It's also important to be clear, like I said earlier, that the wealth available to redistribute publicly in Western nations, such as the United States, is derived from historical and ongoing colonization, enslavement, war, and the extraction of labor and resources from the global south. This includes especially settler nations, such as the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. as well as uh, most of Europe. In particular, Canada is a perfect example of this, right? Canada is often held up as uh, providing healthcare to their citizens, um, you know, being in, in many ways more progressive than the United States. Um, and just yesterday, they did a pre-dawn raid on the Wet'suwet'en tribe uh, on their unceded territories in order to push through the coastal link gas pipeline, right? And so that is the, that is the cost that these Western nations are willing to pay, right? So when we talk about, oh, sorry, that's Alex said that. Um, which brings us to the Red Deal, because um, I don't want it to be all uh, gloom. The Red Deal uh, is a proposal, or is a, is a platform, really, that the Red Nation has put out. And we, as indigenous liberation organization that uh, has done work in environmental justice, including water protection at Sandy Rock, um, defending Mauna Kea, and anti-fracking work in, in New Mexico, for example, we've developed this document to guide a climate action plan through decolonization. Uh, and I want to be transparent that I did not contribute to the amazing work that my comrades did in planning, writing, editing, and producing this document, and all credit goes to them. They put in many, many hours um, in writing this document, and as was said earlier, it's being released in three parts, and they're still working on that third part. Um, the, green, the, the Red Deal, as the name suggests, you can probably imagine, comes from the Green New Deal, right? Um, but it's not just a, an add-on to the Green New Deal, because one of the things that we want to be clear about is that the Green New Deal was born out of indigenous struggle. Uh, Ocasio Cortez, who was a water protector at Standing Rock, came up with the idea while there, while during, in the struggle, right? And so um, it, it's, these two plans are connected. Um, we're also inspired by the Movement for Black Lives policy platform, which was mentioned earlier, um, and I think really points to what I said earlier that black and indigenous struggle are so linked, right, and that we have, to, we have been following each other's leadership for many, many years, for centuries, really. Um, and, and the Red Deal is not just a add-on to the Green New Deal, but it, and, and it's not a contradiction either, right? We, we are willing to work with people who are fighting for the Green New Deal. Um, and it's not a new deal, right? It's not a, a red new deal because it's the same old deal that we have been fighting for <laughs> in treaties uh, and, and, you know, for, for centuries, right? And it calls for free education, healthcare, housing, and more as part of a comprehensive decolonial project rather than as, a, as reformist demands um, to a settler government or a climate-only platform. Um, it's being released in three parts, as I said. The first one, and the occupation, uh, talks primarily about divestment from fossil fuels, military, border patrol, and police, and especially focuses on uh, the ways that sexual violence that is so prevalent in indigenous communities often comes from either the military or the fossil fuel industry, right, the man camps. Um, and part two, Heal Our Bodies, is about education and healthcare, um, transportation and safety. And then Heal Our Planet is coming out uh, soon, which is responding to the climate crisis directly. Um, by addressing the actual roots of it, right, which are capitalism specifically and colonialism. Um, so I'm going to try to go through these last few quick. Um, it's guided by four principles. What creates crisis cannot solve it. Like I said, specifically capitalism, that technology-based, market-based uh, solutions such as cap and trade, um, the carbon off offsets will not solve the, the problem of climate change because it has caused it, right? And so we have to go beyond that. Um, Change from below to the left. This comes from a Zapatista saying that our hearts are below and to the left, um, and that it's not a, this isn't a top down policy, right? We're not making a deal with those in power, but a deal with the humble people of the earth, right? 
Uh, politicians can't do what only mass movements can. Uh, we've seen that politicians throughout history have only responded to mass movements. That is when they act. Um, I think especially, you know, I, I don't know this for sure, and I'm sure the Debt Collective could say more about this, but I have a feeling that the proposals for free college and debt um, forgiveness only came about after debt strikers and students were protesting that, right? That m mass movements have led that, that effort. Um, and as in the New Mexico example, we can't just follow the lead of politicians because they'll, they'll, they'll often sell us out. Um, it's also important that it's not a reformist set of reforms, such as creating a green and sustainable military, as Elizabeth Warren has suggested we do, um, but a, very, a challenge to the very basis of these institutions. Finally, it's guided by from theory to action because we believe that there is a need to build a uh, united left movement in the United States and the world um, capable of responding to the, the severity of this crisis. Um, and we hope to lay out a theoretical foundation that can then guide the practice of decolonization and abolition. Um, so one, I want to close with a question um, that, yeah, I think after the keynote might, might need some uh, revising because it's mostly framed around taxes. But my question, and, and this is to the panelists as well as the audience, is if our solution to inequality in the United States involves taxing the profits of corporations, what are the sources of those profits and what responsibility or relationship do we have to those from which those profits are extracted? Right? And there's an image earlier of Bernie taking money from Coke, Coke Industries. Um, I have seen the Coke Industries trucks in nor northwest New Mexico that are drilling and uh, flaring methane in that region. And I am not willing to have my education paid by that, right? And I think that's the, that's the question that I have for us is how do we imagine ways that resources what we want without continuing to, uh, you know, do it at the expense of indigenous peoples? Um, and I ask this because what I hope to have communicated is that the goal cannot be to form or reform a better, more fairly distributed settler society. Because to do so would, be, would fail to address the root problem of settler colonialism. Uh, as was said earlier, there's an unpaid, the, the biggest unpaid debt is the debt of settler colonialism. And I would even say that it is unpayable. You cannot buy land by force. Right? You can't repay the theft of land with money. And, no, and, and indigenous tribes won't accept it. <laughs> um, and, and also, if you're to somehow able to fix settlers' problems, it would almost certainly, as is demonstrated with the free college proposal in New Mexico, be at the expense of indigenous land and life, because that is the, the main settler problem that exists today. Thank you. Oh, and you, can, um, and you can read the full document of the Red Deal in two parts. We have our PDFs on theredation.org. We have the release info. Um, and that's where part three will be there, and you can read the whole thing. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. If I do yawn, forgive me. I'm 10 hours ahead of you, so it's midnight where I came from. And it took me 30 hours to get here, but I'm going to try to not yawn. Louder. Louder. Okay, so I probably want to start with this question. What does America owe the rest of the world if we're talking about debt? In particular, America's debt around its imperial project and also the plunder of resources. So I don't think that question can be outside of the room. I think it needs to be absolutely part of what we're talking about. So there's so many ways into the crisis of debt in South Africa that it's been difficult to figure out what to say in 15 minutes to meaningfully help us think internationally about debt. As I've been invited as someone who participated in the student strike that became known as Fees Must Fall in South Africa, I want to use my time to describe a moment in the strike that I think was significant for our conversation about how we conceptualize debt and how we might resist its logic. But first, some context. In late 2015, the university University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg announced a 10.5% hike in student fees. The increase came on the heels of year-on-year -year above inflation increases, signaling the incremental privatization of higher education. This dynamic was felt most acutely by the thousands of black students, mostly the first in their families to attend university, who were given access to higher education at the end of apartheid through a massive process of democratization of education. The post-apartheid state, overseeing this task of democratization in an age of neoliberalization, oversaw black inclusion in higher education, 
but they didn't finance it. So the exit from formal apartheid was not so much that the state withdrew existing funding, but that as it expanded its commitment to racial e equality and access, it did not finance its democratic policies. The result of the universities was the absorption of a huge increase in student population, which created a squeezing of resources. The effect of the squeeze was the massification of classrooms, with faculty having to confront first-year classes of 500 students or more, which strained the possibility of pedagogy for democracy and year-on-year -year rising student tuition encumbering black families. Importantly for what I want to say today, the squeezing of university budgets also involved university management's outsourcing and casualizing service workers work on campus across the country, which meant that the poorest black workers on campus, cleaning and gardening and maintenance workers, lost permanent employment at universities and, for the same kind, amount and place of labor, had their salaries slashed and lost all their benefits. One of the most compelling dynamics of the South African student movement was the building of alliances across the country between students and outsourced campus workers. Since the process, oh yeah. <laughs> this image you actually found, it was in your slides as well, hey? This is a very compelling image, or at least a banner. So one of the most compelling dynamics of the South African student movement was the building of the alliance across the country between students and outsourced campus workers. Since the process of the outsourcing of service workers had begun on campuses in the early 2000s already, small groups of left student activists and staff had mobilized against outsourcing, or for what in South Africa became known as insourcing, the reversing of the outsourcing process. Because of the slow and unpopular organizing over 15 years, when the swell of the student movement came, it was possible to make the argument that rising student fees and outsourcing were linked processes. Both were, you also made that point already. Both were responses to budget constraints, both modes of privatization that had an anti-black effect in the institution. This brought black students and workers into deep alliance with each other in the strike action, with workers downing tools for student demands, protecting student activists and raising bail money for arrested students, for students massifying the demand for decent work for the black workers who had all but been invisibilized on campuses by the outsourcing process. An extraordinary form of black solidarity formed at the center of the movement with black students referring to workers as our mothers and fathers and workers speaking of students as our children. In fact, in the midst of the growing demise of unions more generally in South Africa, the workers understood their alliance with students as being much more powerful than union representation. When the fees must fall strike was successful in getting government to concede to a 0% increase in student fees for the following year, what was a fraction of the demand for free education, but relieved immediate duress for students, the majority of students left the strike and went back to class. However, a cadre of students were outraged that their peers would go back to class when nothing had been won for the workers who had been so crucial to the strike action. They, with workers, kept campuses shut down while facing off mounting police aggression and a hostile university management. It was in this difficult moment of the strike, with a small group holding a strong political demand, that we were able to force the hand of university management to concede to a number of demands around student debt, but also to the setting up of a task team that could look at the insourcing of campus workers. I want to describe some of what happened in and around that insourcing task team, because I think it's important for our deliberation here. When the university management sat down with us at the negotiating table, their position was, if we give in to insourcing, the academic project is destroyed. They put forward that they simply could not afford within the existing budget constraints to employ workers directly and that the university's debt would increase to unsustainable levels, threatening the viability of the institution as a whole. It was at institutional level an argument about scarcity and the importance of austerity in conceptualizing the problem of resources. There were two major moves in argument and politics that we made in response. 
and I hope that these might be extrapolated out to think about the kinds of moves we can make as part of a wider project on facing the problem of debt. Let me say up front that one of the most important victories of the South African student movement was the rolling back of outsourcing on campuses around the country. So I describe these arguments to you because they were in the end effective in producing a quite remarkable victory given how much of the South African economy is pushing in the other direction. When we sat down and confronted university management, we realized that we would never win if negotiations were caught within the frame of the budget. We began to realize that much of our political work at that negotiation table was to break the frame of the argument, was to actively create a different frame for being able to discuss the demand for insourcing. Firstly, they began with a classic economistic argument, we've heard some of those, about how they understood the budget and we didn't, and we therefore had to trust their reading of the budgets. It took a long time for us to get the budgets out of them for scrutiny. When we finally did, we had a difficult moment because we felt obliged to agree that money was tight and it was going to be difficult to pull off insourcing given the constraints of the university's budget. Then we began to realize that the whole equation that framed the negotiation was something that we would have to rethink as part of our political strategy. We couldn't win the negotiation if we stayed within the argument or frame of the budget. What we began to advance was a strong political argument that our starting point for conversation was not the budget, but the lives of black workers. We refused their financial argument and pressurized them to account for black life at the university. This may seem like a simple or obvious move, but it wasn't. It wasn't easy to find and it wasn't easy to make. What allows us, allowed us to find it and make it well was not the anti-privatization discourse and politics of fees must fall, but rather the anti-colonial and anti-racist politics of roads must fall and the debates around decolonization that were ongoing at the same time in the movement. I will never forget the moment one of the worker leaders stood up in a meeting and quoted Fanon, a passage we had been working with together to define the demands for decolonization of the movement or in the movement, sorry. She stood up and said, and I quote, what this university needs to do is put the last first, and the first last. Outsourced workers are the last at the university, and so we need to be put first, end quote. One of the functions of outsourcing was to allow the university to pretend that it wasn't responsible for workers because a private company was contracted to manage those workers, and the university was accountable only to the contract, not the workers, even though the same workers did the same labor on the same property of the university for the same amount of time and that they'd done all of this before outsourcing. The function of outsourcing was to cut the possibility of considering workers as part of the campus community. It was to force them into a different category of person, beyond collegiality, beyond belonging. They're not ours, they are not of us. What black students invented when they began calling workers our mothers and fathers was to deliberately create kinship and belonging across outsourcing. They made a claim on the redistribution of worth. And in so doing, they provided ground for us to be able to resist assimilation into the anti-black economistic terms of management. We began to say things in the negotiation like, you'd never make an argument that slavery should be sustained because it's more financially sustainable for the economic system as it stands. If this was your mother, how would you be able to sleep at night? So we shamed them by asking over and over about the ethical, moral, and political limits of arguing over fiscus. And we broke their frame, at least for as long as it took to get a commitment out of them. The second move that was made in the insourcing task team is related, but pertains more directly to debt. When university managements in South Africa began outsourcing in the early 2000s, workers' salaries were halved overnight, they lost medical insurance, the right to send their children to university without cost, they lost bargaining power against the university, and their access to amenities on campuses were seriously curtailed. We argued that the cost-saving mechanism of outsourcing was, in fact, a way of displacing risk and debt directly onto black workers. If 
financial precarity of the institution was managed by hiding the problem of risk in the private lives of the most vulnerable members of the university community. In South Africa, the word for black working class loan shark is mashunisa. Ukushonisa is derived from the words to sink, to impoverish, to become poor and die. While mashunisa have long been a feature of black urban life in South Africa, they have exponentially increased in post-apartheid, even though they remain informal and illegal. For poor black people in South Africa, Ukushonisa has created unbridled growth in unsecured lending. With interest rates often between 25 and 50 percent, the extortionist lending practices Mashunisa can create puts a great deal of pressure on the salaries and livelihoods of already precarious poor black workers and their families. Many commentators have linked the Marikana massacre at Lonman Mines in South Africa to the fact that many of the striking mine workers were up to their eyes in debt from Mashunisas circulating in the mining belt. One writer shows images of 11 shopfront lending businesses on a short, dusty main road of the township of Marikana. Police killed 34 miners in that campaign, seriously wounding 78. Outsource workers at universities are exposed to similar financial conditions and confirmed that they were using machinistas as a strategy of getting by every month. Indebtedness was not only passed on to the university's most vulnerable workers, it was passed on at much higher interest rates and with much greater threat of violence and the destruction of lives. The risk, in fact, increases, but at the same moment as it is obscured and relegated to black life. The process of hiding was so thorough that black workers could no longer even be seen to be of the same time as, and place as the rest of the university community. So when the university said, this is not financially viable, the university will collapse, we added, it already collapses, but at the sight of workers' lives and families, lives and families that you are trying to obscure. The politics of obscural, of devolution, of hiding the human and particularly racial cost of economies has of course always been a feature of capitalism, but the extremity of its current methods where workers are disappeared as stakeholders in their places of work affects our capacity to recognize these processes. Again, when we first heard comrades making this argument, it became obvious that displacement, the passing of debt to the most vulnerable, as well as the escalation of risk, was what was at stake. But it was difficult to understand and name that process at first. When we sat with workers and built that alliance, we could look at the problem of debt from the vantage point of workers' lives. It became clear that while the university's debt was at least temporarily minimized by outsourcing, the workers' debts were exponentially exploded. The same logic is at work in student fee hikes. The limitation of public spending on higher education passes on its cost to private budgets. And where that stress is felt the most is in the first generation of black university students. The state's argument against free higher education was that once students had graduated, their chances of getting a job and earning middle-class salaries increased dram dramatically. Student debt made sense to them because they were occluding from the equation the translation of education into wages, into debt repayment. The degree to which one black university graduate salary must pay for the lives of many others. You, you must pay for your siblings' education. You must pay for your parents' retirement. You must give to your old high school all the while trying to represent oneself to white colleagues at work as equal and having authority. In South Africa, we call this black tax, the obligation to redistribute, the cost of being the one who made it through to a degree and a good job. In a recent book collecting biographic reflections on black tax, one commentator put it starkly, quote, there's no black middle class, only poverty masked by graduation gowns and debts, end quote. If we did not relentlessly make this set of racialized social obligations visible, discussable, they would have been hidden. This is invisibilized and erased from all calculations and equations. What the protests against fees and outsourcing did was to erupt the hidden curriculum of debt and risk. It surfaced the obscured violence of race and the histories of worth 
and worthlessness that it entails and reproduces. Our job was to make this surfacing increasingly clear, to feed what the objections revealed into an institutional process, even as we were suspicious of it, to win whatever victories we could in the moment of that strike. Getting hold of the frame and breaking it, turning the narrative on itself, forcing new information onto the table, these were what made the negotiations successful, but they took, took hard work to articulate. From this process, we learned to ask this question. What are the conditions under which the breaking of the frame of the budget is possible? How do we create and recreate those conditions, opening the possibility of landing a radically different way of thinking about worth and resources so that we can force viable livelihoods into the conceptualization of economies? And I'll end now. The difficulty of finding arguments that seem perfectly obvious once you've found them is part of our contemporary political conundrum. <laughs> Wendy Brown's cogent point about the rendering of everything in terms of market logic is pertinent, not only to the working of capital, but also in terms of our capacity to resist it. It becomes more and more capturing, more and more captivating. We have to be quick to figure out what constitutes an anti-capitalist language and politics for this predicament. We have to get really clear on what our premises are. How do we reframe the problem of debt, of risk, using all of its hidden curriculum? How do we insist on negotiations in which the full weight of worth and value that is entailed in the histories of debt, productive of bad relationships, racisms, hidden violences, is actually felt by those at the table? How do these make it into the frame of scarcity and austerity that debt as a logic reproduces? Our work, it seems to me, is to find these arguments and organize with them at each of our institutions, for sure, for this is where we win our victories, but also across them, recognizing the potential for national and regional work and always towards a renewed internationalism. Thank you. Move the slide. There we go. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. Thanks to my co-panelists for those amazing presentations. Um, a lot, uh, I'm gonna speed through, through some of the slides because a lot has been said about the Debt Collective. And, um, but I, I do wanna highlight the work of a few other Debt Collective co-organizers just because in addition to the amazing strikers, um, I just wanna say thank you to Laura Hanna to Ann Larson and to Luke Heron over there for being part of an undertaking that has been really hard at times. It's been really hard work. Um, and there's been a lot of adventure and a lot of uncertainty because you definitely don't start something like this knowing that you're gonna win anything. Um, it's, it's really amazing to be here talking about these ideas and, and wrestling with them on a more profound level. We're, we're, you know, we're so often making the case, debt, you know, we, debt cancellation is a legitimate demand, right? Free public college is a legitimate demand. And I love this conversation we're having about what do we mean by college? What do we mean by education? This is something I'm very ambivalent about. I'm not an academic. That's not the path that I've chosen. Um, I haven't gone to school very much in my life. And you know, part of why I have committed to the Debt Collective and to this organizing is because this is a space to really think. This is actually the space in my life where I am the most intellectually engaged. Movement organizing, activism, is knowledge production. It is thinking. It is, you know, you, it, there is not theory in practice. Out of practice, you use your mind and you see what the real problems are. Um, probably because you're organizing because you're experiencing them personally, so you're in a position to know what the problems are and to know, have a, a sort of sense of what the best solutions may be. But it is such an engaging, creative, intellectual pursuit. So I just wanna uh, put that out there, that you know, maybe this is the mo model for the college we want to see. So I'm gonna speed through some of them. Um, you know, I just wanna begin by saying we are launching, and to reiterate that we're launching a new strike today. That, um, and this is a debt strike that is for everybody 
who has college debt, and there's ways to be in solidarity with this, even if you are not someone who has student debt. If you are in high school and you're fearful of a debt-laden future, if you are a professor who can't stand that you know, the classroom is a place of future um, debt payments, if you are a parent who's worried, right, there's many ways to plug into this. Um, and to be on strike just means that you are not making payments. So that might be that you're, you're um, making income-based repayments that are zero dollars. It might mean that you've already defaulted. A million people default every year. So um, you might not be ready to strike, but you might be interested in possibly joining that campaign. So this is also a space you can be in. Uh, so you know, I want I want people to just remember that that this movement is expanding. And I'm so happy when you said you would join us. That was a highlight. Um, it began you know, in a way. It's like why why am I part of this movement? I defaulted on my student loans actually in 2008, and it was the same year my parents' mortgage went underwater. It was the mortgage crisis, and so you know this this profound thing happens where I get a call. I'm on the port. Uh, I'm on you know I'm outside my house. Get a call, and it's my loan servicer, and they're like, "You've defaulted, so now you owe 19% more." In other words, overnight you owe it an additional eleven thousand dollars, and the illogic of that, right? The fact that I couldn't pay, so I just owed more made me so enraged that I was like, I will destroy you. <laughs> but I couldn't do it alone. I had to have, I had to find my crazy comrades at Occupy Wall Street, so thank God. Um, so just quickly, these are the outcomes of the student debt strike that um, we heard about earlier. And I just want to go over them. It was the first US, uh, the first debt strike in US history led by working class students. It normalized the idea, this is really important, that actually this is a realistic demand. People got debt cancellation. It can happen. This is not something high in the sky. So over a billion dollars has been erased through various channels. Um, and it also just showed that, yeah, it needs organizing. This is not something that's going to come from above. But the debt collective is actually not just about student debt. Student debt is one area. Um, we're not just an organization focused on the question of higher education. This is something that we had capacity and you know, passion to engage in, but it's not the scope of the organization by any means. For me, and I think for many of us, this organization comes from an analysis of our economy, right? Well, if you're an you know, uh, intellectual, right, you read about neoliberalism and financialization and the way our economy has changed. And so you know, how do we... We want to turn that reflection into strategies. Well, what do you do in an age of financialization? How do you organize against that? So one thing we came to is that the age of finance is experienced as an age of debt. That's how most of us live neoliberal economic relations. Um, this is a drawing from one of our, uh, an event we had in 2012 before we were even the debt collective. It's the debts of J.P. Morgan, just trying to illustrate the way that finance has its tentacles in all of these aspects of our life. Debt is wrapped around every asset. Um, mass indebtedness, I don't want to bore us with statistics, but there's a lot of debt. Things just, you can't even keep these statistics up to date. I mean, the slide has to be updated. It was like 900 billion last time in credit card debt. No, it's a trillion. Student debt is now 1.7 trillion. I mean, it's wild. Some people in this room organized one T day, the day Andrew Ross was part of this, the day that student debt crossed $1 trillion. That was in 2012. Now it's 1.7 trillion. Uh, huge numbers of people have debts in collections. The average American dies with $61,000 of debt. And of course, people are jailed as a result of their debts. Uh, we were just on the phone with a woman the other day who couldn't pay her medical bills uh, to the John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, and they put her in jail because she couldn't pay her fucking medical bill. And then what does that do? It puts you at risk of losing your house, right? Your livelihood, your, um, everything spirals from there. And of course, uh, debt is not a tie that binds everybody equally. We find the idea of predatory inclusion very, very useful, right? So, you know, when we say, oh, that we've democratized access to credit, well, what does that mean? It means that some people are going to be more intensely exploited than others. We saw this, of course, in the mortgage crisis when um, black families saw their wealth decimated in much more dramatic terms than their white uh, counterparts. We see this in student debt. Black women uh, bear the burden, a massively disproportionate burden of student loans. So this is all over the place. So um, 
And on the age of finance side, to go back to that, I mean, one thing we are thinking about this, the debt collective as a debtor's union, right? Unions have, as, as neoliberalism has taken hold, unions have weakened. And there's all sorts of legal reasons, all sorts of um, political reasons for this. Unions are also partly to blame. But we see the idea of the debt collective as a sort of countervailing force, right? It's another way to organize people to have economic power. Um, and it has some advantages over the labor model because, you know, you can organize with people who you don't work with. You can organize, you might be a city dweller. You can organize with someone who lives in the countryside. You might be, you know, uh, just starting out in life. You can organize with someone who's much older than you. That brings together a very interesting coalition that crosses all sorts of divides. You know, geography is a really interest, interesting one to cross right now because that is um, it's a really challenging one. Of course, that also makes organizing around debt difficult because you have to figure out how to find each other. But in that challenge is a real opportunity. So we are in the red, but we're also in the dark. And when I wrote this slide, I was thinking about the fact that we often don't know who we owe money to. This is one of the first epiphanies we had as the debt collective. It's like, who's calling you on the phone and harassing you to collect your debt? It's not the person you borrowed money from. It's not like the guy who picked you up in the ambulance, right? Like that guy, you'd be like, okay, I owe you 100 bucks. Like you picked me up in the ambulance. But no, it's somebody who's bought the hospital debt for pennies on a dollar, and is now trying to make a profit on that. Um, you know, the thing is that these are these are these entities that people they don't e we don't even understand. I mean, this is I we're we're all in this. So we're we're in the dark in the sense that we don't know who is trying to collect from us. We don't know um, exactly where the payments are going. But we're also in the dark in a way that Hannah brilliantly pointed out in a piece today that came out in the New Republic, where in the sense that, and this relates to the strike today, we're in the dark as debtors. There's 45 million student debtors, but we don't know each other, right? And when I said a million people default every year, everybody is that alone, isolated, ashamed, right? People don't see one, eno see one another. So I think that's the kind of thing we're trying to transform is we, you know, before we can strike in huge numbers, we first have to be able to recognize each other as being in the same situation. So part of why debt is so difficult is that it's something that happens invisibly unless we come forward and start reaching out for each other. Okay, so we are in debt because of the lack of public services. I think a lot of people here would agree with that, right? Medical debt doesn't e exist in a country with universal health care. In the United States, it's the leading cause of bankruptcy. We can turn debt into leverage. I hope we've proven that already. Um, you know, $1.7 trillion of student debt is $1.7 trillion of leverage if we come together and try to wield it. So th this was said earlier, but it's an, uh, a saying that we like to invoke. If you owe the bank $100,000, the bank owns you. If you owe the bank $100 million, you own the bank. So together, we own the bank. Let's collectivize it. Again, debt makes us isolated and alone. This was an early meme for us that I think just demonstrates this, this isolation that we're trying to overcome. So I just a lot of these points have been made. I just put this together really quickly last night. But why debt, right? We're not like debt fixated. We're not obsessed with debt for its own sake. Debt is actually, like I even hate the word. I'm so tired of saying it. But debt is important. Why? Because it's a form of domination, right? This has come up. It's a form of control. If you are, you are disciplined by the fact that you are in a contract that you can't get out of. It's ideological. When you're indebted, it makes you see the world through debt goggles. And suddenly you're like, oh, I went into debt. I owe $60,000 for my education. I need to get a return on investment, right? So it changes. It, that's why it's part of its power. Debt is anti-democratic. I mean, there's a fascinating history of debtors' revolts. You go all the way back to ancient Greece, to Solon, right? The, the riot, there was, you know, 2,500 years ago, people were rioting because they were indebted and demanding to be freed from those obligations. This happened also in ancient Rome. Um, look at structural adjustment programs and the way that after uh, decolonization, then neocolonial economic relations uh, forced debt contracts onto um, <laughs> onto other countries. Look at the history of Haiti um, and who, uh, 
who was able to have their debts written off and who was forced to keep paying them. So debt recurs in the history of democracy over and over in really fascinating ways. Um, your comments too reminded me of Thomas Jefferson. So the founding of this country, um, debt was a really lively issue. Um, James Madison referred to debt abolition as a wicked project, right? I mean, they were very afraid of, of debtors revolting. Uh, and Jefferson is often sort of played as the counterpart, and he, you know, sort of, he made some recommendations like, oh, you know, laws should expire after 19 years, and so should debts. But then he also wrote all these letters um, basically saying, okay, this is how we will get our hands on indigenous lands when we can't um, get them to sell them. What we'll do is we'll drive them into debt. So he understood that debt could be used as a weapon of dispossession. Um, and so it was, you know, yes, let's have these like reasonable short-term contracts for us while engaging in, um, engaging in really destructive debt contracts for others. Um, debt also, <laughs> you know, it, I don't know how quite to phrase this, but there's an element to the temporal element of debt I think is really important. And um, Dylan was talking about the future a lot. Debt binds us, the contract controls the future. And so we're stuck in these contracts that demand that we pay more tomorrow than we have today. That's what interest is, right? That's what compounding interest is. Um, and so in, this is why the phrase we always say, I went into education, I had to mortgage my future. I remember someone getting their debt canceled. I'm not sure, maybe it was someone in this room saying, I, we, are, we asked you how you felt when your debt was canceled, and someone said, I feel like I got my future back. Um, and that has implications. I think this, this temporal element and the fact that uh, debt demands that we pay more tomorrow than we have today, has, it obviously has huge ecological implications, right? Because it locks us into an economic system that is based on endless growth. Okay, so total change here. When I think of California protesters, why, why did we want to launch this national campaign in California? When I think of California protesters, I think of Berkeley in the 60s. I think of these guys, or I did actually. This is what I thought 10 years ago. I thought of these guys singing folk songs. But we should be thinking about these guys. And Wendy Brown already mentioned them. They are the Prop 13 tax revolters. Um, and, you know, when I started reading about these folks, I was like, I felt so cheated. Why was I, like, inculcated in this idea that activism and political organizing looked a certain way? It actually looks like these very uncool people <laughs> who were very effective. And so my motto after learning about the tax revolt movement is like, I want to be part of the most uncool and effective movement that has ever existed. Um... And this guy was an important part of it. This is, this is Howard Jarvis. And he modeled his movement for, basically, he was this anti-tax anti right-winger. And his whole idea was to um, harness people's genuine need for property tax relief to the cause of shrinking the state, right? And he modeled himself on the uh, everyman persona, the, the, net, the guy in network. Um, and what Prop 13 managed to do was decimate state taxes. I know that we've been talking about the difference between like whether tax revenue is significant. Obviously, it is at the state level. Completely decimated state taxes, which in turn um, created conditions for austerity and uh, the lack of funding for public education. There's also a huge racial dimension to this tax revolt movement. It was a movement, this is important though, I think it was a movement that wasn't initially right wing at the beginning. People needed tax relief and it could have gone either way. The solution offered to them was one that harnessed their grievances to this very right wing, um, this very right wing framework, right? So there was potential there for it to go in another direction. Somebody could have said, well, why don't we have social housing? Like, why should your house be a speculative asset? But instead it was like, no, taxes are bad. Um, and, and so a left-wing alternative wasn't there and provided. Um, but there was also uh, definitely racial antipathy. And, and uh, as Melinda Cooper and others have pointed out, like the tax revolters were obsessed with welfare, which is like a federal program. It has nothing to do with state taxes. Um, Reagan rode this movement to the White House. Um, and uh, and was was able to 
um, really harness it. So the debt collective, part of our logic is the rich say tax strike, the poor say debt strike. Um, quick reiteration. So I think that that's, you know, neoliberalism, the tax revolt is like one way that it was, it becomes like a credible demand. People think in terms of, people think in terms of taxes, um, and, and taxes were not sort of like part of the mainstream American political agenda actually in the way that we take for granted now. And so what part of why we want to launch in California is to give a retort. California is a state where things spread, things kick off and become national. And, um, and part of our framework is basically saying we are indebted as individuals because we are denied the means to live, right? It's not that we're living beyond our means. We are being denied the means to live. And we have to use whatever economic power we can to leverage for a different economic arrangement. Now, quickly, because I'm running out of time, they will laugh at us again. They laughed at us before. The demand for student debt cancellation and free college was raised at Occupy Wall Street um, 2011. Hannah mentioned this. And the media was absolutely just, I mean, we were just ridiculed. For example, most, this one, this is a quote from um, All Things Considered. Most experts believe there's little chance the government would ever forgive student loans. Um, one expert is under, it says here, one expert laughed when I brought about, sorry, laughed when I brought up the proposal. So thanks to these guys, it was shown that it was actually um, possible. This is what it's like to get the notice that your debt is being discharged. Betsy DeVos has had to continue issuing discharges, so I just wanted to show this. She signs them with extreme displeasure. Yeah. 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 Take a, take, take a snap. So we have made Betsy unhappy, which gives us more reason to live. Um, Elizabeth, you want it again? Um, Elizabeth Warren, you know, it's, it's well documented that Elizabeth Warren's plan was inspired by the success of the Corinthian debt strike. Um, she has committed to using an authority that Luke over here has been working on and developed. So please join this demand. Um, but I just want to say we also have a suite of debt dispute tools that sh are part of a, the step in a broader direction. So, again, we are not a student um, student debt focused organization. We have a suite of tools where you can dispute any debt and collections. Um, this is an example of somebody getting a utility bill wiped out. But part of the process is challenging the individualism of these. Uh, you know, normally we have to dispute alone, right? So this puts you into a political community with people. You also might get some money back in your pocket, which is great. But the question here is really, what else can we do together with this model? So one, one counterfactual we like is, you know, what if mortgage holders had been organized in 2008? What would have gone differently, right? Another crash is going to come. How can we be prepared for it? So just inspired by the utility bill, what if there was a utility strike for public utilities? We're in California where that matters a lot, right? How do we engage in debt resistance to create a different um, relationship to extraction and the climate? Um, also, how can we have strikes across borders? I mean, one thing we were thinking about uh, in the lead up to not in the lead up to, but think, for example, about what happened in Greece and the sovereign debt crisis there. Goldman Sachs played a big role, right, in, with this um, interest rate swap. I mean, we have so many common enemies. Global finance is global. So how can we collaborate on other campaigns? And then this it was already said brilliantly by Andrew, but our debts are illegitimate. And we're defaulting on our true debts. We, again, are not debt obsessed where we want to eliminate all debts. We want to be able to pay the real debts, right? Pay reparations. Um, figure out how we pay the debts for the destruction and dispossession of indigenous ways of life and the theft of land. These are real debts that we're defaulting on because we're stuck making payments to the 1%. And so we want to challenge the phony morality around debt and ask, yeah, who owes what to whom? What debts are legitimate? What dance, debts are What debts are moral? What debts are immoral? So thank you.
thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, these really wonderful presentations. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, it's my extreme pleasure to, uh, <laughs> to give you some softball questions. Um, I, want, I want us to focus on the nuts and bolts of organizing, um, which you've all been doing, and um, the difficulties and the joys of organizing. <clears throat> and uh, none of the groups we've been talking about are NGOs or nonprofits with resources. In fact, probably no resources at all. And so one of the questions is about the advantages and the disadvantages of operating without resources. And maybe that's another version of this resource question we've been batting around today um, in various sessions. Um, and so and the other question has to do with obstacles, like large obstacles that are in your path. Stephanie Kelton this morning gave us a, a very good example, this, this, uh, this question. How will you pay for it? It's a question that's designed to derail and sabotage and pull the rug out from under you. And she gave us a very eloquent answer or a way to answer that question. Can you think of um, equivalents in, uh, for the groups that you've been involved in and maybe give us a sense of, uh, of how you've overcome them in, in a similar way or are seeking to overcome them? We can answer in any order, <coughs> whoever wants to jump in. Are you, are you the class? First. Yeah. yeah, I can start out with the first question. Can you hear me okay? Um, so I'll just, just the first question about, um, yeah, being uh, not financially resourced. Uh, you know, uh, the Red Nation is, um, we like to say, not a non-profit, but an anti-profit organization. <laughs> um, we don't accept, yeah, so we don't accept, like, grant funding and that kind of thing. Um, we are the resource in other ways, right, which we've talked about. One, monetarily, as a dues-paying organization. So uh, members of the organization pay dues that allow us to rent spaces and put on events and print stuff. Um, that's difficult that we all live isolated lives, right? One of, the, one of the challenges that we've often faced is, you know, some of our members might not be having a job at the moment or, like, are struggling to pay rent, right? And how do we support each other um, in that, in, in, a, in an economy that is, is highly isolating, right? Like I have my debts to pay that affects the way that I can contribute to my organization, both monetarily, but also financially, or like time-wise, right? Like I work two jobs in Oakland and I'm paying rent in Oakland, so how am I gonna, you know, give my time to the organization? So that's one, but I think also um, that we are resourced in other ways, right? That uh, one of the things that has amazed me recently is um, the people who have supported the Red Nation in uh, both childcare and food providing, right? So in, in Albuquerque, there's an organization called FAM, uh, uh, Family Access to Movements, which I want to give a huge shout out. They're amazing. They provide free health care to organizing spaces, radical organizing spaces. Um, and they're, they're also radical in the sense that they um, are based in um, like children's liberation rather than just, you know, removing kids from organizing spaces, but providing them a way to access them. That's, that's been one, and that's something that we don't pay for, they don't charge us for. Um, and also uh, community members, especially family members within the Red Nation who have come and fed, you know, made, made food for people. We do community feeds now. Um, and, and, you know, relatives come and help cook, and, and that's one way that we're resourced. Um, and then also just people that, that support our work uh, financially as well, right? We, we do receive a lot of donations um, from people who see what we're doing and, and say, I want to I wanna support it in some way um, for whatever reason. Yeah, um, I think with Fees Must Fall in particular, one of the, or the student movement in particular, one of the things that, um, one of the resources that people could use was the university itself. So the mechanism of Occupy was central to what, not only to the consciousness work inside of the movement, uh, but also the kind of creation of a, some people call it assembly, I call it in my work, the plenary space or the democratic space where people were able to come together. I think um, we failed um, to a degree to hold the democratic space from political parties. So I would say one of the obstacles were that um, political parties saw the power and were afraid of what was happening. And so they funded not only Asian provocateurs, but they funded conferences and wanted to fund regional and national meetings. So I would say one of the things is to keep things, to to fight against the national. That was one of the first things we tried to do, to resist 
being pulled into a national organization that immediately then hierarchizes and you have representatives. So I don't know if it worked, but um, so I would say the kind of national, the idea of going quickly to representative democracy uh, that takes people away from the physical space of where organization is happening, that's, that's one thing. In terms of actual resources, as, you, as those who have been in Occupy understand, uh, we're all differently resourced, but the minute you throw your lot in with everyone else and you're literally trying to stay in the same space, the resources that you do have access to begin to circulate in different ways. Um, and so occup occupying the university meant that graduates, people from outside came and donated from toilet paper to food to a whole range of things. So I think the, the figuring out how to hold open the space of Occupy, the, the, the actual space where people can interact and have real conversation with each other was, was important. And one of the things that I would call an obstacle was that we didn't know how to respond. There was such political vibrancy and creativity in that space. We didn't know how to respond when the university came with police and literally tear gas people out of that space. So at each university, there's a communal space where historically political activism has taken place. Mm -hmm. And the university management with, th uh, with excuses about occupational health and safety, all kinds of things forced people out of the space. And I think one of the biggest mistakes we made was not to respond and recognize that that was the only thing they could do. So we needed to figure out how to not keep fighting to get, and at my university at WITS, we kept having these battles trying to get back into the place that held the political power and memory. And for many people, like memory of, of the first kind of collective action so people were, were almost psychically um, drawn to that space in a way that, that made it easy for management and even the state to break. Mm. So resources in each other, I think, um, was most, most important and, and definitely making sure that we kept funders at bay because, as we know, it was mentioned earlier, on NGO work, the minute you bring the money in, things get shit. <laughs> they do. And so this, this question of not only debt, but like Hani and Moten talking about indebtedness to each other. So it's not only the financial debt, but there is something that money and people who understand economics and money do that's just toxic. You need to <laughs> stay away from that shit. I'm curious, actually, how some of my fellows would answer this question. On the resource front, I mean, you know, our goal is also to be dues to be dues funded and to be accountable to members. I really think that's the only way for an organization that has the, a mission to change the world. You know, you're not going to be funded by capitalists to fight capitalism. That is not going to happen. Um, but it is a tough, you know, this is why they're going against dues uh, for labor unions with decisions like the Janus decision, right? I mean, they know that that's a powerful place, um, a place to be, to be accountable to the people in the organization. So that is the goal. Um, you know, I think of when we were just starting out, thinking about obstacles and especially PAYGO, I, you know, we encountered, we encountered so much moral hazard stuff, right? Like, oh, well, didn't everyone put a flat screen TV on the credit card, and we'd have to go, well, actually, statistics show that people usually put their necessities on their credit cards. <laughs> um, but we're kind of, we're past that. We are in this opening we've been talking about, right, where I forgot to say, you know, Occupy, one thing we did as the Rolling Jubilee, which is, we've had many names. We're like a little bit like a Monty Python sketch. So we were the Rolling Jubilee and Strike Debt, now we're Debt Collective. You don't know what will be next. But we... <laughs> erased tens and tens of millions of dollars of medical debt. And now what has Bernie Sanders said? He's going to basically scale up the rolling jubilee and buy and settle all medical debt. To which we were like, don't do it that way, you're the state. Actually, be, be you know, you have so much more power than the activists. So there's this strange moment where um, things we were arguing for are conceptually out there. So I, th I think the challenge now is actually one that, um, the, the union organizer and writer Jane McAlevey calls raising expectations, right? Right now, we're actually at a point where the people who aren't with us, we ha they might like the idea of debt abolition and universal health care and a Green New Deal, but they don't believe it's possible because that's not what they've seen from the state and that's not what they've seen from elected officials, that's not what they've seen from the power structure. And so that is our challenge, is like how do you, how do you organize um, it's not just about these slogans. It's about helping people see they might be possible. And that's why I keep promoting what we've accomplished, uh, sorry, accomplished with this debt strike. 
because what it, it's this little, it's one, it's not little, but it's one concrete example that can help raise expectations. You know, Pam got a notice that two hundred thousand dollars of debt is not going to be collected from her, and God knows how much it would have grown with interest, right? This is this shows it can be done. That's why we keep saying education was basically free in the '90s. Student debt was so trivial it wasn't even measured in the '90s, right? Like. We have this disjunction between these policies that are being discussed and people's sense that nothing will change. So it's in that gap. It, we have to raise expectations. Yeah. Yes. The second question, sorry, how, how, will we, yeah. how will we pay? I think uh, as someone who was a student in 2015 and now a faculty member in 20, what are we, 2020? Um, <laughs> I think... We also need to figure out um, how to be, or, or I at least sit with this, to be unbelievably embarrassed by what some of us earn in relation to what other people do. So in, in a sense, how to repay would be to, again, break out of this individual silo of, I'm not going to talk about what I earn. I mean, even in our universities, your payslip is personal information. We actually, and it goes back to this idea of what is the democratic space? How do we organize such that when in the terrible existing system some of us get remunerated more than others, that we don't philanthropically um, feel good about ourselves by giving X amount to X and Y, but we actually commit to being honest about uh, how... When you do that collectively with people and you really hear what workers are living on, it's absolutely embarrassing. Uh, that some of us have permanent jobs, et cetera. So how to pay back for me is, is a kind of entailment with other people in the organizing space that includes one's what is considered to be private life, private budget, mm -hmm. into, um, into a more collective conversation, not as philanthropy. Uh, are we out of time? I get the impression we are. Two more minutes? Um, Anyone want to add to any of that um, on the panel? We take it. Yeah, you do. I have one other thing to say. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, go for it. Go ahead. A major <laughs> obstacle, sorry, a major obstacle in our movement as well was centering decolonization differently were black, young, queer, radical feminists who were saying that we have to take intersectionality more seriously. And when you put that with a decolonial argument, there's a kind of squaring off that doesn't work because there are a lot of patriarchs. I mean, we had real homophobic and um, sexist attacks against some of the queer, and this is not new Black Lives Matter. I mean, this is happening. So a major obstacle is also trying to figure out how to think more complexly about these kinds of oppression. And the class question is really important because it does have material impact, but all the other things are there as well. So if we can't do that, if we can't talk about racism, sex, and homophobia more, more honestly, if it's not part of our agenda, then we just... So, I, I mean, that was a huge... Opt it broke apart uh, what was possible uh, because some of the leaders were just not prepared to look at themselves and say, well, yes, there's no white people in the room, but I'm not prepared to, to talk about my kind of patriarchy, and that's, that's not going to get us far. Okay, so we're gonna uh, take a break for 15 minutes, right? And no? no? Nope. 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 Oh. <laughs> First of all, I just wanna thank this incredible panel so much, and Andrew as well. So for all the right reasons, the depth of knowledge that comes from social movement activism, we're running a little bit over time. So we're actually going to take a break until 3.35. So I think by that clock, it's about 10 minutes from now. The last I looked at my phone, I think it might be a little bit less than that. 3.35. And the timing is fairly important. It's a sharp timeline because of the unique situation that our second keynote, Dr. Barbara Ransby, is in. So please, if you can respect that time and be back in your seats by 3.34, that would be fabulous. Thank you so much.
Okay. Well, first of all, now I'm talking to you, Barbara. Thank you so much okay. for doing this. This is like extraordinary. Um, <laughs> that you are in an airport giving a keynote, rushing to another terminal to try to get here. But you know I know you, and I know that's what you do. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I'm, I'm tasked with, with introducing you, and I spent the last um, 45 minutes cutting down my 20 minutes to two or three oh, or four. Yeah. So I'm going to jump right in, and I'm speaking to the audience. So um, most of us know Barbara Ransby as distinguished professor in the departments of African American Studies, Gender and Women's Studies, and History at the University of Illinois Chicago Circle. Some of you may know her as editor-in-chief of Souls. Um, some of you may know her as the former president of the National Women's S Studies Association. Many of us know her as the author of the prize-winning books, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision, uh, Eslanda, The Large and Un Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson, and more recently, Making All Black Lives Matter, Reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century. A few of you may know that she's currently working on a biography of the legendary artist Elizabeth Catlett. To put it plainly, Barbara Ransby is our leading historian of black radical social movements, and that's my opinion, and, and I know I'm right. Um, <laughs> so I've, now, I've known Barbara for 20 years, a third of my life, more than a third, slightly more. Um, I know her as a dear friend, a comrade, an authentic revolutionary, and the model, my model, of engaged public scholarship and activism. We first met at the University of Michigan when she was a graduate student, just to give you a sense of, of who she is, in the period between working on her dissertation and turning it into a book, uh, Barbara helped, and this is just a small list, lead the United Coalition Against Racism at the University of Michigan, uh, which co-founded co the Ella Baker Nelson Mandela Center for Anti-Racist Education, co-founded African American Women in Defense of Ourselves in 1991 in response to the trials of Anita Hill, uh, you know, was one of the founders of Agenda 2000 in response to the gender exclusion and conservatism of the Million Man March, the Black Radical Congress, for which she was a principal founder, uh, active in the Chicago Committee in Solidarity with uh, Southern Africa, to name just a few things. And she didn't stop uh, to do uh, justice to all of her organizing work requires a book basically as long as her book on Ella Baker. Um, she is the founding member of Scholars for Social Justice and the multiracial coalition known as the Rising Majority. Uh, she's worked closely with movements for black, black lives. Um, she wasn't just a bystander writing. She was an active uh, participant and leader. Uh, she played a critical role in founding groups such as Ella's Daughter and supporting organizations, uh, Ella's Daughters, supporting organizations like Black Youth Project 100, Recharge Genocide, Asada's Daughters. And while many of us were sleeping, myself included, she was busy organizing Black Scholars for Bernie. So pay attention. Um, in short, this work that Barbara Ransby has been doing uh, is really her race on Detra. Um, struggle has driven her scholarship and her teaching, and this is why she received the 2018 Angela Y. Davis Prize for the, um, from the American Studies Association for Scholarship in the Public Good. So for her, and this is why it's so relevant to this conference, breaking down the walls dividing the academy from aggrieved communities, communities that have often been the target of university exploitation and dispossession, has been a priority for her. As a director of the Social Justice Initiative, she links the academy to community organizers doing social justice work. And this is why she is the ideal person to close out the spectacular day of discussion, the spectacular conference, and speak to us about race, capitalism, in the neoliberal university, reimagining justice out of crisis. So without further ado, I introduce you to Dr. Barbara Ransby. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. 
Well, um, I'm delivering this, these remarks under less than optimal conditions. Um, I apologize. I really um, was so excited to, to get this invitation and uh, to find out about, you know, more about the work that's going on at UCLA. Of course, I know, you know, Robin Kelly's work, and he's so modest, you know, he always gives others these knowing introductions, but, you know, he continues to be a source of um, inspiration and, and, and awe for many of us you know, in um, juggling so many roles and maintaining a really, you know, uncompromised principal position uh, and, and doing some pretty amazing scholarship. So, so I was really honored to be um, invited to offer some remarks uh, tonight. Um, I would really have loved to have been there with you, and I just want to say um, something about why I'm not there. Um, today we were, we meaning the rising majority, were involved in a pretty amazing event uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the four, uh, four of the bravest, oldest, um, most progressive members of, of the U.S. House of Representatives, um, Ayanna Presley, Ilhan Omar, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Rashida Tlaib. Um, very, it, it, it's very rare that they're all together, but we managed to have them together um, in a very uh, powerful event, an overflow crowd at uh, Howard University Law School, uh, where we talked about the relationship between electoral politics and uh, grassroots movement organizing. And I was, you know, really torn about being, you know, in LA versus being in DC. And I'm, this is my my compromise effort to be in both places. So I apologize to you for not being in the room with you and, and, and you know, being able to interact with you in a much more organic way. Um, so to begin, I mean, when I uh, really began to focus on student debt, this astronomical figure that, of course, we all know, you know $1.6 trillion uh, in student debt, most of us can barely wrap our minds around that figure. The scale, the scope, the the, the utter obscenity of it. Um, but what it means is that um, people, you know, people I know, many of my students, uh, many people you all know, maybe some of you, you know, spend the majority of their adult lives paying banks and their surrogates for the years spent obtaining the skills and knowledge sets uh, necessary to function in a professional, as a professional worker. Um, and as a citizen in this society, um, half of their adult lives spent paying for the the privilege, which which all of us I'm sure feel should be a right um, to to an education. And in worst case scenarios, of course, students uh, going in debt and never even receiving the degree uh, at all, um, or or receiving a worse worthless one. You know, so that's one factor. That's one fact. Uh, you know, that sort of um, I think is informing uh, uh, some of the discussions, you know, with you today and, and another event tomorrow that's related to this around, you know, sponsored by the Debt Collective. Um, but I am so glad that organizations like the Debt Collective and other student organizers around the country are pushing back um, and pushing back hard uh, against against the student debt. Um, the good news is we have a growing movement and we have to support it. Uh, the challenge is that we have an even bigger set of problems, and we have to confront them, too. Those problems center around the notion of racial capitalism and its current crisis, and the complicity of the neoliberal university in the project of racial capitalism. The three things I want to offer in my uh, remarks this afternoon um, one is that to, to really underscore this point that uh, we cannot really talk about student debt or university politics in a historical or political vacuum. And I know, you know, that goes without saying it for, for most of you, but we also cannot talk about them as colorblind phenomena. You know, one of the struggles right now, one of the discussions we were discussing, uh, we, were, we were exploring in the, the conversations uh, today and yesterday here in D.C., is the ways in which the, uh, some sectors of the left, and I include, you know, left intellectuals, have, um, you know, kind of catapulted into this never-never land of post-racialism. I mean, you, you, you know, 
it almost is beyond um, belief, given the rise of white nationalism, given the unapologetically you know, racist character of the current occupant uh, of the White House. But embedded in the way we talk about economic issues, embedded in the way we talk about class and class struggle, you know, is, is a kind of assumption that we can get around this question of race. Now, a dear friend, Robin Kelly, uh, has, has, you know, discussed this with me many times, and of course he's right, you know, in that the idea of racial capitalism in and of itself is a little bit redundant, uh, that, that the capitalism in the modern world has been uh, a racial project. Uh, our dear, uh, beloved uh, colleague and brother, you know, Cedric Robinson wrote about this you know, a number of years ago in his Black Marxism, um, about the racialization of populations of, of gypsies and Jews and others as a part of the early, you know, early formulation of capitalism. But I feel it's important to um, underscore, to use that label racial capitalism, because there's so many conversations in which the underlying assumption excludes the reality of white supremacy, even as a historical, as we might think that is. So that's one thing I want to talk about. So the other thing I want to talk about is a, is a big picture of racial capitalism in the 21st century and the ways in which the university has both collaborated with and given cover uh, from the very start. And thirdly, what can we do? What are organizers doing? Um, and, and what is the role of those of us, uh, you know, working, living uh, inside uh, the academy? So for, first, let me just say a little bit more about this idea of racial capitalism. Um, capitalism in the modern era is, is, as I said, you know, sort of by definition, a racial project. From the 16th century on, racism racialization of dispossessed populations and white supremacy have had an intimate and co-constitutive relationship. Intimate and co-constitutive relationship. You know, Rob, you know, I could be quoting uh, Robin and a number of other people, Michael Dawson and others, uh, in saying this. Bluntly put, enslaved black bodies were the capital on which capitalism was built compounded by wage theft and land theft and predatory lending and discriminatory federal and state policies that translated into millions and billions of excess profits. Racism and white supremacy in one form or another uh, were the ideological fuel that drove early capitalist accumulation and continues to this day. Without the consistent and ruthless campaign and crusade to dehumanize and destroy indigenous people um, in what would become the Americas as a deliberate strategy of dispossession. Um, without the gut-wrenching narrative that our indigenous brothers and sisters were uncivilized, unworthy, and outside the bounds of the emerging post-feudalist democracies, it would have been difficult to engage in the massive land grab that marked the founding of this country. So race and racism and white supremacy narratives were there from the beginning. Without a narrative of the subhumanness of African peoples, the outright theft of their labor would have been harder to justify, if not impossible. And of course, uh, long after slavery ended and settler colonialism, uh, was well entrenched, and of course, the, the, the global project and empire building, which was itself profoundly racist. Uh, long after that, white supremacy continued as an enabler for capitalist exploitation and theft. So, so I think that's the frame in which we have to look at the, the current crisis of capitalism. And I say as a disclaimer, I'm not an economist. I spent the uh, last couple of years reading a lot of economists um, trying to sort of figure out this mess that we're in uh, from that perspective. Um, but I think it's important um, in this moment when so many of us feel, you know, profoundly disturbed, concerned, worried, terrified, and, um, you know, sometimes full of rage about um, the current moment that we're in of, of um, 
attacks and assaults on the well-being of our communities, of our loved ones, of our neighbors, um, et cetera. It's easy to feel um, defeated by, for those of us who envision a different kind of world, who situate ourselves on the left, um, who imagine a more egalitarian society at some point in the future. It's easy to feel um, defeated or dispirited, but I, but I don't want to call it a silver lining, but I, but I do think looking beneath the surface of a growing, what I would describe as growing proto-fascist movement, it's also a set of weaknesses, um, and it, it seems to me a real fundamental uh, crisis of capitalism, of racial capitalism uh, at this moment that, um, that may in fact open opportunities. Um, say to many of my friends on the left sometimes, you know, the, the capitalists are more uh, persuaded that they're in a crisis than we are. Uh, in, in, number of months ago, uh, Mark Benioff, the CEO of uh, Salesforce, billionaire uh, guy, you know, wrote in the pages of the New York Times an, an op-ed. He began by talking about how good capitalism had been to him, made, made a great fortune and all this. And the end of the first paragraph ended uh, with, you know, but capitalism as we've known it is dead. You know, Robert Reich, you know, it's a book of a few years ago, you know, Capitalism and How to Save It. Uh, a, a whole number of um, articulations of this crisis of capitalism. There are a number of features of it, um, which I won't uh, won't go into it. I, I From Detroit originally, my father was an auto worker and, and worked in the auto industry. And I look at the factories in which my father and his co-workers uh, labored for so many years. And and on many of those assembly lines now, there's robots doing the jobs that, you know, the workers, many of them black workers, uh, used to do. Uh, and and robots don't buy cars. <laughs> you know, that's, that's sort of one built-in contradiction. Some economists say, well, we overemphasize robotization. But, it, it, you know, it does seem to represent one of the fragile points of the current crisis. Another, of course, is financialization. Um, we have uh, a book a number of years ago, which I'm sure there's there are ample critiques of, but uh, the book Makers and Takers about the evolution of capitalist production from uh, you know exploitation of labor and the produce, production of you know, cars and other kinds of commodities to a kind of financialized capitalist class, which are you know hedge fund guys and bankers and and, and, and others who in all kinds of smoke and mirror schemes, uh, move money around, bet on the future, but aren't actually, um, you know, exploiting labor to produce commodities in in the old old fashioned way, <laughs> if you will, capitalist. So that's another new development, and it seems to me a point of instability, which you know, um, people can say more about. I can say more about. Um, and the third, and, and perhaps most profound, most disturbing. Um, feature of, of capitalist crisis in this moment seems to be uh, climate. Uh, one of the great strengths of this new coalition work that I'm doing around the rising majority is we have a lot of uh, uh, climate justice organizations from 350.org to grassroots global justice to, um, you know, just just a whole range, you know, the, the Sunrise Movement. Uh, a whole range of organizations uh, that are uh, working around climate issues, um, Indigenous Environmental Network. Um, and capitalism has, uh, racial capitalism in particular, because because uh, the Global South has, has been particularly vulnerable in this regard, has had a, uh, a strategy built into the very logic of capitalism of a kind of mindless growth, growth and expansion, extraction, plunder, uh, and, 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 and really, in some ways, exhausting the planet. You, you can't have an, in, you know, it's a uh, version of a quote from Bob McKibben, um, an infinite growth strategy on a finite planet is ultimately not viable. Uh, so that seems to be another feature of of the crisis of capital. So I think all that is the backdrop to the, the current 
situation we're in, and we can talk about how that maps over to certain political strategies. You know, it seems to me in some ways white supremacy and white nationalism are the ideological uh, uh, tools being deployed to kind of save racial capitalism in this moment uh, of crisis. Um, but where does the university fit into all this? I mean, a lot of us have lived much of our professional lives in the university and um, on campuses and doing various kinds of scholarship. And, and the universities often profess to float above uh, the political and economic realities on the ground, and of course they do not, and increasingly uh, they do not. Um, but from the very beginning, uh, universities as institutions have been collaborators in the project of racial capitalism in justifying genocide, in giving scientific veneer to racist taxonomies, in building campuses on stolen land and using slave labor or the profits derived from uh, labor of enslaved people uh, to do so. Of course, all of us you know, know the story that made front page news of uh, 1838, the president of Georgetown University, uh, Father Thomas, um, Mulvady, um found that the university was in a financial bind, and so um, he proceeded to sell 272 human beings uh, for $115,000 in order to bail out the university. Now, that in some ways is one of the more egregious examples, but built into the very you know, economic fabric of early universities, or all the Ivy League universities, you know, had some connection to slavery. Brown, Columbia, Harvard. Um, our colleague Craig Wilder's book, Ebony and Ivy, uh, maps this out in in painstaking uh, detail. So the backdrop of that, the continued ravages of racial capitalism, the complicity of the university in it. Um, led some of us in the organization that Robin referenced, uh, Scholars for Social Justice, uh, over the past two years to really engage in a project of study, discussion, debate, dialogue about the implications of universities' relationship to slavery, universities' relationship to white supremacy, and the notion of reparations. Um, my colleague Adam Getachew, who's a political scientist at the University of Chicago, Davarian Baldwin, who's written on you know, sort of 20th century um, um, crimes of universities vis-a-vis -vis black and brown communities, uh, Tony Bogues at Brown University, and others, you know, have, have and Marsha Chatelaine from Georgetown, um, you know, engaged in this discussion about what does it mean to think about reparations, to think about financial compensation, not simply from the government, which still ought to be on the table as legitimate demand and you know something very important in current conversation about um, grappling with, wrestling with the legacy of slavery and, and the continued reality of racism. But what does it mean to also look at other institutions like universities, uh, to look at university connections to slavery, to look at the university's role in gentrific gentrification and displacement, to look at the university's uh, role in um, justifying wealth inequality and, and, and disparities in access to education through myths surrounding meritocracy. You know, there's ways in which uh, you know, universities as gatekeepers to um, formalize knowledge and gatekeepers to the credentials that often give people access to the goodies of a middle class life, you know, is all shrouded in this myth of meritocracy. You know, if you get a, you know, a 13 versus a 14 on a test, then you're in and the other person's, you know, out. Um, that that is a kind of um, complicity in the project of racial hierarchy. It's complicity. Uh, in the project of, of sort of justifying winners and losers in very artificial means, you know, in our societies. And we need to tease that out. We need to talk about the university in ways in which it, it plays that role. 
Um, and also, you know, increasingly, as you know, my former colleague Rod Ferguson and others have written very eloquently about, you know, increasingly the university has been, you know, very implicated in the in the project of neoliberalism. That is, you know, making itself a slave to the market, um, making itself, um, you know, uh, much more resemble a, a corporation than a institution of higher learning looking at, um, you know, how can the university prepare people for the market? How can the university make money, which it does on so many different levels from, you know, exploiting uh, the labor of untenured and adjunct professors to exploiting the labor of housekeepers and groundkeepers to uh, being, you know, a landlord uh, to, you know, uh, uh, securing patents and rewarding scholars who can, who can, uh, accrue revenue for the university versus people who may, you know, write a beautiful poem or, you know, uh, do some sort of literary scholarship or historical scholarship or whatever. So there's ways in which universities have um, increasingly kind of succumbed to this, you know, market rules mentality of neoliberalism, and uh, we see it in, in, you know, in all kinds of ways, from, you know, how buildings are named to how, you know, um, academics are rewarded. Uh, Etc. So, so these are some of the things that scholars for social justice have been, you know, wrestling with. You know, really looking at this moment, racial capitalism, looking at its fragility, looking at our own, you know, our own backyard. Really looking at um, the institutions that we have lived in, that we uh, work in, and and figuring out ways that we can challenge and push back and expose. Um, and of course, you know, the issue of, of student debt is, is at the center of all that, you know, that um, even the most uh, esteemed universities have skyrocketing tuition, um, you know, really been either bad actors or silent partners in um, the growing debt crisis that many of our students face and, and undergraduates and graduate students um, as well. And so um, Scholars for Social Justice has really made a commitment to not only doing a, you know, intellectual inquiry, a research project on how universities have been complicit in, uh, in racial capitalism, but also um, trying to link and be in service to social movements. Um, when Scholars for Social Justice was founded by myself and Kathy Cohen, we did so in deliberate dialogue and really um, partnership with the Movement for Black Lives, with the Black Youth Project 100, with organizations that were in the street uh, developing campaigns, uh, siding with some of the most oppressed sectors uh, of our community. And that you know, that's really in violation of all of our training as, as, as academics. You know, we're supposed to seclude ourselves away and, you know, figure out the world and then make pronouncements. And so we really uh, rejected that that approach, as many of you do, and as certainly, um, you know, Robin Kelly and, and many of the, the folks involved in the Financial Futures Conference, you know, have been the kind of engaged scholars that we uh, that we also try to be, that we've embraced, and that we've sought out in the Scholars for Social Justice um, uh, project. So, you know, again, that project has attempted to build bridges with movement, has attempted to, you know, um, expose, critique university complicity, and really has um, attempted to be a part of a larger bridge building or what we used to call political quilting project that links our research to direct political campaigns to an understanding of the critical um, historical moment that we're in. And, um, you know, I uh, mentioned earlier this event that I was at here in, in, uh, in D.C., and I was so pleased uh, with the range of forces. I mean, I'm, I'm now sort of segueing into, you know, what can we do about uh, neoliberal university, crisis of racial capitalism in this moment, and I would say the emergence of 
you know, uh, white nationalism and, and, and neo-fascist uh, um, politicians and movements. Um, I was really pleased at the breadth of organizations that were there, uh, at uh, the intergenerational character of the gathering, and the fact that there were, you know, both scholars, researchers, um, policymakers, and you know, people who are, you know, some of the most amazing organizers in the country, you know, talking about what does it mean to have a movement of solidarity? What does it mean to develop campaigns with a sense of urgency? What does it mean to interrogate our own place in various institutions and hierarchies at the same time we uh, we seek to critique and dismantle them? And, and sometimes that's the you know, that's the hardest task of all, uh, to really look at our own positionality and ask, you know, how can I be an outsider within? How can I, um, you know, function in an institution that's that's fundamentally problematic, but also, um, you know, build the kind of movements and campaigns and relationships that, uh, that will undo it, that will build something better. And I guess the final thing I'll say is... Um, you know, around a kind of abolitionist uh, ethic or an abolitionist uh, politic that has informed some of the work that I've tried to do. And I always say I'm an aspiring abolitionist because I think we, we have to do a lot more building before we can successfully uh, abolish. It's sort of easy to say, let's get rid of, but we really have to do a lot of the building work um, at the same time. But I see building, you know, alternative um arenas for knowledge production, um, alternative arenas for um, coalition building, alternative, say, outside of the formal structures of, of the Democratic Party, outside the formal structures of the academy, that it's those spaces where, um, and again, I'm, 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 I think I'm either echoing or borrowing from or just underscoring some of the things that Robin has said and written over the years, um, it, it's creating in those kind of interstitial spaces that we have the greatest um, hope of imagining, you know, futures that, um, you know, that are quite unlike what, what, what we see on the horizon right now, imagining, you know, real alternative uh, social relations, alternative um, institutions, alternative methodologies, um, and a, a more just future. So, um, you know, I, I, am you know speaking to you from I don't I won't even tell you the corner of the airport that I'm in but it's a it's a it's a, it's a very awkward little corner that I'm in um, offering this and I I, uh, uh, I I hope that my remarks are useful it makes sense to you um, and it can be a jumping off point for at least a little bit of conversation and I, and I have to say I, I see this as a beginning I look forward to you know future conversations and discussions when we can Many of us be face to face and uh, you know talk some of these issues through in more uh, detail and and and, and um, pull back some of the layers. So thank you for allowing me. From the I'll just tell you, it's just, I'm in a lactation room and, <laughs> and I have no baby. I'm <laughs> in the in the airport because the the room that I had planned to uh, to procure is was was taken. And one cannot reserve it. And so this was available to me. So, you know, bless the mothers. Um, no one has come with a crying baby yet. So anyway, um, I'll stop my remarks there. And, and listen, thank you for at least uh, listening and, and, and allowing me to share from my uh, little crazy corner of, of the world. And, and I will be on your coast very soon. So hopefully I'll get a chance to meet some of you this weekend. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Barbara, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so do you have a few minutes for some questions and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure because I wanted to miss your flight, and you know, I, I know you, you got us all pumped mm -hmm. up. No pun, no pun intended. But um, okay, so <laughs> okay. All right. So, <laughs> I, I knew I should. I knew I shouldn't have revealed where I am. <laughs> okay, so we have a room full of. Questions. Actually, my, my job was to um, to begin with a question, so you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh-huh. This was such a generative and really, uh, I think, important uh, talk. He linked a lot of stuff and took us over, f- you know, five centuries of history. I, I want to specifically connect uh, a point you made about climate change and land and the university. Uh-huh. And, you know, like yeah. at, at your university and at, here at UCLA and everywhere, all these universities are competing to become green universities, right? Mm-hmm. Eliminating vending machines, uh-huh. adopting solar wind, zero waste, all that stuff. Um, and we're at a university here at UCLA where um, the administration is trying to push toward a green client, you know, um, a, a green university, but at the same time, it's not so robust when it comes to a living wage, robust benefits, um, when it comes to not outsourcing or using temporary precarious labor, and more importantly, when it comes to protecting the health of workers. We had a series of fires here, uh-huh. and staff, certain staff in, in food services and custodial were forced to be here when they told everyone else to evacuate. So I'm wondering, oh, just wow. at your university, at University of Chicago, uh, at, uh, at, at Chica- um, University of Illinois Chicago Circle, um, how are people thinking about the relationship between um, a kind of green politics, uh, politics mm-hmm. pushing back against climate change, and racial capitalism in the workforce? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, no, great question. And you know, one of the uh, folks we were with uh, today was was Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, and uh, we had a lot of questions about the Green New Deal, which which I think you know is is not perfect, but has attempted to address some of the kind of contradictions that you're raising, you know, of um, uh, looking at um, environmental justice questions at at the same time, looking at how uh, economically vulnerable communities are often expendable no matter what, Uh, you know, that even when there is the veneer of, um, you know, green policy, solar energy, all of this, you know, we still have Flint or we still have workers, you know, working in toxic uh, 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 circumstances. And so the, the, the idea of um, an identity of uh, green politics or green policies, you know, juxtaposed against the reality of disregarding the lives of folks um, who are economically vulnerable, and particularly in the global south and black and brown mm-hmm. and university. So my university, of course, you know, has a... Um, you know, a, a, a green agenda and um, has also, you know, not been very um, helpful to the adjacent community of Pilsen, which had fought for many years against um, a toxic coal plant that finally got, got uh, shut down in the community mm. um, a number of years ago, but had sought out university support for that. So the duplicity of committing to certain kinds of professing certain kinds of policies on the one hand but really, um, you know, not prioritizing uh, low income and black and brown communities when they're vulnerable to, um, you know, to the toxicity of of, uh, of climate polluters. Um, on the other, I think this happens over and over again. Mm-hmm. The other thing, you know, related to you know, my own <laughs> university's, uh, um, uh, I don't, I want to say crimes, but you know, the, the ways in which it has. Um, you know, not been particularly sensitive to the surrounding community. Lila Fernandez has, you know, written a book called Brown in the Windy City and talking about the ways in which University of Illinois, which used to be called Circle Campus, was um, put where it was put in order to block the overwhelmingly black working class West Side Hmm. from the... uh, you know, affluent and predominantly white downtown area as it was developing and, and, and growing. So a kind of, you know, intervention in the landscape, if you will, that facilitated, you know, emergence of uh, capitalist uh, enterprises and, and, and corporate headquarters that were built in the downtown area on the lakefront um, and, to, and to create a kind of barrier from the predominantly black west side. So, you know, all kinds of ways university universities intervening you know, around uh, issues of, of, of climate and green policies, but also, um, you know, in terms of, of urban planning. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience. I know you had your hand up already. 
Um, and hopefully you'll hear them. If not, I'll just have to repeat them. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Should I keep talking? Even Hi. If you can't? Oh, awesome. Um, my name is Delaney Vandergrift. Um, I was a student at North Carolina A&T State University, um, the largest public HBCU in the country. Um, and I heard you talking about the ways that the university has been a part of this project. Um, and I think that things get complex, at least for me, when I start thinking about the ways that HBCUs have up upheld um, white supremacy and all of these other horrible systems, um, but then have also served as a space and like an incubator for black radical thought, at least the private ones. Um, so I'm wondering where HBCUs fall in this whole project. <laughs> well, um, I think I heard most of that question. I certainly heard the end of it. Where do HBCUs fall in this whole project? And, and having been incubators for certain kind of radical thinking at the same time, you know, bastions of conservatism. So we, yeah, we just had a, this event we had at, at, at Howard and I won't give you all the, the backstory of it, but it, it, <laughs> it revealed many of the contradictions of HBCUs. Um, one of my dear friends and colleagues is Beverly Guy Sheftal, mm -hmm. who is one of the icons of, of black feminist uh, thought. And she has taught and been a student at Spelman College for you know, 45 years or something like that. And she has taught me more about the kind of contradictions and complexities of, um, uh, of HBCU culture. She fought very hard to get a, a black feminist center mm -hmm. on that campus. Uh, there was a lot of conservative pushback. And of course, you know, HBCUs, as you said, you know, were both an incubator, a place that um, black students and scholars could teach and learn at a time when they were pretty much excluded from uh, all the major centers of higher learning. And so obviously that is of value and important and produced you know, many, many brilliant thinkers and, and many uh, important leaders, including Ella Baker, who's you know, near and dear to my heart. At the same time, and you know, my own research on Ella Baker, for example, in the uh, early 1900s, you know, enormous conservatism, enormous uh, elitism, uh, really preparing um, black elites for you know, a role as um, mediators, uh, controllers uh, of, of a black working class, and, and, and pretty unapologetically, you know, unapologetic about that. And of course, many of the schools were led by, you know, white uh, presidents and, and and founded by white philanthropists. So there was not, you know, in, you know, in addition to, you know, black people, of course, contributed to founding all kinds of schools in the South and small and large. But but there was a project that was about cultivating an educated strata of the black population. So that kind of conservative trend, that conservative impetus has always coexisted with what black people and black students and radicals tried to turn those institutions into with varying degrees of success. Not all of them, I mean, some, you know, openly, you know, kind of, uh, I would say, sort of collaborated with the project, but mm -hmm. um, I think they've always been bastions of contradiction and, um, and they continue to be, you know, to this day. Uh, so, you know, I, I just, caution us to not overly romanticize HBCUs. It's important to, you know, understand that the, the, the anti-black racism toward HBCUs uh, also coexists uh, along with some of the, the ways in which those universities, those institutions have been um, deployed in a kind of, um, you know, quieting and, and pacifying and training process that, um, you know, did not serve the interests of, of black liberation, let's say, to 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 be um, to be blunt. <laughs> I don't know if that kind of gets at your yeah. yeah. Um, great. We're going to get another question, but as we go to the next person, let me just add one thing. Everyone should read uh, Barbara Ransby's book on Ella Baker if you haven't already read it. Um, for lots of different reasons. It's not just the history of Ella Baker, but it really is the history of the 20th century. The other thing is that, you know, Josh, Joshua Myers has this new book called A We Are Worth yeah. Fighting For on the 1989 Howard University strike, 
which I really would encourage okay. you to check out because it deals with some of those contradictions as well, you know. Okay, our next question. Hey, uh, Robin, you can answer some of these questions with me. No, too. I can't. <laughs> 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 I, can, I can't. I just try to promote this stuff. Go ahead. Hey, Barbara, thank you so much for your uh, time and uh, all your Hi. insights. Uh, my name is Asiso. I also go by Ngoni. My pronouns are he, they. Um, and I'm from Connecticut with the Student Loan Fund there, mm -hmm. where we're trying to, uh, you know, we're a borrower-led organization trying to um, reconstruct. Um, I'm having trouble hearing that question. I'm sorry. Oh, um, I'm, 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 I'm getting to the question, so I'll just get to I'm, I'm with the student, uh, student Loan Fund from Connecticut. And my question is, you know, I tend to think of blackness within, you know, the diaspora and so of like, you know, global, uh, transnational, I, you know, uh, um, of which I identify as one. And my question is directed to the university's role in American empire and its expansion, particularly in, in, in knowledge creation. Uh, as a social scientist, one of the things that, you know, really is uh, disheartening for me is when we do research, particularly in HIV research and some of our uh, clinical trials when we develop medication. Uh, you know, we use African bodies. Uh, and then uh, once we ex extract and done all these amazing clinical trials, we take all those, uh, that knowledge and uh, the benefits and bring them back into, uh, you know, um, America, but uh, don't really do any justice to, to really fully build uh, you know, sustainable infrastructures within, uh, uh, you know, those countries where we do all this research. So I'm curious to, you know, um, how can we leverage, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, black identity and black intellectuals within the university to sort of like, you know, mitigate that, knowing that that's where a lot of the funding for some of the work that could benefit, you know, African economies, particularly at least for my, uh, uh, in public health, uh, is concerned. Uh, what are your thoughts around that? Did you hear that? question, Barbara? <laughs> I mean, it was a long and, 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 and it's a seemingly important question, and I was really straining to hear it. I hate well, to I, I, to let me, it, I'll just I sort of paraphrase. Nuance. You can hear me, right? Okay, so I'm going to try to paraphrase it, and forgive me if okay. I'm wrong, but basically, you know, there's sort of two parts of the question. You know, what is the university's role in the U.S. empire, especially in terms of knowledge creation, mm -hmm. For example, the use of, of African bodies for clinical research and that sort of thing, which transfers back to the U.S. And how do we leverage black identity and black intellectuals, I guess, uh, in trying to sort of intervene in, uh, I'm assuming, pushing back against U.S. imperial project? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well... I mean, I think we, we, you know, we, we, we push back by organizing, by uh, resisting a kind of, um, you know, uh, incorporation into imperial logics. And I, my um, uh, colleague, um, Adam Getachew, who's in um, scholarship and social justice, and me, I just mentioned, you know, has a... Uh, relatively new book. I'm trying to remember the title. You might remember, Robin. Um, it's called World Making. Anyway, it's, it's, it's about the post-colonial um, era and the project of both um, anti-colonial anti -colonial activists and intellectuals in trying to imagine, you know, a different kind of post-World War II um, uh, world. So, so, you know, so I think it's, it's, it's navigating our relationship to the institution. I mean, you know, I talk about this idea of outsiders within, but a lot of us, you know, like people want to be insiders within. Mm -hmm. And um, I have always found um, that I learn the most, that I'm challenged and provoked uh, intellectually to, to, to develop uh, uh, new words, new language, new frameworks, new lenses by having um, political and intellectual anchors um, outside of the university. Uh, of people coming together to try to figure out the world in order to change it is a space where questions get asked and, um, you know, ideas get challenged in, in, in ways that, uh, that they just don't in the university. I think, you know, because people have, uh, when people have a certain amount of privilege and stature in the university, um, you know, they get, they get deference. They, you, you get, um, you pay a price if you, challenge them. And I think, you know, we often get trained to, 
you know, prioritize our careers over uh, other things. And even the best of us, you know, people hesitate in um, tackling head on some of the some of the ideas and sort of um, you know epistemological frameworks that are you know very counterproductive to the project of, of fighting for justice and freedom. And I think um, you know having ways that we think and read and research and explore and question outside of formal uh, structures of the university. Not to say we shouldn't use the structures that exist within it. I mean, mm -hmm. there are centers, there are oases in which we can do important work. But having places outside, you know, and again, I, I think, you know, Robin, I think you, maybe Boston Review or someplace, you know, responding to black students who raise this question or, or, or offered this solution. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I have held that very dear. And mm -hmm. um, I think I had that in my practice before I had it in my articulated <laughs> You know, language, but um, anti-apartheid movement, for example, was right. a space for me of understanding so much about the world and empire that I really had not learned in many of my undergraduate and graduate seminars, um, because these were people who were really transforming one of the last mm -hmm. vestiges of colonialism on the African continent, and you know, sadly, it didn't turn out the way many of it us had hoped, but. Mm -hmm. um, but boy, was it a rigorous and intense uh, set of political and intellectual discussions completely outside the university. So I think finding those spaces and creating them, if we can't find them, is really important uh, to sustain a kind of insurgent intellectual practice that is um, necessary and generative. Right. And you have really modeled that, Barbara, really. Um, by the way, the name of that book is World Making After Empire, um, The Rise of yeah. um, Self-Determination. And then also um, what you said, Barbara, really connects with um, the last point that Leanne Naidu made in her talk, uh, where she, called, she basically called us out to find a viable anti-capitalist politics as internationalists, you know, and remember that it's like you, uh -huh. everyone wrote it down. <laughs> Am I right? Um, I mean, it really was really important. So, um, and I think that's that's part of what what I think you you model. I think what a lot of us are trying to think about how to do that. Right. So, we have time for another question. Yes. Hi there. So, in imagining new think, futures, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I believe we also need new definitions, right? And. In thinking of uh, racialized capitalism, how would you define it? So uh, think about uh, future generations Googling racialized capitalism. Mm -hmm. What is something that you hope would be on there? Did you hear that question? So that question, how to, how to define it? Yes, yeah, especially for, if you think about future generations using that term, what would be like the key, the key elements of a definition? Of racial capitalism. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I've kind of haven't been able to, but have wanted to um, uh, spend some time with you, Robin, and talk through how we how we both see Cedric Robinson's um, you know framework of racial capitalism. Because for me, it's a little bit different in that um, you know I I see the ways in which racial capitalism with race and white supremacy have um, enabled the development of capitalism by creating ideolo ideologies that, um, you know, as I said before, you know, justify the, uh, you know, d d the ex super exploitation and dispossession of certain populations and uh, the five settler colonialism. And you say racialized capitalism. And I, and I guess that's as good a term as any because the, the process of racialization is really important because that makes it a historical you know, it historicizes it. In other words, you know, it's not just that race is this fixed thing and capitalism uses, you know, capitalism mm -hmm. uses race to, you know, divide or, or whatever, but that the process of racialization of, of um, you know, differentiating different human beings and, and one, uh, you know, more deserving than another, one within the realm of, you know, civilization and others not. And, you know, all the, 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 the vicious racist ideas that justify the enslavement of human beings and the genocide against others and the theft of land and all of that, all of which were both racial and 
economic uh, processes. So I see, you know, the, the term racial capitalism is to remind us of that intimate symbiotic relationship. And it's not just a black and white, you know, phenomenon that in other parts of the world mm -hmm. racialization happens differently, right? So that even, um, you know, outside of the frame of white supremacy, you think of you know, the racialization of, 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 of the Irish, you know, by the British that, you know, the Irish were seen as having certain innate qualities and um, that made them inferior, which justified the colonial, the colonial project there. Uh, so, you know, so race and racialization takes all these different forms. And I, increasingly, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, you know, the rise of Hindu nationalism, the mm -hmm. vicious policies, anti-Muslim policies uh, by the Modi government in, in India right now. And some people call, you know, kind of Hindu, you know, proto-fascism because of the detention camps that are being built for, for Muslims, stripping of rights and citizenship, uh, uh, violent persecution and so forth, and all with this idea that there's something intrinsic, uh, almost innate. I mean, it's religious chauvinism, but it's more than that. Um, and that's a process, you know, that's, that's a process of racialization too. It's not just religious chauvinism because it's not, see, people aren't seen as having the option to, to convert or to, uh, to, to opt out of a set of beliefs, but that somehow, you know, in their very blood, is uh, something that makes them inferior. And so that process has uh, facilitated fuel, enabled empire, enabled, you know, all kinds of pillaging um, and, uh, and land and labor theft uh, over generations. And so that's, that's kind of what, what I think, I mean, that's, not, that's a bit of an unwieldy uh, definition, but, um, but that's how I would describe, uh, you know, the racial capitalism. Well, we're out of time, and we are so grateful for your sacrifice mm -hmm. in the lactation room <laughs> talking to us about <laughs> racial capitalism in the university and our future and what is to be done, because you are hey, the listen, model I, I revolutionary. Think gonna, I think I'm going to open the door, Robin, and there's going to be like 20 moms <laughs> and babies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure they're waiting, all in course and everything. So, anyway, th let's join join me in thanking Barbara for this. Okay, Thank have a safe so flight. Much. Yeah, have a safe flight, and I will talk to you soon. Okay. Okay, I hope I hope I see you when I'm out there. You know, you will. Okay, we'll work it out. Hey. Oh, great. <laughs> Great. Okay. And thank you all for, you know, your patience with this, this format. I really, I really uh, apologize and appreciate your, your, uh, your patience. So, okay. Take care. Thank you so much, bye -bye. Dr. Ransby. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. So I just want to take this moment first to thank Robin for facilitating that technologically intense keynote, and also to thank Dr. Ransby, though she is not here in person. She really went through extraordinary lengths to make that happen just now on her route here for tomorrow morning. So though she's not here with us, just I would like to thank her in this space again for her extraordinary efforts. And I also, again, would like to thank the Institute team, the Student Advisory Board team, and everybody who did all of the work today to make this possible. And a final round of applause for all of our extra, well, in my opinion, extraordinary panelists and speakers. It was just so generative. So thank you so much. And to close the day, we have one final invitation. With the provocation that social movements do generate new knowledge, we would like to invite you to a sort of short but spectacular closing ceremony that's actually going to be held one floor up and somewhat outside. So I'd actually like to ask everybody to please go ahead and pack up and just follow us up there for a few minutes. You can see Marisa. She's gonna, there will be people leading us. It will also give us an opportunity to take a nice group photo and be able to commemorate the moment. But we have a striker-led collective action to just end the day together. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And thank you on the live stream. You'll be joining us outside, too. Okay.